likely Maya Kowalski. And then we also have uh, some experts that would probably come in later on in the week. Uh, we'll probably have Joe Corcoran, who is one of our liability experts on hospital administration. Uh, we will have um, Dr. Bifolco, uh, Stephen Bifolco, who is um, a, I believe he's both a physiatrist and a PhD in something. In any event, he did the life care plan and much of the damages. Uh, we also have um, Dr. Timothy Brewerton, right, psychiatrist. He will likely be sometime Wednesday, and then uh, also our uh, physical therapist. Um, we have five or six experts that are going to be here. Okay. So let me just. Are we? Sounds like you might be resting towards the end of next week. We hope, we hope to. We hope to. It's our it's our goal to rest by the end of the week, by Friday. <clears throat> Very brief. Sorry. I didn't and, and I know you've mentioned several times, but I haven't tracked. Are we off any days next week? Is the jury been told we're off any days next week? Well, I don't think we have announced any days off for next week. Um, If it was left to us, um, we could probably use at least a half a day, in the middle of the week, maybe a full day, to make sure we do this efficiently when we're in the courtroom. I, I think we'd be okay with a half a day, maybe Wednesday afternoon. The other thing we're looking at is to cut this down. Because we're coming up, we're halfway through our hours, and so uh, we want to streamline this case as much as possible. We'll have a few more video depots to play, depending on whether our expert, you know, one of our experts is actually able to show up. And um, then we will have some experts from some of the defense witnesses. The point being, I, I think the decision maybe the court's looking for is uh, arguments on DV. And if we could do it so that we could finish by, say, Friday morning, we would try to leave some time to get... One issue we've been discussing that may yeah. bear on this is if we make the decision, and Mr. Anderson will speak to this further, if we make the decision to call or request a Johns Hopkins physician live, right? what will the, be the allowable scope of the cross-examination? And, he, and here's our concern, Judge. Uh, at the start of the case, the court stated that uh, you want, did not want to <clears throat> cause the doctors to have to come over more than once or inconvenience the doctors any more than we had to. Our concern is that at this stage of the case, with the narrowing of the issues, we need to put on just very short snippets of three, four, and possibly five doctors. These will not take, the max would be a half hour, and we are talking about really beyond five minutes of qualification, maybe another five minutes of, uh, of testimony. There's specific points, things that they said in the record we wanted to put in. What we do not want to do, and which throws off our schedule, is to have the first time we call a Johns Hopkins doctor, Johns Hopkins attempt to put its entire case in through that doctor. In other words, well, just that, that it's not even remotely tangible to the direct examination, and so our, the cross ends up being forever. And that that makes our schedule very, very difficult. We would like to tr call these doctors live at all, all possible, but we're hesitant to because we don't want to be in that situation. We're, you know, instead of planning to get them on and off completely within 40 minutes, 30 minutes, now it's two and a half hours. So that's our question. Well, let's address that specific issue first, and then we'll... More generally. <clears throat> Judge, we, we're, we're perfectly willing to produce these doctors for testimony, for providing we've gotten a, uh, notice, but having to bring them down twice is going to complicate matters tremendously, particularly if we have to do it within a, a, a two- or three-week period of time. We are not looking to belabor any doctor's testimony, but if, if a doctor gets to ask something from, from their deposition out of context, it needs to be explained. And 
we would like to explain the, to these doctors' actions to a reasonable extent. That's coming off our time, and we realize that. And we're very cognizant of where we are on time. So I, I can tell counsel that nothing, to, nothing that we do in that respect will be unnecessarily elongated or delayed, but I don't want the doctor put up there and ask one or two questions out completely out of context and, and then howls of anguish go up about the scope of cross-examination. And, and Sorry. Go ahead. From our point of view, we, everybody up here knows about trial lawyering, and we understand that it's necessary to explain. It's just some reasonable relationship between the amount of time we have on direct and the amount of time on cross is what we're looking for. Well, and I understand because if, if you're thinking that your your direct is 30 minutes, you're going to expect the cross to be no more than 30 minutes, I would assume. Yes, and that's the point. It impacts your witness calling if we end up spending two or three hours. I, I get that. On the flip side, the issue is if someone's going to be coming live, it's better to get them here once and do everything with that witness once. So you know, I, I tend to continue with my view that I held before trial, which is if you're going to call someone live, let's try to do that person live at that time. Maybe I don't know how many videos you have, but you can have a couple videos ready to go, and then if a witness takes more time, then you just bump the video so that the calling a live witness isn't impacted as much. But I'm not going to change my thought process on how we should be addressing you know, those folks who are coming live. If we limited the live testimony so that if a doctor was, let me give you an example, Judge. Uh, I'm aware. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Kreisman saw Maya before the Mexico infusion <clears throat> and saw Maya after the Mexico, Mexico infusion. And you may recall, I'm not sure if we've cited it to the court yet, he <coughs> had some very complimentary things to say about Maya Kowalski after that. So he saw her in, I think, November before the Mexico infusion and then saw her, uh, I think, one or two times after the one we're talking about in May. And at that time, in the records, he states, this is a new child. The child before was hiding behind. It, basically saying, this is a new child, and look how great this child is doing now. And it was obviously in reference, if you read the whole thing, to the ketamine infusion she reached in, in Mexico. So calling him is essentially, who are you? Did you see Maya? Will you, will, were you one of her pulmonologists at Johns Hopkins? And then that. So... With just one or two witnesses, I, if I'm not sure how much more Dr. Kreisman would have to offer than that. that so that, but that's not my problem, my concern. And if they wanted to, for instance, then have him explain it on cross, then that's fine. Where I'm, where I'm coming from is then that ends. And now we start to bring in new documents and new uh, points of view. And now we're into this lengthy part. So my question is, if it's if we if it's only two witnesses, is that is the court still inclined to have that same ruling? Because I really don't think it's going to be that much of an inconvenience. Because I really don't think there's that much for more for the, these two witnesses to say. That's it. So what you're suggesting is the number of doctors that would be inconvenienced by having to come to twice would be no more than two. Yes, Your Honor. Right now, that is our present. So, if Dr. Kreisman may be a bad example for, for Mr. Uh, Anderson, simply because I don't foresee Dr. Dr. Kreisman's cross based on what he's represented as as lasting terribly much longer than what's been talked about to this court. The, he has seen him. Dr. Kreisman saw this patient a number of times over the summer of 2015. But that's not really that much of an issue. Uh, he did see exactly. the he did see the patient early on in September before Dr. Kirkpatrick did, and then and then saw her a couple times more. And then the the visit that Mr. Anderson likes is in May. There is an explanation for it. His explanation is not much longer than the direct, but it's it's very straightforward, and it shouldn't take that long to do. I don't see him 
as being the kind of issue that might cause a problem here with this. We're talking about minutes, not fractions of hours, or hours or fractions of hours. The I, I don't know who else he's got in mind, so I'll, I'll leave it to that. Look, if, here's my view. If we're talking about one or two, then I'm probably going to be less... My, my, my general view is that the if you're going to be bringing a doctor, let's do everything with the doctor when, when they're here. Um, if, if you're talking about one or two, I can probably be convinced to be more rigid on you know, staying within what, what happened in, in direct and cross. I, I, I don't, I could probably be talking to it if we're talking about one or two, but if we're talking about more than one or two people, then I really think we need to bring a doctor once. Could I add something, Judge? I, I, sure. should, have, I should have mentioned this and, and, for, and forgot to. Uh, Dr. Kreisman may also be a bad example because he has asked that when he is called, that he testified by Zoom. He has just had back surgery, and and driving down here would be a, a problem for him. And I believe me, I have a lot more sympathy for that right today than I did two or three weeks ago. But he, he's got he's got a, a bona fide issue as far as that's concerned, and may want to do that by Zoom. I don't think I told you all that, but that's that, well, that seems to suggest to be less of an inconvenience. I mean. He's, he's in pain, but right. he's going to be by Zoom, so we're not bringing him down here twice. So right. he would he even count against the two at that point? I think it's more timing we're worried about. Than I, I understand. I understand. It's a timing issue. Okay. So am, am I hearing correctly that we don't have to worry about any, any date issues next week for personal matters and that we're, you're you're ready to go on Monday. It's probably going to be Maya on Monday. That's our present intention, and if we have any change, we would know that before the end of the day today. Uh, we simply have we have to just confirm uh, yep. with. Well, it may depend on the discussion this afternoon, and if we get through all the exhibits, we'd like to introduce <clears> her. If, that's if, a, that's if that extent, discussion has to extend until Monday, then we'd probably push her to Tuesday. So, so if Maya's. Just so they can start preparing either Monday or Tuesday, kind of depending on what happens this afternoon, but she'll be early next week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And and the other, just re reiterate, if we can have half a day on Wednesday, uh, we appreciate that. We may not need it, but... So, if we took a half day, are you still going to be able to, f to rest by, by Friday? Because the way I'm looking at it is... If we rest Friday, that really gives the defense two weeks for their case. And I, I really would like to be in closings starting like October 30th, that Monday of October 30th. Maybe start deliberating on, on the 31st because, remember, the second and the third are, are not going to be available for the jury. So... And there's rebuttal also, so you have to move that up. yes. So I, I mean, my my hope my my hope was we could do uh, closings on Monday. Deliberations could be you know Halloween and November first. Um, so that, that would give them two full days of deliberations. If they had not finished deliberations, then we we would bring them back that following week, which is the last week we have available. That's kind of what the, I was hoping. The defense sees it the same way you're on. And I don't know if you need two full weeks. I we, we're our game plan it. I just leave it at this game plan it to the extent we've done so thus far. Tried to you know read the tea leaves. Our game plan it is very similar to yours. And, and just very the, similar. The reason I was standing earlier is the shot clock is going to force this issue anyway. The, if the plaintiffs want any semblance of cross, they're probably going to have to rest Friday because they're going to be between 40 and 45 hours. And we understand with nine days of trial in that block that Your Honor has, if we average three and a half hours a day, we're going to be running out of time too. So it's that schedule is 
probably our goal and is going to be what both sides are going to have to do with the hours. That's what yeah, we're finished with. Yeah. And the final thing for us would be we would appreciate very much, and we have attempted to do this, that uh, we understand uh, trial tactics and uh, work product, but if we can know which witnesses are likely to go live as opposed to those that will be pr uh, put up by depot, that would also be helpful for us to narrow down our cross and be prepared. Well, I've already been ruling out a whole bunch of depot designations. Are, am I going to get any more yes. depot designations? You are, and we're sorry for that. <laughs> Dr. Newberger may not make it. Literally, and so... Okay, well, I understand the Dr. Newberger issue, but besides Dr. Newberger, how many more am I getting? I think uh, Ms. Crawls and I have worked through five or six more to be provided to the court to see this afternoon. Yeah, we haven't... We've given four or five to you, but I haven't seen objections filed or anything, so we haven't submitted them, because... Okay, okay, but we'll get that done this afternoon on both sides. And, okay. And we're sorry. It is what it is. But, but just to the plaintiffs, because we heard by Folkos coming, if he's going to be testifying on anything other than his old life care plan, we need that ASAP. We have not received an updated life care plan. If he's testifying on the life care plan he gave at deposition, I can cross him on that. Plaintiffs have heard that, so. Okay. I thought we sent it over, but Dr. Okay. Folkos updated life care plan. We got a re written report, but we haven't seen any type of life care you plan. You mean calculations? No, the actual plan of what... Okay, all right, we'll get to it. It's not as extensive as perhaps you're expecting. Okay, if, if that's all there is, that's all there is. Thank you. All right, so we have for the defense, I mean, we, we have um, Dr. Bifolco, we have Robert Tremp, and we have our economist. Okay, well, and that's for, for, from a timing standpoint... If I can get you all to rest next week and you can build in time for time off, then let's do it. If if you're not going to be able to rest next week, then I'm not sure we take time off next week. Because the following week, I think we've got a little bit of time. Wednesday. That's yeah. fair. Right. So that that's it, – it's. I really need you to rest by Friday. And then if you're going to be able to do that and you can – Tell me you got a half day someplace to take off. I'm fine with that. Thank you, Your Honor. Is there any objection from the defense on Dr. Newberger appearing by yes. Zoom? Did okay. he get well enough to do no. that? No. No, no, sir. So he could appear by Zoom? Oh, he's he's depending on his health, but I if guess he, If he's not know. sitting in, in a hospital room, is that he what is you're telling He is currently, but I'm hoping that over the weekend he gets better. That's all. He's at, he's at uh, Mass General. And... Um, he is uh, in a hospital room. He's having testing done. He had lower intestine bleeding. Or intestinal right, let, let's bleeding. not get into his personal on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Dr. Newberger. Okay. Anything else? Can I bring in the jury? Are we set uh, up? We, we will be place? playing Rebecca Johnson first. And uh, I, I'm assuming, Mr. Reyes, you're going to be able to play it. Looks like all the screens are on. And every, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Sign or. Good work. Do you, do you want to practice it for a second to see if it's okay? Okay. Are we ready to go? I'm going to do a quick audio test, Your Honor, so we don't do that. The jury in here, if you don't mind. Sure. Will you raise your right hand, please, Ms. Johnson? Okay, we're good. Mr. Reyes, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Um, may I display just the, the the screen, or do you want me to take that down until they show up? Why don't you take it down? Thank you.
Okay, members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Yes. And since you were last here, has anyone approached you about this case? No. And since you were last here, have you seen any media accounts of this no. case? Thank you very much. Now, let me tell you, this morning, you're going to see two different depositions. Uh, we're going to take a break after the first deposition, and then you'll have the second deposition uh, later on this morning. Um, the deposition is sworn testimony of these two witnesses that was given before trial, and it will be presented to you this morning. You are to consider and weigh this testimony as you would any other evidence in the case. And with that, um, let me figure out how to turn these lights on. Are you able to see? Not very well. I want to disagree with the judge, but just like nine buttons. <laughs> <clears throat> If, if that is too much light when we start playing the depositions, let me know and I'll keep pushing buttons. Okay, um, Mr. Anderson, who are we having first, please? Uh, Rebecca Johnson. Rebecca Johnson. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, you may uh, start the movie. Okay. Thank you. Will you raise your right hand, please, Ms. Johnson? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give today be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to start with if you could give me your, your professional name and uh, professional address for the record, please. Sure. It's Rebecca Johnson. I'm an LMHC, licensed mental health counselor. I'm the owner of Restoration Counseling um, in Cape Coral. It's 1222 Southeast 47th Street, Suite 215. Okay, and when did you begin um, restoration counseling approximately? March of 2017. Okay, and my understanding is that you have seen um, Maya Kowalski, um, Kyle Kowalski, and Jack Kowalski at restoration counseling from when you opened it to the present day, correct? Yes. And uh, my understanding is you've recently had some visits with Maya and Kyle uh, as recently as November of this year. Is that correct? Correct. Prior to restoration counseling, where did you work? At Eagles Wings Counseling Center in Bennett. And how long were you at Eagles Wings Counseling Center? I was there uh, three and a half, four years. Okay. Well, and approximately when did you start at Eagles Wings? Um, thinking back. Probably February 2014-ish, somewhere around there. That's when I graduated uh, with my degree. So I went, I started my internship with them. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Can you give me the benefit of your, your education and training, starting from the time that you graduated high school and moving through all degrees and education obtained uh, through to the present day? Okay, um, I graduated, you want the date of when I graduated high school? It, you can approximate it, it's fine. Like I told you, it's not a, it's not a memory contest. I graduated high school, and then I uh, graduated with my four-year degree um, in 1998, um, psychology. And then a, I went back to get my graduate degree um, in 2011. So you went back to get your graduate degree in 2011? Right. I had I didn't do my undergraduate and graduate consecutively. I had quite the gap there and decided to go back in 2011. For my Fair life. enough. Understood. I did the same thing with my law degree. Um, in the period of time I went to law school, but before law school I was a teacher. What did you do in that gap between 98 and going back in 2011? I actually worked in finance. And okay. Mm -hmm. What kind of finance? Um, I worked in bookkeeping. I worked for uh, a couple different companies through that 
20 years span-ish. Um, yeah, human resources as well. Okay. What, uh, what was your four-year degree in? Psychology. And where did you obtain that four-year degree? At Malone College in Canton, Ohio. Okay. And um, you worked in bookkeeping up until you went back to get your graduate degree in 2011? Yes, correct. Uh, where did you go get your graduate degree? At Walden University. It was an online program. Okay. And where were you when you were doing that online program? I was here in Florida. Okay. Um, where is Malone? Malone is in Ohio, Canton, Ohio. That's where I was living. Okay. Uh, for my, yeah. So I grew what up. brought you down to Florida? Um, just a change of scenery. Something new. Weather, I'm sure, played somewhat of a role. Of course. Always does. Um, and so how long was your, your, your Walden University online program? It was a three-year program. Okay. And were you a full-time student? Yes. And um, what, when you say online, was there components of it that was in-person and components that were, were digital, or was it all digital? Uh, no, there were components that were in person. We would meet for intensive trainings uh, a couple times a year. Okay. And um, you said it was a three-year program. Am I, am I correct in understanding that you graduated in 2014? Correct. Okay. And what degree did you obtain upon graduating in 2014? A Master's of Science in Mental Health Counseling. Okay. And um, at that point, am I correct in assuming that with a master's, you can't just jump right into private practice. Is there some type of on-the-job type of training you have to do in order to obtain um, a, a licensed mental health counseling license here in the state of Florida? Yes. You need to register with the state of Florida as a registered mental health counseling intern and complete 2,000 hours of uh, direct counseling, group counseling, um, in order to sit for your licensure exam. Um, and at 2,000 hours, is that uh, something that you completed between 2014 when you graduated with your MS and the time that you obtained your license in, I believe, October of 2016? Correct. Yes. All right. In some of the paperwork that was provided from Eagle's Wings, you're listed as a, quote, registered mental health, health counselor intern. Is that is that a correct description of what you – were in terms of a licensure standpoint in 2015 and for a good chunk of 2016? Correct. What is the difference between an intern and a um, licensed mental health counselor? Sure, the intern is the re when you're registered with the state as an RMHCI, so registered mental health counseling intern. That is the span in which you're working towards your licensure, and it's all tracked through the state. Okay. And, uh, is, uh, and some of this paperwork, I also see, uh, like, letters or notes that you would sign off on. Um, there would be an individual by the name of Lauren, M-A-U-C-K, Lauren Mock. Um, looks like she's a master's in LMFTQS at Eagle's Wings. Who is Miss Mock? Uh, Lauren was my supervisor during that two-year span of working on my hours for licensure. So she was. Okay. And, and – Go ahead. What type of role would she play? She was the QS behind her name stands for qualified supervisor. So she had training in supervising RMHCI. And did you complete your your uh, internship on time as scheduled? Yes. Okay. So uh, to the best of your knowledge, you became a licensed mental health counselor effective October 31st, 2016 here in the, in the state of Florida? So what is your current niche, um, for lack of a better term? Currently, I work a lot with psychological abuse and emotional abuse. Psychological abuse and emotional abuse? Okay. Uh, can you kind of explain that to me? I, I don't have as sound a footing in psychology as I'm sure you do. I don't have a master's, but can you kind of break down what that niche of psychological abuse and emotional abuse, abuse means? Sure. Uh, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, they can overlap, but they're definitely, um, there's some distinctions as well. But psychological abuse is um, 
when there's a lot of manipulation in a relationship, pathological lying, gaslighting, just a toxic behavior within a relationship, within a family. Okay. And um, obviously, um, in, in this case, and, and I assume in your practice, you, you've treated both children and adults. Is that correct? Yes, I, I treated more children during my internship. I pulled away from that just a bit um, and do mostly families, individuals, and couples at this point. What about, and again, it's a rough estimate, during that 2,000-hour internship period um, from 2014 to 2016, can you break down your percentage of adult versus pediatric cases? Yes, it was probably 50-50 at that point. At the time you encountered Maya and her family back in 2015, what was your understanding of complex regional pain syndrome? Um, little to zero. Had you had any prior experience with a complex regional um, syndrome pediatric patient prior to Maya Kowalski? No. Uh, have you had any pediatric complex regional pain syndrome patients after Maya? No. Do you consider yourself an expert in the treatment of pediatric complex regional pain syndrome patients? No. Based on some records that you provided us, you saw the family. I believe you saw Maya and Kyle and perhaps the father in November of 2020. Is that not correct? That's correct, yes. Um, did you get an update from the family in connection with your counseling with them uh, in November of 2020? Um, not not a specific, any kind of specifics, just kind of how they were feeling about it and what was happening just within their home. My understanding, based on the, looking at the records, is that you, in addition to providing um, services to Jack, Maya, and Kyle, you also provided some mental health services to Beata Kowalski. Is that correct? I saw Beata briefly initially before her children came to see me. Can you please explain to me uh, why it was that you initially cared for Beata Kowalski and that Mrs. Rogers later came to be involved? Sure. Uh, Beata initially came to me to share what is happening um, with Maya, what's going on with um, just sharing the story of, of Maya and what she was dealing with. Um, it's very normal and usual for a parent to meet with a counselor first, um, to share information, to discuss goals, to discuss um, what they would like to see happen in therapy, et cetera, um, get feedback from me in order to determine if it's a good fit. So that was my first session with Piana. Uh, do, can you, do, you, uh, do you know, based on your records or your recollection, how many times you actually met with Beata Kowalski? I met with her twice. Okay. So between 10, 14, 15, and 12, 16, 15, we have two kept, can two kept um, appointments, and we have three cancellations, cancellations right? Right. Okay. Um, and I may have already asked this, but since we're going through it now, it looks like as if um, on January 6th of 2016, Michelle, Michelle Rogers assumed care for a series of dates. Uh, do you see that on the form? Yes, I do. And can you describe, if you can recall, why it was that care transferred from yourself over to Ms. Rogers around uh, the new year of 2016? Right, because Beata was looking for individual counseling for herself. So Michelle took that case over, took her Okay, over. and do you not do individual counseling? I was not going to do that with Beata as I was already seeing the children. Okay, and it looks like Ms. Rogers did some individual as well as some marital counseling as well. I believe so. All right, and, and am I fair in assuming here that your first visit with Maya was November 9 of 2015? I see that there is 11 kept appointments between November 9, 2015 and February 22, 2017. Uh, am I correct in assuming that there were eight appointments that were either canceled or didn't go forward? Looks like there's seven. Okay, seven, seven that didn't go forward. Yeah. The C next to 12, 16, 15, that would have been canceled. Right. Uh, the L 
next to 12, 30, 15 would have been a late cancelization, correct? Correct. What does the end stand for next to 82216? No show. Okay. And then we've got a series of keeps here, it looks like, starting with August 2316 through September 2616. And then um, we've got a no show on 10416. Right. Did you review any of her prior mental health records in connection with rendering services to Maya Kowalski? Typically, that's a question I ask. Um, I don't see that it's in my notes, so I don't recall from memory. Okay. Uh, if, if, if you had reviewed records from outside providers, was that something you would document? I did not review any outside records. I do know that for sure. Okay. Is that something in your clinical background, do you sometimes come to review mental health records from other providers? Right, I do. Uh, and why do you do that? Just to collect a history. Is that history important to uh, rendering services? It can be. Okay. So am I correct in assuming that you um, never reviewed um, any of Maya's mental health records from a, a Miss Catherine Bliss? I did not. Do you know who Miss Bliss is? I did not. Um, am I correct in assuming you never reviewed any records, uh, psychiatric or otherwise, from Camp Hospital, and I was there for approximately a month? No, I didn't. Um, Maya also went to um, Chicago Lurie's Children's Hospital, uh, where she was hospitalized for for a second opinion. Uh, around the time that she was at Tampa General. Um, did you review any of the psychiatric or psychological records from that visit? No. Um, and I think you said in your experience, it is beneficial sometimes to review outside documentation from other providers? It can be. It, it, you, you said it can be? And why is that? Uh, it's, it's important to know if there's been significant uh, issues in the past. If the, if, if the client has had previous mental health care. As you sit here today, are you aware of what Tampa General Hospital diagnosed Maya Kowalski with? No, I'm not. As we sit here today, are you aware what Lurie's Children's Hospital diagnosed Maya with? No. As we sit here today, are you aware of what Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital diagnosed Maya Kowalski with? Sorry, let me back up. John Hoss, when she was in that three-month period in John Hopkins, is that what you're referring at, to? At any point. So she had been there in 2015. She had, was also there in 2016, parts of 2017. My question is, are you aware at any time along that continuum what the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital uh, psychiatric or psychological diagnoses for Maya Kowalski were? Sure, I understand that there is a factitious disorder um, diagnosed as well as then into a conversion disorder. Okay. And, and how did you come to be aware of, of those developments? Um, or diagnoses, I should say, not developments. That was probably... In other words, did you see a record from the hospital, or was this something that would have been communicated to you by the family? This was communicated by the family. Okay. Did you ever speak with any of the mental health providers at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? No. Did you ever speak with any of the mental health providers at Lurie's Children's Hospital? No. I did speak with uh, Dr. Duncan at some point. Okay. So you spoke with Dr. Tashana Duncan. Correct. I believe that was probably over. Okay. All right. Well, let's start with Maya then, and we're going to go to Eagles Wings Counseling. My understanding is the first note we have here is from... November 9, 2015. Is that also your understanding? Yes. What is the presenting problem um, listed here for Maya Kowalski on 11-9-15? Um, Her, what she initially came in with, those presenting issues were depression, anxiety. She had trouble sleeping. Um, all of these things were reported to be related to her pain. Um, she had difficulty concentrating, she was angry, and she felt hopeless. 
And it says here medical DXRSD. Is that a diagnosis you rendered or would that have been the diagnosis that was rendered by somebody else? That was what was reported to me. Okay. And then turning to that third page, about middle of the page, EW3, it says first session with Maya, RDS diagnosis. Maya Law is in a wheelchair in extreme pain from disease, has pain meds. Do you see that in the record? Yes. Do you have any independent recollection of Maya and how she would, how she behaved during this first visit or are you going to be relying on your chart? No, I remember it quite well as it was to see a child come in in a wheelchair. You kind of broke up a little bit there. What did you say? I was saying I remember what that first session was like with her because she did come in in a wheelchair. It was something that did stick in my memory, her mood, how she was feeling. Yes, I recall that. Okay. So why don't you describe in more detail, separate and apart from what you've charted here, what you recall about interacting with Maya Kowalski on that first visit in November of 2015? Sure. When I first met with her, greeted her, it was in the lobby of Eagle's Wings. We introduced ourselves. I took her back to the art room. She was obviously accessible physically. She was obviously what? I missed that. Not physically comfortable. Okay. And she is somewhat distressed emotionally. Okay. And it says here, this first visit that Maya was, did some, it looks like some art therapy or things along those lines. And then it says here, if I'm not mistaken, reports they are leaving for Mexico on Tuesday, paren, coma, and paren, needs to cancel appointment, but schedule for Wednesday in December. Did I read that into the record correctly? Leaving for Mexico on Thursday, not Tuesday. Oh, did I say Tuesday? I'm sorry. Okay. So leaving for Mexico on Thursday. Let me ask you about that. What do you recall about either Maya or her mother explaining the treatment in Mexico? I recall that Maya specifically being hopeful that this would bring some relief for her. Did they discuss what type of therapy was going on in Mexico? They have, may have mentioned it was the ketamine therapy at that point. I don't, I'm not sure. Did you inquire about how that, how Maya felt about that upcoming trip to Mexico? Yes, I did. That's, that's why I remember her saying hopeful about that treatment. Did she express any other concerns about that therapy? Not that I recall. At this point, what was your plan as a licensed mental health counselor? What was your stated plan with respect to counseling services to Maya? My plan was to help her identify the emotions that she was feeling, the depression, find coping skills for the anxiety. Her general emotional health was our focus. Were you doing at this point complex or excuse me, were you doing CBT for her diagnosis of CRPS slash RSD at this point? Yes, I was doing CBT related to play and art therapy. Okay. So the, the play and art therapy could be categorized as CBT? Yes, it's a type of CBT. Okay. And was this CBT directed towards the depression and anxiety or directed towards the underlying pain disorder? The depression and anxiety. All right. So were you providing at this point CBT services for a diagnosis of CRPS? I was providing services for treatment of depression and anxiety. Okay. My next note that I have documentation for, for Maya is from 12-9-15 and that's on EW-04. Do you have that record in front of you? I do. The next consult note that I have at Eagle's Wings is approximately eight months later, dated August 10, 2016. Is that the next note that you have in your charting for Maya Kowalski? 
Yes. <clears throat> okay. I guess what I'm driving at here is, as, as you had two visits with Maya in 2015, and then we don't have another one until August 10th, 2016. Was that part of your plan as prescribed, or would you have preferred to see more therapy sessions in that eight to nine month interval? That was, Go ahead. That was not part of any kind of written plan that we had had. Whether written or otherwise, what was your understanding of the plan for Maya Kowalski after the, uh, the December 9, 2015 consult we just talked about? Typically, we have more frequent sessions. And why is that? So there's a continual uh, treatment. Now, going back to this appointment history form EW 2017, it looks like we had a 12, 16, 15 visit, and there's a C next to that. Do you see that? Yes. That, was, that stands for cancel, correct? Yes. And then we have a 12, 30, 15 visit scheduled to be with you for Maya, with Maya. Uh, on 12, 30, 15, there's an L next. That's a late cancellation, correct? Yes. Um, do you have any idea, either through independent recollection or looking at your notes, why after that late cancelization on 3015, we have a gap of approximately eight months until we pick back up in 8 10 2016? I do not know why that, that gap exists in time. Okay. But that was not a gap that, did, that was recommended by either you or your supervisor. Am I correct in assuming that? How many consults do you have for Maya Kowalski in January of 2016? None. Same question for February of 2016. None. Same question for March of 2016. None. Same question for April of 2016. Direct form. Okay. What, same question for June and July of 2016. And by no, I mean during that interval, there were no consults at Eagle Wings Counseling? No. What is your understanding of what mental health services Maya Kowalski was receiving between December of 2015 and August 10 of 2016? I do not know of any. And do you know why that gap exists? I do not. Do you know why the family decided to resume in August of 2016? No. Okay. Looking at the very top after Maya resumed care with you, I'd like to just uh, look here at uh, under mood. What did you label Maya as in August 10 of 2016? August 10th, um, her mood was checked as depressed. Okay, and then her thought process, am I correct here that you have checked uh, hopelessness? Correct. Okay, um, at any point, do you recall or did you document um, whether Maya was receiving ketamine infusions during this period of time she was not treating at Eagle's Wings? I do not know. Okay. And then um, under progress notes, plan, homework, and, and for the record, we're at EW0006 discussing an August 10, 2016 Eagles Wings Center progress note. Can you please read in? Actually, I'll read it. and You can tell me if I'm reading it properly or not. Under progress notes, plan, homework, discuss physical goals, walking, exclamation mark, normalize sadness and anger, re-RSD, address bullying, Insta. Client would like more time with neighbors friends, possible pet therapy, client states she is willing, participate in counseling, equipped coping skills. Did I read that into the record properly? Right. Um, after address bullying, it says Instagram. Instagram. Okay. Insta. So do you recall what this bullying was in the Instagram? Um, I believe some people were making rude comments to her on her Instagram account. Okay, any more detail about that? Um, I don't. I believe maybe it was probably regarding her appearance. Um, 
just ugly words other kids say. Speaking of appearance, what was Maya's ambulatory status as of August 10, 2016? In other words, was she walking around using crutches? Was she in a wheelchair? Do you not recall? She was still in a wheelchair. She did seem improved. I do remember that. She did seem improved? Yes. In what sense did she seem improved? Physically and emotionally. So what, now is this something that you documented that she seemed improved physically and emotionally or something you independently recall? That's something I recall. And from the notes, her wanting to spend more time with her friend who was her neighbor. So before that had never been much that had happened. So this was new for her wanting to spend time. Again, it looks like her, actually I had a question about something in the column here. It's a little star here under interventions. Pet Thera with Gracie. I was just curious what that was a reference to. That was pet therapy with Gracie. So she brought in her puppy Gracie that day. Gracie's the dog. Understood. And what is the purpose of pet therapy? Often it is for just calming the client. There's a comfort level there. And then moving on from, well, in 9-13-16 at the bottom there, it says that the patient's currently feeling pain. Do you see that? At the bottom of September 13th? Yeah, September 13th, 2016 on her progress notes. It says currently feeling pain. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that now. All right. Now I'd like to flash forward to EW-13, which is an October 21, 2016 letter. Eagles Wings Counseling Center letterhead addressed to whom it may concern. It's signed by both yourself, Rebecca Johnson, MS, registered mental health counselor intern, and Lauren Mock, M-A-L-M-F-T-Q-S at Eagles Wings Counseling Center. Do you have that record in front of you? Yes. Why did you draft this letter? From what I recall, this letter was drafted during the time that Maya was at All Children's Hospital, and her parents asked me to give a summary type of letter for her care. Do you have a specific recollection of being asked to prepare this letter? I have a recollection of either Beata or Jack calling me about this, asking me to do this. What do you recall about that conversation? That she was in the hospital, that things were not happening, that she was not being permitted to leave the hospital, and they were wanting some sort of information about our treatment plan, our treatment session. Then what did Jack tell you? Jack told me that there were some abuse allegations and that there were investigations happening. And do you know who was doing the investigating? DCF. Did Mr. Kowalski, when discussing this letter with you, give you any details about the allegations of abuse? Yes, he told me what was happening as far as what they were accusing Beata of and what Maya was experiencing at the time. And I was happy to offer what we had been working on and what my care had been for her. And it looks like here in the record it says, quote, or in this letter from October 21, 2016, quote, most recently I have been treating Maya for depression as a result of her physical limitations of RSD, as well as the distress she feels because of her current circumstances, which include school and social settings, end quote. Do you see that? Yes. Is that a fair and accurate description of what you had recently been working with Maya Kowalski on? Yes. All right. I will move on from there. And so that gets us through Maya Kowalski through 2016. I think it would make sense now if we go through what we have here for Beata in 2015, if that would work for you. Okay. And in connection with providing services to Beata, 
Um, I know Michelle Rogers uh, handled several of those sections. Did you work with Michelle at all in, in terms of rendering services to Beata Kowalski? No, it wasn't necessary. And why wasn't it necessary? Because the issues that Beata, were, whatever that may have been that she was working on with Michelle was not um, anything that she needed to share with me. It was privileged between Michelle and Beata. Before I go on to December 16, 2015, can you tell me if you recall your first visit with Beata Kowalski back in October of 2015? I do somewhat. That was the session where I first met her. She was explaining to me um, my situation, and she was there to determine if this would be a good fit for her and Maya, for myself and Maya to move forward. Okay, and what do you recall Beata Kowalski explaining about Maya's situation um, on this intro visit? I believe at that point, Beata's goal was to make sure that her daughter was being cared for emotionally um, with the anxiety and the depression that was happening. Okay. And in terms of Beata Kowalski, it looks like she was scheduled for some individual therapy, which it appears as if that happened on October of 15 and then December 16, 2015. What were the individual counseling reasons that Beata Kowalski was presenting to you for? Yeah, that would have just been following up regarding her, her daughter. Okay. So in terms of providing individual services to Beata Kowalski, were you rendering mental health services to Beata Kowalski separate and apart from her daughter, Maya? No. So can you explain to me what an individual counseling session involving a parent is to the counseling for that person's child? Sure. It's normal to follow up with a parent at some point during treatment in order to review progress, discuss what was happening in therapy. It's quite usual, quite normal. Okay. And so the when it says individual services here on this appointment history that you were providing, is it your position that those were not individual services for Beata? No, not me working directly with Beata regarding herself. That is just a way of categorizing it so we know how many people to expect, what, what's going on during that session. Did Mrs. Kowalski, Beata Kowalski, ever bring up any marital issues um, during um, individual counseling sessions with you? Um, I do. I'm looking at the notes here for December 16th, and she had mentioned that her, her marriage was suffering. Any idea why Ms. Kowalski began to present to Michelle Rogers for a series of visits through 2016? I do not know. Okay, fair enough. Uh, looking at this 12-16-15 record from Eagles Wings Counseling Center at EW62, um, it says here, Bayada requested at-home visits. Do you see where that is down towards the bottom? Yes, I see that. And... and it, would that be home visits for herself or for her child, or do you know? For Maya. Fair enough. And then I think it says next here under process notes, processed Mexico trip. Do you see that? Uh, what is that a reference to? That means we would have talked about um, probably some of the way that she yeah. and how that refers to her. That means we probably had a conversation regarding that trip to Mexico. So... Going back to this Mexico trip, what do you recall, separate and apart of the charting today, uh, that Bayada communicated to you about the trip to Mexico? I don't recall anything sharing about the Do trip. you recall mom mentioning that the child was intubated and given enough ketamine to put her into what's known as a ketamine coma? She did mention that, yes. Okay, what do you recall about the ketamine coma? Um, that is all I knew about the ketamine coma. Did Ms. Kowalski express any concerns or anxieties about the ketamine coma experience? I'm guessing as a mother, well, I'm not guessing, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't recall her saying anything specific about that. Do you recall Mrs. Kowalski or anyone saying anything about returning to Mexico for additional ketamine treatments in December of 2015? I don't recall. Okay. And I think you referenced this earlier, but it says marriage is suffering here. Do you recall any 
discussion with Beata Kowalski about the nature of her marriage. She did mention that the stress of Maya's illness was impacting their marriage. How was it impacting the marriage? Well, I've written here, there's a lack of communication. They're feeling on edge. They're feeling disconnected. Do you know one way or the other whether Beata he had underlying um, mental health issues prior to presenting to you? I'm not. All right. Let me go back now to Maya's visits um, beginning in 2017. So this would have been after Maya's mother passed away, after she left Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, I'd like to kind of pick up there. Um, before I do that, though, I think you had mentioned that you uh, had spoke to or reviewed some records from Tashana Duncan. Is that correct? Yes, I spoke to Tashana. How often did you speak to, to Mrs. Duncan? One time. Uh, approximately how long was the conversation? I would guess 30 minutes. I, I don't recall. Do you recall what you guys spoke about? We spoke about Maya. And uh, what did you guys communicate about Maya? That uh, Dr. Duncan had um, evaluated her, I believe, and what the conclusions of that evaluation were. Separate apart from these notes, um, what do you recall about that family consult back in um, mid-January of 2017? I recall that that was soon after Beata passed away. So Jack, Kyle, and Maya had come in. Um, and then it turned into just pretty much being a session with Maya. EW15, it says, empathetically remind, uh, responded to client's story of waking at 1 a.m. the night her mom passed, woke up crying missing mom. I was a little confused by this. Do you recall this conversation and this note? And can you please provide some context for it? I don't re remember any specifics around that note. Okay. Because the way I read it, I thought, you know, Maya had woke up around 1 a.m. the night her mom passed away, but then I, I wasn't sure if, if, if that was the case or not. Um, can you provide some context on what that note means? I know just what's written here. All right. And this would have been, the source of this would have been from Maya? Yes. On the very first page... Of, of this, these handwritten notes, EW14, there's a note here that says art therapy. Do you know why that was documented there? Well, that was just clarifying what type of therapy we did that day. Oh, that you did that day. Okay, understood. And then I see throughout your notes, sometimes you allowed Maya to vent. Um, what, what do you mean when you say vent? <sighs> Express what she was feeling in that moment to give her a safe space to, to vent. Okay, so under 125.17, I have mood here appropriate. Do you see that? Yes. And affect appropriate. Do you see that? Do you see it? Yes. And am I correct in assuming you didn't check depressed, anxious, or depressed on either of those two? I did not because appropriate is referring to what is happening specific to her in the moment. So she was feeling appropriate given the grief that she was experiencing that she just lost her mother. Did, did she pe appear depressed, anxious? Yes. Okay. Right. Why not document that she was depressed and anxious or depressed? Because below where it's, we, it's circled grief, right? And she has the appropriate mood for experiencing grief. At any point in rendering yeah. services to Bayana Kowalski, did you think she needed to be Baker acted? No. Understood. Okay. And so EW24, that's the January 31, 2017 record. Do you have that in front of you? I do. And at the top again, it, it, you didn't check depressed, anxious, or depressed? I did not. So you went out on your own as a small business owner around that time and continued with the family. I, I assume you took them as, um, took them as uh, your clients over to your new place? I did. Okay. So I just want to stick to Maya now. Um, and I'm just trying to get an idea of what days of service you have, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 for Maya. On my list, it says March 15th of 2017 and then January 23rd of 2020. 
And do you know why there was a approximately two year and uh, nine month gap between March 15 of 2017 and January 23, 2020. I don't know. Did you recommend after March 15, 2017 that Maya take uh, several months off of individual counseling? No. Uh, what did you recommend in terms of continuing with counseling after March 15 of 2017? There was no specific recommendation. Do you have any idea why there was this gap between 2017 and 2020 in terms of individual services? My idea would be that the, the children were pretty overwhelmed um, and just needed to take a break. Take a break from therapy? Take a break from probably a lot of things. Huh. And was that your recommendation? It was not. All right. Now, the next record I have here and it's not listed on the appointment report because I think it's a family consult. And that was August 1 of 2017. Do you have that record? It's at RC3. And it says family in the upper right-hand corner. And you block some stuff up, but I can tell that Maya was there. And then I've got two black lines. And I would assume that's Kyle and Jack. They're blacked out. But um, do you have access to that family counseling note from August 1, 2017? That's under Jack's uh, records. Okay. And then um, at the bottom of um, progress notes plan, um, it says here, quote, doing well, connected to friends, community, Maya doing well, hoping to walk before school starts 814. Do you see that? Do you see that? At this point, August of 2017, what's your independent recollection of Maya's ambulatory status? She was still in a wheelchair at that point. All right. Let me jump forward, and we're in Maya's records here again. So we had an August 2017 visit. What is the next counseling record that you have for Maya Kowalski after August 2017. January 23rd, 2020. Um, do you know why there was approximately a two year and four month gap in resuming individual counseling services from August of 2017 to January 23 of 2020? I don't know. Did you recommend that gap in time in terms of counseling services? I did not. I think you said you did not tell the patients to stop individual counseling between August 2017 and January of 2020, right? Right. And why did you want her to continue with individual counseling in 2017, 2018, and 2019? Well, as I mentioned before, the continued care would have been a good thing. Do you have any idea why there was no more care at, in after August of 2017 and then 2018 and 2019? I do not know. Okay. And so you recognize the standard progress note at RC25 as your progress note from January 23, 2020? Yes. And this was an individual session with Maya? Yes. And I think you wrote here, quote, CT. And is that Maya, the CT? Yes, and it looks like, according to the note, that it was a shared session between Maya and Kyle. I, okay, I was going to ask. It was split between M and K, so that would be split between Maya and Kyle. You wrote here, CT reports all is well at home and at school, end quote. Do you see that? Um, who is that a reference to? Um, that would be in reference to Maya. Okay, and um, later on it says... Um, that the CT slightly concerned about managing privacy after a case is revealed more publicly. Do you see that? What is that a reference to? Um, I think that's just, if, you know, neighbors, family, friends, school. When you say case, what was, she, what was Maya referencing there? This particular case. 
the lawsuit. Do you recall at this point whether Maya was walking in a wheelchair on crutches? Maya was walking at this point. Do you know at what point she began to walk? No. My next note, or Maya's next note that I have here, is from June 11, 2020. It's at RC 26. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And do you recognize that as a progress note from your mental health services you provided on that date? I do. Okay. And am I correct in reading this that the client had, quote, no difficulty with comprehension of the social world and communication with others, no difficulty with physical movement and engaging physically in the world, and no difficulty in taking care of basic needs and self-care, no difficulty with social interaction and interpersonal relationships. The client's affective and emotional state appeared generally positive and mildly anxious. Do you see those? I do. Okay. And that's from your consult note? Yes. All right. My next visit that I have, let me ask you this before I go on to the next visit. Do you know why there was approximately a six-month gap between the June 23, 2020 visit and the June 11, 2020 visit? I do not know. Did you ever recommend a six-month gap in individual counseling session? Would you have preferred that Maya continue with individual counseling sessions in that six-month interval? Did Maya make any comments in September 29, 2020 about any weight loss or any other physical issues she was experiencing following the deposition? No. If the patient had lost 20 pounds, is that the kind of thing you would document? Yes. If the patient wasn't eating, is that something you would document? Yes. Okay. And then our last note we have here, I believe, from Maya is from November 5, 2020. Do you see that? Yes. Do you recall if Maya expressed any concerns about her inability to eat during this visit? She did. Okay. At what point did she start having trouble eating? I did not document a date for that, but as you can see in the psychotherapy note, we discussed her stomach issues. Okay. So when you say stomach issues, is that stomach pain or her inability to eat? Both. Okay. So what do you recall about Maya's inability to eat around the time of the November 5, 2020 consult? Just that she was uncomfortable. She had pain. She was very much trying to get rid of the anxiety and some of the fears, thinking that it was related to her stomach. It has been suggested that Maya lost 20 pounds between late August and as recently as October, November of 2020. Do you recall Maya losing approximately 20 pounds off of her frame? Those two sessions, the one in September and November, were video sessions, so I did not see her in person. Lighting was not ideal, so that would be hard for me to discriminate. Did Maya or her father ever express the fact that she had lost 20 pounds to you? Jack had expressed that he was concerned about her stomach issues to me. Did he advise that he was concerned about weight loss? Yes, probably in that conversation. If you have a patient you're treating who is having stomach issues that you believe are related to anxiety, would you ordinarily document a significant weight loss in your charting? I would, but that would be, you know, I'm looking back at Jack's notes because I want to say that I recall that I put that in one of his notes. I'm looking back to see. Please do. I don't see that. I don't see it. Are there any scheduled or planned consults with either Maya, Jack, or Kyle coming up in the near future? I do not think we have anything on the table right now. Are you recommending continued counseling services with Maya, Jack, or her brother? Yes. And with what frequency are you recommending continued counseling sessions? At least once a month. Based on your observation of Maya Kowalski in 2020, 
or when you actually physically were around her, how would you compare her condition in 2020 to the Maya Kowalski you saw in 2015 and 2016? Uh, her condition has improved. During uh, your most recent um, consult visits with Maya or the conversation with Mr. Kowalski, was any reference ever made to a relapse of Maya's CRPS, which is also known as RDS and sometimes also listed as RSD? No. If there had been such a relapse communicated to you, do you think that's something that you would document in your records? There have been some experts retained by plaintiffs that have reached out to some um, um, some of Maya's treating providers. Um, were you ever reached by anybody who was uh, retained as an expert by the Kowalski family in this case to discuss Maya's situation? I was contacted by a gentleman, I don't recall his name, regarding um, the future of what it could look like for Maya as far as work. You're going to have to speak up on that one. I, I lost you, but I think I think you said you had spoken to somebody else whose name you didn't recall. Right, somebody I didn't recall in regards to my her career, occupation, what that what that may or may not look like for her. Oh, okay, so it sounds like you got you were contacted by like a life care planner. I guess so. Yes. Okay, uh, do you, and you don't recall this individual's name? I don't not right now. Uh, man, yeah, man, woman. A man. Uh, was it uh, Mr. Santos Bifulco? Um, wow, that's impressive. An associate of his, possibly. Okay, but that name, Bifulco, um, rings a bell? Yes. When did you speak to uh, Mr. Bifulco or his associate? Uh, uh, probably three months ago. What was, to your understanding, the purpose of that phone call? Um, just to get my insight on um, my future, I guess, I, you know, what this could look like for her if she continues to recover. And what was your input that you provided to um, this individual? Um, we also discussed continuing okay. Treatment, what, what would be probably necessary for her own psychological well-being. That was the majority of our conversation. Okay. And what recommendations about continued psychological care did you provide to this individual? That she would, that would be beneficial due to the PTSD, that she would have uh, fairly regular check-ins with a therapist um, as the years go on. And when you say fairly regular, how regular are we talking here? Um, I think it depends on how far out in the future we are. How about the immediate, how about the next year? The next year, at least once a month. At least, so you would advocate for more than once a month or exactly once a month? One to two times a month. Um, would you recommend one to two times a month back in 2016? Yes. Would you have recommended once or more a month in 2017? Yes. Would you have recommended once or more than once a month in 2018? Yes. Same question for 2019. Yes. Same question for 2020. Yes. Okay, so as we sit here today, I guess what I'm driving at is, as we sit here today, are you able to say after 2021 with what frequency Maya should have mental health counseling services? Can you answer? You're, you're ask, just to clarify, you're asking me how often Maya should be in therapy in 2021. In 20, well, I think 2021, I think you said once a month or more, and then I'm trying to get an idea of after 2021, are you able, as you sit here today, within a reasonable degree of probability, project how many services and sessions Maya would need in 2022 and beyond? I would say in, in, once a month with some phone check-ins, just to touch base. And for how long would you want those services to continue? 12 to 18 months after that. Understood. But when you were talking to Mr. Bifulco or his associate, did you predict the future with him? I pretty much gave him very similar answers to what I've shared with you. Fair enough. Probably did mention that there's going to be a lifetime uh, probability of check-ins that she might need with the therapist due to her mother's suicide and due to the trauma that she's experienced. 
at any point did anyone from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital uh, contact you to discuss Maya's situation? I don't believe so. As we sit here today, you're not able to say when the next therapy session with Maya is? No, I have nothing scheduled as of now. And have you had a chance to review Bayana Kowalski's suicide letter? No. Uh, at any point, did Beata Kowalski ever express suicidal ideations to you? No. And I think you previously testified you never saw a need to Baker Act, is that correct? I did not. Did you ever discuss with Ms. Rogers the need to Baker Act Beata Kowalski while Ms. Rogers was caring for <laughs> Mrs. Kowalski? No. Uh, no, that's all right. Let me just, in, in, in keeping it, paying attention to the September 29th visit and the November 5th visit of this year, did you make any referrals of any kind based upon the interaction you had with Maya or Jack? No. And would it be fair to say, based upon your normal practice of routine, that in the event that you did believe that whatever situation presented itself, if, if, a, if a referral was in order, you would have made such a referral? Yes. Ms. Johnson, hi, it's Greg Anderson. I'm counsel for... Uh, Maya Kowalski, the Kowalski family. Um, on October 21st, 2016, you wrote, you and signed by Lauren Mock, um, a letter to whom it may concern over at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And it looks like it was faxed there. And it looks like it was faxed also to Dr. Sally Smith. Um, I had it sent over. I was just wondering, maybe Christina had seen it or do you remember it? You just handed that to me. Okay. I'm going to mark that as Exhibit 1 here. You were asked to do this, as I understand it, by the Kowalskis? Correct. And the reason was given to you that they wanted the doctors involved in this to know about you, that you were, in fact, treating their daughter and what you some of your opinions were right, right. Uh, letter also says um, you were dealing with Maya for depression as a result of her physical limitations of RSD as well as distress because she feels uh, because of her current circumstances including school and social settings was the inability to be able to be schooled um, of significance to Maya and her symptoms? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to observe the interaction between Maya and her mother, Beata, on multiple occasions? Tim, on those family sessions notated in the appointment records. How would you describe the relationship between Beata and Maya from what you observed? It seemed healthy. It seemed good. Did you ever find in any of the time that you observed the Kowalski family together or apart any indications whatsoever that Beata Kowalski was engaging in or was capable of engaging in abuse of her daughter? My answer is no. The times that you observed them together, uh, would you, I see in your letter, you say, each time Maya came to see me, I perceived nothing but love, care, and devotion towards her from her parents. Um, is, do you still maintain that opinion um, as to that relationship after all this time? Yeah. And you've had the opportunity to meet with Kyle Kowalski on a number of occasions uh, since, since March of 2016. Has the death of his mother had significant effect on Kyle? Yeah. Well, can you describe a little bit for the jury what Kyle has gone through through the loss of his mother in this traumatic manner? Um, Kyle has been significantly impacted by his mother's death, as if any child his age would have been. Grief, sadness, um, really a lot of all of it, for sure. Sure. It goes into, has it come to your attention that CRPS goes into remission and then um, can come out of uh, remission um, a, a number of times in the victim's life? Yeah. When Maya 
becomes victim again to the pain and discomfort and problems, physiological problems that arise from a relapse of the CRPS. Will she, into your opinion, into a reasonable psychological probability, require increased psychological and care and therapy to deal with the issues, the quilli that arise from it? Yes. Yes. Did you ever have anyone from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital call you or email you or otherwise seek to speak with you about your care and treatment of Maya Kowalski? My only interaction was with the social worker. I believe she was affiliated with the hospital. So did you have the opportunity to express your treatment to them or not? Yes. You did? Okay. So they were aware that you were conducting behavioral cognitive therapy on Maya? They requested my notes. But you told them that you were performing behavioral cognitive therapy to assist Maya? I do not recall if I said CBT specifically, but again, it's included in the notes that they had received. Okay. So you said it in the notes. That'd be correct. Okay. And after those notes were transmitted, did you have any opportunity by their initiation? In other words, did any of them call you to confirm that, in fact, the Kowalskis had sought out behavioral cognitive therapy for Maya to treat this disease? I don't believe so. And had they contacted you, would you have explained to them that, yes, the Kowalskis did, in fact, seek these types of psychological therapies for their child to combat CRPS? Would you have told them? Of course. Would it be correct that nowhere in your records is it reflected that Sally Smith contacted you? I have not seen anything in my records saying such. And if Sally Smith did contact you and inquired in any way about your involvement, you would have expressed to her that you had been conducting behavioral cognitive therapy on this child? Yes. Okay. And then I'd like to draw your attention to another note with Kyle Kowalski from June 11, 2020, and it appears to be a shared video session with Maya. It's at RC21. Let me know when you have that note up. I have it. Okay. And so this was another joint session, correct? Yes. Okay. And do you see where it says client appeared to be, quote, very good with minimal difficulties and is able to cope well in most areas of life, end quote? Do you see that? I do. Okay. And you stand by that comment? At that point, yes. Let me just cut to the chase. Do you have any evidence that Maya Kowalski received cognitive behavioral therapy services at your institution or elsewhere between January and August of 2016? Until she resumed on August 10 of 2016. I don't believe. Okay. So you don't have any evidence that there was any cognitive behavioral therapy January to early August of 2016? No. And you didn't recommend the cessation of services during that interval, correct? I did not recommend the cessation. What informed your decision about the relapse potential for complex regional pain syndrome? That was, I believe, in some of the readings that I've done and then in a conversation with Mr. Anderson. Okay. So the concept of a relapse on CRPS that was discussed between you and Mr. Anderson when you guys spoke? It was, but it wasn't the first time I've heard that. What's your understanding of what kind of things can trigger a relapse in a complex regional pain syndrome patient? Stress. 
What else? Uh, possibly any other kind of illnesses that are happening at the at the moment that could trigger symptoms. Do you remember physical trauma being one? I, I not necessarily. I don't remember that specifically. Okay. Any other things that can lead to a relapse, to your knowledge, of CRPS? Not to my knowledge. Do you hold yourself out as an expert in the treatment of CRPS? Uh, I believe Maya was your first pediatric CRPS patient that you treated, correct? Correct. How many other patients before Maya, whether they're adult or pediatric, uh, have you provided services for that had complex regional pain syndrome? Um, I think you were asked by Mr. Anderson um, the whether mom did everything that she could to, to help this child. Do you recall that question or some variant thereof? Yes. Is it your opinion that maternal suicide is helpful to a child? No, that is not helpful. Why is it not helpful? The trauma of the grief. What is your understanding of why Maya's mother committed suicide? Or do you not have an opinion on that either way? My understanding is that the auto felt that because the allegations were against her, she was what was keeping her child from coming home. Okay. And, and who provided you with that information? The family. Okay, members of the jury, uh, that concludes the first deposition. We're going to take a break. We'd like to publish some of the jury before we take a break. Is it short? It's one page. Is it in evidence? It is. Then yes, you may. Thank you. Can we see it, please, sir? You may. There's, is, is it a, a question of the deponent who's not here, or is it a question for me? Question for you. <clears throat> okay. Are we okay to publish what Mr. Whitney wanted to publish? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Whitney, you can go ahead. Ask the jury, perhaps, if they're done reading. We still have a jury taking notes. Okay. Members of the jury, there was a, a request from one of your number about what is a Baker Act. In Florida, there is a mechanism by which certain individuals are allowed to take a person into custody against their will and take them to a, I think we call it a receiving facility to provide uh, immediate uh, psychiatric uh, assistance. And it's much more complicated than that, but basically it's, it's the ability to allow certain individuals to take someone into custody and deliver them to that facility for uh, immediate uh, help. 
Okay. With that, we're now going to uh, take a 10 minute break. We do have another deposition to, to show you and it's you know gonna take us into the 12 o'clock hour. So let's try to keep this break to 10 minutes. So are there any issues we need to address before we go on break? I don't think so. I just are the videographers providing to the court the running total of what was designated towards us versus what what I need from both sides is you tell me what what was what and I'll record it. So Wait, do you have and like I said, it, why don't why don't you the, the lawyers talk about it? Okay. I want it in five minute increments. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Judge. Honor. I'm so sorry, what? Want they want a bill for it. <laughs> you want to make a tenth of an hour like they're used to? Well, I, I tell you, um, if it wasn't the math, I would probably just do it in the point ones, but that's six minutes as opposed to.
thing we need to address before we bring the jury back in? No, on behalf of the plaintiff. I don't believe so, Your Honor. Okay, let's bring in the jury. Please be seated, everybody. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and you received no information. Is that all correct? And that uh, no one from the media or no one has approached you about this case since uh, you went on break. And that you have not seen any media coverage since you went on break. Okay, Mr. Anderson, who are we calling next? Deposition of Catherine Beatty. Catherine Beatty by deposition. Okay. Um, Mr. Reyes, you may. Whoops, I need to turn the system back on. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name for the record. Catherine R. Beatty. Good. And where do you work? I work for John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And what is your position? I'm a pediatric intensive care licensed clinical social worker. Have you been disciplined in any of your jobs? Yes. Right. Have you been dis disciplined in any of your jobs? Yes. All right. Tell me where and why. Um, I was disciplined at John Hopkins for yelling at, a, at a, another coworker. And what was the uh, consequence? Were you? It was just a written. A written a write up, basically. Yes. What happened there? It was, I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, you guys got into an argument? Yes. Okay. But whatever happened, Johns Hopkins felt it was necessary to write you up? That was, that's my understanding. Okay. So in any event, after that uh, discipline, were you subject to any retraining of any kind? No. And obviously you were not fired. What was the name of the person that made the complaint against you? Um, her name is Pam. For the life of me, I don't remember her last name. And what was her position? She was a case manager in the cardiac care unit. What's a case manager? Is that another social worker? No, case managers. Um, the nurse? No. Well, they, she is a nurse, but they work to coordinate discharge for medical equipment, medications, home nursing. Um, they work to help discharge patients to rehab centers. And what was the essence of the dispute? Yeah. Here, let, let me show you. Maybe I can help you. I'm going to show you Exhibit 3 for the record. Okay. It, and wh what is that date? 11-18-2016. 2016. 11-18-16? Yes. So this was during Maya's stay? Yes. Okay. And um, what happened? Were you complaining at the time of covering more than one uh, unit, if you will, or floor? Yes. At that time, were you covering more than one floor? I was covering two units. What units? Uh, the pediatric intensive care unit and the 
um, cardiovascular intensive care unit. All right. Where was Maya Kowalski? What unit was she in at this time, November? Um, she would have been on the seventh floor. And what was that? The seventh floor is a um, med surge floor along with... Med surge? Yes. So what some of our medical and surgical... <laughs> okay. Yeah. So for surgery. Yeah. And there's also EEG floor. Why was she on that floor? I don't know that. Okay. But was that your assigned floor? In other words, were you part of med surgical or EEG? No, I was not part of that. But yeah, you stayed with Maya when she moved onto that floor, did you not? I did. And then in November, what's the date there? November 18th. You were complaining that you were essentially overworked by having both the pediatric intensive care and the cardio intensive care units to look after? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? yes? I'm sorry. And you chose nonetheless to take on responsibility for trying to manage visitation and counseling needs for Maya Kowalski? Um, it was an assignment. It wasn't something that I chose to do. Okay, for the record, Ms. Beatty, it's from Nina Bagby Bishop. Who's she? Yeah. She was a social worker that was with the hospital. All right. And um, it's to you, and it's dated October 19, 2016. Subject is 709 Maya Kowalski. Was 709 her room number or something? That designation yes. there? Yes. Yeah, figure. Okay, and it says, Dear Kathy, Avon said you were wanting to continue to follow this child. Please let me know if you plan to do this now that she's on my floor. Thanks, Nina. All right, so I'm guessing Nina was uh, the social worker on the seventh floor? Correct. And it says uh, Avon. Who is Avon? Avon was another social worker. Avon said you wanted to continue to follow this child. Is that true? No, it was assigned, and I said I would continue to follow. Okay, so when Yvonne said you were wanting to follow this child, Yvonne was incorrect. Correct. You were assigned it and you did not ask for this assignment in any way? I don't know. I don't think so. Did you receive any instructions or including to just keep them up to speed from anybody from risk management? Yes. And who was that? Uh, I talked with Patty Condon. Okay. Patty, a doctor or a nurse? I don't know what Patty's profession is. She's okay. in risk management. Okay. Who else? Um, that would be who I talked to in risk management, mostly. I'm, I may have talked to Louise. Um, Was risk management fairly involved in this case, uh, maybe not initially in October, but after a few months? Yes. And so let me ask you something about how you got involved in this case. First, I want to know a little bit about your qualifications for a case that I think you would agree with me is this complex. Would you agree with me this is a complex case? Yes, I would agree with you. Tell me what, before being assigned to Maya, what specific training you had in CRPS? I didn't have any in CRPS. What is RSD? I, regional, it's regional pain disorder. Okay. I had to think about it. All right. How about, um, you, do you have any specific training in RSD? No. How about Munchausen's by proxy? Um, Yes, in graduate school. Okay, and what, what was that specific training that you had in graduate school? Um, psychopathology. And how long would you say they spent on Munchausen by proxy? I can't tell you, that was a long time ago. I mean, was this an entire course devoted to it, or is this one of 
several subjects of knowing about different abuse disorders? What was it? It was um, a course designed for psychopathology that also highlighted, there was highlights of child abuse, different forms of child abuse. Okay. And prior to the allegations against Maya Kowalski, how many cases, if any, of Munchausen's by proxy where it was confirmed it was Munch Munchausen by proxy had you handled? Three. All right. Three cases. Mm -hmm. Was there, did anyone at Johns Hopkins, management or physician wise, ever question leaving you on such a sensitive case as Maya Kowalski after the write up with your conflict with a coworker? Not that I'm aware of. So they left you on despite this incident, right? Yes. Would you agree with me that three cases do not make you an expert in Munchausen by proxy? Yes. Would you agree with me that you have no background training and experience uh, to provide any expertise <coughs> in Munchausen by proxy? To, to provide? To any expertise in Munchausen by proxy? Um, I have a little bit of knowledge of it from the cases. All right. But I'm certainly not, I have not researched and I'm not a... All right, so when you gained knowledge though, it was from physicians, I would gather. Psychologists or doctors, people like that. Sometimes, yes. Well, did you read things about it or study anything yes. about it? Okay, what did you read and study? So through graduate school, I read um, many of articles that were written in the medical literature along with the social work literature. Specific to Munchausen by proxy? Yes. Okay. So then, are you telling us you had sufficient knowledge to determine whether a specific action, inaction, or behavior was consistent with Munchausen by proxy? That's not my role at the hospital. Okay. You alone would not know whether a particular activity, action, reaction, symptom was part of what, say, a DSM-4, DSM-5 diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy would be? No, I would know. You would know which was a symptom and which wasn't a symptom? I would know some of them, yes. Okay, name the top five symptoms of Munchausen by proxy. Uh, the parent is, seeks multiple uh, medical uh, professionals in order to um, get diagnoses on very vague kinds of symptoms. Uh, the child may be admitted to ERs or multiple hospitals. The parent is often unwilling to share information from other providers with providers, with current providers. Um, the parents are demanding of certain medical treatments that seem out of place or out of line um, with, the, with the current medical diagnosis. The parents seem very attentive to their child. Anything else? Um, you asked for the top five, so. Okay. I was thinking more in terms of physical symptoms of the child themselves. Physical symptoms of the child is, again, very vague diagnoses. Symptoms could be just about anything, depending on what, was, what the parent was using. The distinguish for me the telltale lesions from uh, CRPS from, say, scratches? I can't. Okay. So uh, these seem like more psychological evaluations about uh, 
the parent's willingness to share information, right? That's part of the DSM-5 diagnosis. Okay. What is your role then? So my role is to coordinate with the unit um, the needs for the patient that might be getting the medical team together in order to discuss the progress of a case, to discuss with the parents um, the medical um, condition of the child. Um, I work with and making sure that p the all the multidisciplinary teams are working with the patient that need to work with the patient. Um, Aren't those medical decisions? Well, if, if they are medical decisions, but if I have questions from PT, OT, or, or speech therapy, you know, I may be working with them to make sure that parents and the providers understand what the needs are. I also work um, a lot with DCF on cases. Um, so I'm making sure that the DCF orders are followed. I'm working with detectives and CPIs in coordinating their access to the patients, coordinating their access to records. When you start caring for a patient, do you read the chart? Yes. Do you determine what the operating diagnosis is? Yes. Did this child's operating diagnosis include complex regional pain syndrome? Her diagnosis included that, yes. As soon as this child, the medical doctors, not you, determined, hospital determined in the chart that she did have complex regional pain syndrome, that invalidated any allegation of Munchausen's by proxy, correct? That was not a determination for me to make. Well, you said that you'd read up on it, right? On Munchausen, correct. And you did recommend on multiple occasions that the child be kept in the hospital, did you not? It, it I was I just my, read it to yes. you. Yes, yes I did. And on multiple occasions, you made recommendations to keep the mother away from the child, did you not? Yes. And on multiple occasions, you made recommendations to limit the child's contact with certain family members, including the father, did you not? Yes. All of the things you were doing were based on a presumption that there was Munchausen's by proxy going on with this family, right? Not my presumption. Um, at that point, she had been sheltered, and I had to follow the shelter order along with the visitation orders that were given by the court. I made recommendations um, based on how Maya was participating in her therapies and with the staff. Isn't it true you were the person in the hospital that had the primary control over who saw Maya, what Maya ate, what she did, who she could talk to? No. Okay, who else in the hospital after reviewing all of these emails and memos we're about to go over, who else had day-to-day -day control over who Maya could see and not see and who could come in at what time and not come in at one time? What other person? That was up to the court order. You read all these court orders before this deposition, did you not? I did read the court orders. And you're aware that when those limitations were put in, that the court then deferred to the hospital for the specifics of everything, right? Correct. The court made certain general findings for the benefit of the child, but then deferred to the hospital about how to implement those, right? Correct. Order behind you, but you were the person in terms of when we get to the hospital's discretion on to do things, you were the person that had most day-to-day -day control, if you will. I was at that point consulting with risk, and so that would have been up to risk to interpret, and I asked many times to have her interpret them for me so that we knew what we were supposed to do and not do. Right. 
But the day-to-day -day implementation of the orders left it up to the hospital, right? Well, the hospital's it. discretion, correct? You can answer. As much as, it, yes, as much as we could. Okay. That discretion then, is it your testimony here that your discretion, whatever actions you implemented regarding who got to see Maya, how much they got to see him, what she ate, all of these things that involved limitations on her life while she was in there. Those actually came from the Risk Management Committee, right? Yes. If the, do if the father has a visitation rights, um, who was making the decision of how, where, and when Jack Kowalski could see his daughter? DCF. So you were not involved in making that decision? No. Where's the, where are the uh, orders from DCF? This is it. Okay. It says supervised. So in order to supervise, what did you understand needed to happen? DCF had to give us somebody to supervise the visit. We don't do that. Okay. And did they ever give you somebody to supervise the visit? Mr. Kowalski had visits, so yes, I would assume they did. Okay, well, how did you know who was authorized to visit and who wasn't? So a CPI would call or somebody from the Department of Children and Families would call us. Who made the initial call to, or either call, to the hotline? The first one was made by Debbie Hansen, and the second one was made by Lane Brown. Debbie Hansen? And who's Debbie Hansen? She was a social worker at the hospital. Did you ever speak with her? Well, yeah. I mean, she worked on the this? team with me. Okay. And then who was the next one? Elaine Brown? Elaine Brown. And who was Elaine Brown? She was their social worker on the weekend. Did it strike you, or does it strike you at any time, how serious it is to take a nine-year-old girl away from her family? You, well, yes, definitely. How harmful that is to a child? It can be. Okay. So what did you understand was the reason that a shelter order was entered? My understanding from the shelter order is that they had information from Dr. Smith and our medical records. Okay. Dr. Smith then and JHACH medical records, right? Yes. As one of the people who saw Maya the most in the hospital, tell this jury what you saw with your training in Munchausen by proxy that indicated that these, this family was abusing Maya. So what I can say is that the medical team reported to me that the no, parents... No, I'm not asking what people reported to you. I'm asking what you saw with your own two eyes, mark one eyeballs, what did you see that I would heard, support that? I heard and saw the mother on... You heard what? I heard and saw on numerous occasions the mother demanding from the doctors that the child be given amounts of ketamine, and I heard discussions from the doctors saying that that was too dangerous. Did you know at any of those times that there were multiple expert doctors who had actually prescribed that amount of ketamine? I didn't know that. No one ever told you that Dr. Kirkpatrick, was, she was under his care and he was prescribing that? So, did you know that or did you not so know that? Early on, early on, probably not. Did you know Dr. Hanna was prescribing that? Early on, probably not. Okay, well, if it wasn't JHACH doctors, how would you know what is an appropriate amount of ketamine for a complex regional pain syndrome nine-year-old during flare-up periods? How do you personally know that? Well, personally, I don't know that. Thank you. Attending reports, Nemours told the mother the current care uh, the patients received from other providers is not the standard of care and it could be harmful if not deadly to the daughter. So this is you 
repeating back what a doctor said that a, another doctor at Nemours who was not treating the patient said was the standard of care, right? Say that again, please. This note reflects, is that your note? It's my note. Okay. So this is your note stating that you heard from a doctor in the pediatric intensive care unit, right? That's where you got the information about Dr. Santana. You never spoke to Dr. Santana yeah. yourself? She was actually on the phone with us. All right. So you were on the phone when she was talking? Yes. Okay. So would it be safe to say then that the basis, the, your basis with your own eyes and ears, which was the question, for why Maya should be taken away from her family was this request for an amount of ketamine that was in excess of what you heard was appropriate. Is that right? Correct. And did you explain to her why the report was made? Um, I attempted to, but she shut me down and didn't want to talk to me about why the report was made. She wanted me to name the doctor that made the report, and she wanted me to call whoever that doctor was and have them rescind it. She also wanted me to speak to risk management immediately and get them to call her back. What's wrong with that? That's an indication of child abuse? No. I have, let me rephrase that. In all of my dealings at the hospital, I usually don't have parents who ask for risk management and who don't demand that we call the hotline report and have it rescinded. Also, she was saying at that point she had no intentions of following um, the recommendations here. I watched her and observed her in rounds demanding with the doctors of what to be done. All right. But look, you're talking about taking a little girl away from her parents. Are you telling me that to the best of your knowledge, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital took this little girl away for over three months because of a dispute over dosage? First of all, John Hopkins didn't take this child away from her parents. We'll get down with that later. Okay. So that was a court um, decided that through DCF. I understand that somebody called the court, called DCF and complained that this was child abuse and that this child should be taken away from her mother and that the people that said that were all children's hospital doctors, social workers, and nurses. You understand that, right? Under Florida statute, we have the responsibility to report all suspected child abuse. And I'm going to direct you to the second page, which is uh, 001142, plaintiffs 1142. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. eight? Yes, sir. Okay. And if you look at um, uh, 1142, the next page there, it says at the top under the family have the right, the middle column, it says to talk with another doctor or specialist at your own request and expense or to ask for a transfer to another health care provider, providing it is medically acceptable and the other provider will accept your transfer. Is that right? Yes. Did they have the right under JHACH uh, Bill of Rights for patients to get transferred out of there upon request? Yes. Did they have a right, that is, did Maya have a right to a timely response to her complaints of pain, according to that? Yes. Did they have a right to participate in decision making and being informed of options in pain management? Yes. Well, if she's repeatedly say, stating that she's in pain, it's a pretty good indication 
she's in pain, isn't it? When we look at pain and when um, I see kids in pain, Maya was um, never showed some of the symptoms that we see other kids in pain having. Okay. Tell me what training you have in the identification of pediatric pain. Um, so on an ongoing basis in the unit, I work with kids that have chronic pain or that are having pain from um, certain procedures and or things that have happened to them. We work on coping skills, sometimes relaxation therapies. Um, sometimes mindfulness. Um, I see children in pain from surgeries, car accidents, traumas. Um, we see kids in pain from cancer. Um, we see kids in pain um, from just, again, a multitude of things that might be happening to them medically. Okay. Uh, well, are there any accepted medical symptomolo symptomology, I guess it would be, about identifying pain in children? I any criteria, any objective standards, or is this all subjective? I, don't, I think, again, that what we look for at all children's, that when I am actually in front of a child, what I'm looking for, and they're saying that they're in pain, um, we're looking to see uh, how they're dealing with their daily, uh, daily functioning. Um, we're looking to see, we're looking to see uh, again, um, some of the things that they might be showing us, because not all children are going to be talking to you. So we might be looking for signs that they're... Um, they're uncomfortable in the bed, they're moving around a lot, um, they're pulling on an area that they might be in pain, um, they're avoiding touch. Um, some of, we would look to see if they were crying. Okay, well Maya cried, did she not? Maya cried, but not while she was reporting pain. Okay. Are you saying that Maya was not really in pain? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying, what I'm saying is, again, that Maya did not show the same type of pain symptoms that other children showed. She showed exactly the same pain symptoms that other children showed at certain times, and at certain times she did not, correct? I would say that Maya's pain was different than all the time from other children's pain. How many co a complex regional pain syndrome children have you uh, treated on a regular basis? I think we've seen two or three in the pediatric intensive care unit. Okay, and so complex regional pain syndrome is a little different than having a broken leg, is it not? Oh, yes. Complex regional pain syndrome involves a burning sensation under the skin, right? It's quite painful, is it not? I, I've never had it. Well, have you read anything on it? I have read something on it. Okay. So, Maya's symptoms were of pain were <laughs> consistent with <laughs> patients who have, children who have complex regional pain syndrome, were they not? Again. I'm sorry, I'm shaking my head. <laughs> yes. They were, right? Yes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they weren't any different than the two or three you'd had before. Right? Oh, they were different. Yes. No, they were different. The other kids that we had that had complex regional pain disorder were often, often bedridden for um, days at a time. Um, well, so was Maya. Um, for the 95 percent of the time, Maya was up in her wheelchair going to activities within the hospital. 
Um, Except on the days when she complained of extraordinary pain, right? 95% of the time that I saw Maya, Maya was up in her wheelchair, and uh, the times that she would report extraordinary pain would be when she was prompted by her mother. Um, prompted by her mother. Oh, excuse me. Are you finished? Are you finished with the answer? Um, prompted by her mother, um, or if somebody asked her if she was having pain. And sometimes that was in the setting of being down in the, um, we had the child life department has a room and activity center down on the second floor. So I do know that there were a couple of, the, maybe it was the guardian ad litem or the CPIs that met her down there. And while they were watching her have these activities, she was reporting her pain as being a 10. Okay. Is it true that that uh, Ms. Kowalski wanted to record the phone calls? Yes. With you? Yes. But that you objected? I did. Why would you object to that? So, I think that we, all children's, we have a policy not to be recorded. And I was told by risk management that we weren't agreeing to be recorded in those phone calls. A second volume, so they just need to queue it up. Did you ever have any discussions with anyone from risk management to the effect that the Kowalski case, the Maya Kowalski case, uh, was, and you can use whatever term you want, thorny or difficult or required a focus was special in some way. Yes. And tell me about those conversations. I can't tell you specifics. I can tell you that um, that there were definitely discussions that this was different than any other case because of the level of legal involvement. Elaborate, please. Usually, in cases that I deal with on a day in and day out basis in the PICU, um, when you have child abuse cases, um, the patients themselves do not have like a private attorney. Um, typically, we don't have patients that stay for as long as Maya does and go through as many different um, legal proceedings as this case did. Um, Typically, we don't um, look at three or four different discharge dates for a patient. Um, that we have up in the PICU. What's the, explain about the discharge dates. <laughs> so initially, um, there was a discussion to try to get Maya to Nemours once she had been sheltered. And case management and I worked on that discharge plan and working with Nemours to get them the recommendations they were going to need. Or getting them the, the records, I'm sorry. And what um, happened there? Um, when I called mom, mom said she that there was going to be a discussion with her attorney later that day. I called her back and she said she couldn't consent or not consent to the discharge to Nemours. And the reason that she gave was because the discharge to Nemours was with a psychiatric diagnosis, correct? I don't know that she gave me that information. I think she said that she couldn't, I think all she said to me was she couldn't agree or disagree, or couldn't consent or not consent to the discharge. Well, did you ever learn that the reason no hospital would accept Maya was because ACH decided to keep psychiatric 
diagnoses in her record and no hospital would accept a child with these psychiatric issues, alleged psychiatric issues? Actually, Nemours was willing to accept Maya. On what basis? Um, we could have transferred Maya that day that I talked to mom and I don't remember the day, but mom wouldn't consent or not consent. Um, we also had uh, discussions with, um, I think it was Kennedy Krieger, who suggested another program, um, and I can't remember the name of that program. If the mom signed off, strike it, did you ever see any of the papers involving the uh, sign off? Uh, that the parents were required to make in order to transfer the child? I don't know what you're asking me. All right, there's a recording of a conversation between you and Beata about the po potential transfer of Maya to Nemours. Uh, you didn't tell her or wouldn't tell her what program she would be transferring into. And Maya and Beata said it, they would only transfer if it was into a CRPS program. Do you remember that conversation? I don't know what you mean by a recording. A phone call that was recorded between you two. I don't. So give me your question again. Did you have a conversation with Maya? Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, okay. with Mom. With Mom. Did you have a conversation with Beata? on November 3rd, 2016, where there was a discussion about the potential transfer of Maya to Nemours. Yes, I think I did. And was the discussion centered on the type of program that Maya would be transferred into? We were transferring, I think that in all actuality, she was going to an inpatient treatment program at Nemours that would focus on cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, pain management therapy, and PT and OT therapy. A psychiatric program, in other words. Mm -hmm. the, you, they weren't there to treat CRPS. They were there to convince her she didn't have CRPS, right? Actually, no. Okay. It was supposed to be part of uh, CPRS treatment which um, would work on cognitive behavioral therapy along with pain management and then um, PT and OT therapy, and that was the program at Nemours. It wasn't a complex regional pain syndrome program, was it? I don't know. It was a Nemours patient, or Nemours program, and we attempted, yeah. Okay, but whatever was represented to Mrs. Kowalski, uh, she refused to have her child committed to that program, right? Yes. Well, she said she couldn't consent or not consent. Okay. And then what happened after that? My estate at All Children's. We continued to look for, we were directed by DCF to continue to look for programs. Well, so. Did you ever receive any notification or was there any discussion that included you that the that Maya was not getting better uh, and that CRPS was present, thus the allegations against Beata, the child abuse allegations, needed to be dropped. No one ever said that to me. And in fact, we noted on several occasions where Maya was moving her legs, moving her hands without any pain. Maya was engaging in activities such as foosball, uh, cutting out um, and making crafts in the craft room. She was out playing the piano downstairs and often moved herself around the hospital. It was only after we um, gave that information to DCF that Maya then decided or quit moving herself around the hospital for a few days. It was noted in some of the uh, music therapy and in PT therapy that she was able to move her feet and her hands 
and didn't complain of any pain while she was doing that. On occasion when I would be in the room with Maya, Maya would be showing me her Shopkins, um, her prayer cards, and she was moving herself in the wheelchair, um, laughing, giggling, playing. She um, would be putting on her makeup, wanted to put makeup on me, um, wanted to put makeup on some of the nurses. And all during those times, um, there was no pain. And there were, um, Maya was very engaging, um, very, uh, working really hard with the staff. So you think, um, so we understand your testimony, that Maya was uh, happy and thriving in the hospital. There were many days that we saw Maya doing really well in the hospital and working with the therapists that were involved with her, yes. And you say, just, I just left Maya's room. She told me she is furious, angry, and in pain. She told me she can't talk or trust anyone, and she knows there is court on Monday, and it's all lies. Maya told me if I have a problem, I need to talk to her attorney. Yes. Right? Yes. So she's telling you there, she's furious, angry, and in pain. Does that sound to you like she's thriving? Actually, there were very few days that we saw her like this. And this was only after either a visit or um, a conversation with somebody on the phone. Uh-huh. So you're blaming it on who this time? I'm not blaming it on anybody. Did you listen in to her conversations with her attorney? No. Did you listen in on conversations when she was trying to talk to the judge in court? Um, no, I don't think so. Mm -mm. So if Maya testifies that the reason uh, she was uncomfortable with testifying in over the phone and wanted to come into court was that she was terrified of you sitting next to her and what you would do to her, she'd be wrong? Yes. Okay. She just made that up, that you were sitting next to her during her court appearances. I don't know that I was sitting next to her. I think pretty... She in the was same with room. She was with her attorney at those times. Were you in the room? I don't know. I don't remember being in the rooms. Did you require Attorney Kelly to leave the door cracked while he was meeting with her? We may have. Why did you want to leave the door cracked while Maya was trying to consult with her attorney? We were not in the room with her, but there had been an episode where Maya said she fell out of her wheelchair and was on the floor for hours. So at that point, it was discussed with risk management, and risk management wanted the door left open so that we could make sure to monitor the patient. Really? So you think the attorney was going to let his client lay all over the floor and not help her? So you guys had to be there, right? beside her or listen in strike that so the purpose of cracking the door and being right there next to it because if right you were standing right next to the cracked door no then so we were going to be able to hear it by Maya shouting and screaming down the hall the door was left open so that the nurses could observe and make sure because as they were walking by it was not me observing this was the nurses observing that were on the unit. Okay, so, and the theory was that um, while Maya was in the room with her attorney, there was still a chance she would fall out of the bed and her attorney would not ask for help or otherwise assist his client lying there on the floor. So you guys had to be uh, able to look in is that is that the theory is that it was that the the theory here so risk management after that happened wanted to make sure that the door was left open at all times so that there was um, site to site so we could make sure that Maya was safe yes why would it be a big deal that she fell on the floor I never said that Maya uh, could move around freely I said that we watched her move around with her legs what Maya could and couldn't do 
was not my decision or making. I saw Maya move her legs. I saw Maya move her arms. I saw Maya move her feet. All right, so the theory then was that because Maya said she fell out of a chair once, you guys had to leave the door open or cracked so that you could see her if she fell out of the chair, right? That, that's the, uh, the direction that we got from Rusk, yes. Okay. And so has it explained to you that it was felt that the attorney would not be able or willing to help his own client uh, if she did fall out of her chair with him there? I can only speak to you what our direction was given, and that is that we had to leave the door open. So it came down from risk management that uh, Maya would not have, it was necessary to keep the door cracked, um, even when Maya was trying to consult with her own attorney? Yes. Did you ever confiscate a plastic bag uh, filled with The, the host, holy water, prayer book, what else was in there? Did you ever confiscate that? No. You never took those away or prevented her from having those? Never. Okay. Was Maya allowed to see her priest? That would have been up to the DCF order. We did have um, Father Tom that came and visited her when he was there on the weekends. Okay. Let me show you what we've marked as 13. Uh, can you identify this? It sounds like it's a telephone conversation. Okay. Had you ever seen this before? No. Okay. Um, who produced it, do you know? No. Were you aware that on this date that's being described here, January 6, 2017, um, that uh, Maya was tired and spirits low and that Dr. Hannah had told her that she was getting worse? She did tell me that, yes. Okay. Did you ever speak with Dr. Hannah? No. Why is it that JHACH chose not to discuss Maya Kowalski, or for that matter, Beata Kowalski, with any of the ongoing treating physicians? That would be out of my scope of responsibility. Were you involved in efforts to keep Dr. Hanna off the premises? That would be out of my scope of responsibility. Was DCF also monitoring the call? At sometimes they were monitoring the calls. Why, if DCF was already monitoring, did you uh, keep being there as well? In the beginning, DCF monitored those calls, and then um, those calls we were doing the monitoring, so because DCF and the Guardian Ad Litem's office said they couldn't do those calls. So in order to facilitate the calls to make sure that Maya was getting them, we agreed to do that. Um, I even came in on a couple of Saturdays to make sure that those calls happened. Okay, but why did you have to be on calls when DCF was already on the calls? There, were, there was a time that DCF wasn't going to be on those calls anymore, and we agreed so that Maya could get those calls with Mom. Uh, and that's not really my question. My question is, during the period of time while DCF was still doing the calls, why was it necessary for you also to be on the calls? Because you know, they were already being monitored by DCF. The, call, the calls for the, the calls that DCF did, all I did, DCF would call my phone, and then I would take the phone in there and put it on speakerphone. But why did you have to listen in too? That's what DCF asked us to do. Did you ever take Maya into the chapel? No. Did you ever sit Maya on your lap? 
Um, in whenever they had the last court hearing, and or it was maybe it was right before Christmas, and Maya thought she was going home. Um, I was called by Charlotte to tell, and Charlotte asked me to go in and tell Maya that Maya wasn't going to be able to be going home for Christmas. Maya became very upset, started crying. Um, I'm just asking you whether you put Maya on your lap. She asked then to sit on my lap. Oh, so <laughs> Maya asked you for permission to sit on your lap? It wasn't my idea. Strike it. So you're contending that this wasn't uh, your idea, that it was Maya's idea that she sit on your lap. Is that your testimony? Yes. All right. And did you kiss Maya? I don't think so. Were you hugging Maya? Um, I think that we provide comfort to a lot of kids. So what, probably why she was sitting on my lap, I'm sure I did hug her. Who gave you permission to touch the child in this manner? We provide a lot of comfort to kids. Now, my question, who gave you permission to be this intimate with that child? So Maya asked. She's 11. What adult, either Maya's mother or Maya's father, the only two people, not the state and not the hospital, who gave you permission to be intimate with that child? So currently at that time, DCF had custody of the child and the child and the uh, case manager on several occasions asked that we provide comfort to Maya. And in your view, comfort included what? I talked with Maya. Um, she held my hand. I would hold her hand. Um, she asked me to come in and pray with her. I guess your answer is no one with any authority to permit you to be that intimate with their child gave you permission to do so. So I do think a couple of times that Mr. Kowalski and I discussed the fact that uh, I provided comfort to Maya. Well, was Mr. Kowalski complimenting you about it, or were you telling him that you were providing comfort? I can't, I don't, can't tell you how that, the conversation happened, but I can tell you that Mr. Kowalski thanked me. So he's being polite. So by thanking you for comforting his child, is it your interpretation that that meant he believed it was okay for you to have the child on your lap and be able to hug her and kiss her? Again, I don't think that I kissed her. Are you sure you didn't kiss her? Pretty sure. So if Maya specifically remembers you kissing her and telling her it was going to be okay, that's just another thing that she made up. Typically, I don't think I would tell any of the kids that were in this situation that they're in, that everything's going to be okay. I think that we would talk about things look really bad right now. And I'm working more to help Maya with what her thoughts are, not with like, that's not usually in the repertoire of words that we would have used with her. Are you a member of the National Association of Social Workers? Yes. Are you familiar with their code of ethics? Yes. Let me show you what we'll mark, and it's, unfortunately it's highlighted, but I'm going to mark it as 14 and we'll swap out a... Uh, I need a staple or two, or pen. Um, but let me ask you about uh, section 1.10. Is that, uh, does it appear to you to be the code of ethics for what's, what's your organization called? National Association of Social Workers. It, does it appear to be your code of ethics? Could be, yes. And is there a specific section there about uh, social worker responsibilities regarding physical touching of uh, the patient? Yes, there is. And is that section 1.10? Yes, it is. Could you read it to the jury, please? 
Social workers should not engage in physical contact with clients when there is a possibility of psychological harm to the client as a result of the contact, such as cradling or caressing. Social workers who engage in appropriate physical contact with clients are responsible for setting clear, appropriate, and culturally sensitive boundaries that govern such physical contact. You had no specific authority to touch that child in that manner, did you? I was asked by the case manager to provide comfort to her, and Maya asked if she could sit in my lap. Well, a child can't get give consent to be abused or touched, can they? It's certainly at no point did I touch Maya in any way that was um, sexually related. Okay. Would you agree with me that a child cannot give consent? Children ask for comfort and the kind of medical setting that we work in at all times. Um, we often sit with kids and hold their hands or hold them. I mean, especially when it comes to kids under the age of 10, 10 to 12. There's a big difference between a kid on your lap with your arms around them and holding a child's hand when they're scared, isn't there? Maya was sobbing that night because she couldn't go home. Let me show you Exhibit 15. For the record, it's an email from Kathy Beatty dated Monday, November 7, 2016, regarding MK. It's to Audrey Peterson. You recognize this? Mm hmm. Well, I don't recognize, I recognize the people on it, yes. All right, and so who's Audrey Peterson? She was the case manager for the seventh floor. Okay. Okay, and uh, it says, I'll call you later with massive update. Um, describe for me what the massive update was. I have no idea without going back and taking a look at my notes from that day. So I guess I didn't have a chance to talk to Audrey that day, so I emailed her the next day. Said there was no update available as the parents will not consent or decline the placement at Nemours. There is a hearing today and Thursday that will clear up the matter. That's a massive update? Yes, because we were looking at discharge and um, we were looking um, to get Maya on to some kind of physical therapy. Um, so for us, yes, that whenever, we're, whenever there's not going to be a discharge, that's a big update for us. That's massive that it's not going to be a discharge, huh? That's the only thing you guys discussed about Maya Kowalski or her situation. Yeah, because I didn't talk to her on the 7th. That's per her email. Um, but yes, anytime there is a d delay in discharge, <coughs> it's massive for us. Uh -huh. You've got an affidavit on November 2nd, 2016, and then that's uh, exhibit Beatty 16, and then we've got this November 7th email regarding massive update, which is 15. And then we have what I'm going to mark as 17, which is what? Tell me what that is. For the record, it's an email from Kathy Beatty to Megan Leaf at My Florida Families, dated November 9th, 2016. So two days later, then the uh, massive update email. Late in the day. What is uh, exhibit? This is Dr. Diana Young. 
on the ninth day, um, indicating she did another um, affidavit for transfer. All right, this is the second affidavit for transfer? Yes. All right, so let me get this straight. Am I correct that you helped on the first affidavit that said nothing about factitious disorder or conversion or anything like that, right? Yes. And then you do an email, I'm just talking about the timeline here, you do an email uh, to Audrey Peterson, the case manager, where you say, I'll call you with massive update five days later, right? I'm sorry, it'd be three days later. No, no, it'd be five days later. Yes. Okay. And then two days after that, there's an email from you to Megan Leaf forwarding this affidavit of Diane Young, right? This is on the 9th, yes. All right. And you sent this to Diane Young. Why? I didn't send this to Diane Young. I sent this to Megan Leaf. Sorry, you did send it to Megan Leaf. You sent it to Megan Leaf. Why? Because Diane Young um, wanted it sent to the state for, I guess they were having a court hearing. Okay. Then. Or they were, or they were going to get a judge so that we could go ahead and discharge. All right. So is Diana Young a pediatrician? Yes. Is uh, uh, Dr. Dees a pediatrician? Yes. Were they both seeing Maya approximately the uh, same time? Um, they could have been, one of them could have been working for part of the week and then the other one for the other part of the week. Okay, but they were both seeing Maya, obviously. Yes. Both being attending physicians? Yes. And then Dr. Uh, Young here says the uh, problems are bilateral lower extremity atrophy with conversion and factitious disorder. Do you see that there? I do see that. Why the difference between the two pediatricians seeing the same child? I can't answer that for you. This, I wasn't involved. You weren't involved in the second affidavit? No. Nope. Did your massive update have anything to do with the creation of the second affidavit from Diane Young? Uh, no, it would have been about discharge because at that point we were looking to discharge. Uh, let me show you what we'll mark as 18 and ask you to identify it. And for the record, the, the first email is from Kathy Beatty, uh, January 5th, 2017, um, dated, uh, well, sorry, it's uh, JHACH10160 through uh, 163. Ask you to identify that, see if you know this uh, exchange. Yes. And what is this about? Um, so I think this is the, I'm pretty sure this is the day that Maya was going to the courthouse and then going to see um, Dr. Hanna. Um, and we were asked to take pictures. Risk management asked you to take pictures? Um, so I have to go all the way back to the beginning. So. So it was 18? Yes.
So Dr. Danielson notes in her in her email about pictures. Um, I was contacted. Patty wanted to know um, is CVI able to help out? They can't. They're doing their own pictures in Sarasota, um, and then. Um, Um, I, uh, indicate that I think that we should do them here at the hospital. Um, Patty agrees. She suggests that two people are in the room and she has a camera. So who's Patty? Patty Condon is risk management. So risk management made the decision to have these pictures taken of Maya? Yep. And tell me ha what happened. What, what did you do with Maya? Um, the bedside nurse and I went in um, and took pictures of her arms, her legs, her face, and her stomach. Was she in her bra and panties? She was in her sports bra and a pair of shorts. I think we took pictures of her back too. Bra, and she wasn't in panties, she was in what? Her shorts. Who gave you guys permission? I say you guys. Who gave risk management permission to take photographs of this little girl's entire body? So that would be, again, I was directed by risk management to do that. Did you object in any way to this? No, I did not. Had you ever taken pictures of a child uh, without any clothes but uh, bra and shorts? Before? Um, I'm not your own, but I mean in the professional context. In professional context in the, in the um, foster care program, if they were going to visit a situation or when they came back, if there were injuries, yes, we did. But she didn't have any injuries. She'd been with you for over well, for three months at that point, right? Correct. So did anybody give you any reason why they took pictures? I was just directed by um, risk management to do that. Was there any discussion at all of why it was necessary to take pictures of this little girl in her sports bra and shorts? Um, like I said, it, this started with Dr. Danielson and came down to me. Who's Dr. Danielson? Her name... Um, Dr. Danielson was probably the attending that day. Okay, so this wasn't coming from uh, the uh, government. It wasn't coming from DCF, right? This was coming from our from our institution, Dr. Danielson. Right, not from DCF. This was an internal decision to um, ACH. Yes. What steps were taken to call the parents and ask whether you could take pictures of their child like this? Um, we didn't call their child. We didn't call the parents. Why not? Because at the time the child was in the custody of DCF and they gave their permission. How did DCF give permission for you to take pictures of this little girl in her sports bra and shorts? So they were getting ready to do their own pictures. Who was? DCF. They did their own pictures in Sarasota. So why was it necessary for you to do pictures? Um, I can only speak to you to what I was asked to do. They didn't tell you why, they just said do it? Yep, pretty much. Well, pretty much. Yes, the direction was to do the pictures. Was Maya upset? Yes. She did not? want you to take pictures of her like that, did she? She did not. But you went ahead and took pictures of her anyway. Unfortunately, we did.
Was there an issue over scratches that Maya had on her? Yes. So, according to my email, um, there was a concern that Maya was self-mutilating. And my note indicates on Thursday there had been inappropriate conversations with the mother that had been witnessed by staff. Or that was due to um, Charlotte's. Okay. Uh, one last uh, email here, and it's uh, 19, because we're taking it out of order, and it's JHACH 9829 through 9831. Show you that. You recognize that? Yes. Um, okay, and what is this? So this was a letter that Maya wrote on um, or around November 10th and wanted um, the judge to see. So I scanned this in or faxed it to, I'm not sure which, to um, Safe Children's Coalition. Who are they? The community-based care organization that was case managing this. All right. Did anybody uh, give it to her lawyer or uh, some way to get this to the judge? That's why we sent it to um, Tanya Hutchins, who we were asked to send it to so we get to the judge. She says, I am not doing well at all. I'm hurting worse than I was at home. Is she telling the truth there? For the judge, in your view? I can only report what Maya's telling you. And they're, they are not doing a good job with therapy or managing my pain. Is she telling the judge that? Yes, she is so telling. Any of the pain meds they give me don't work at all. Um, had she told you that? No, she didn't really talk about her pain medications too much with me. Okay. Well, they talked to the doctors about it, right? Probably. Someone dropped me the other day. Did that happen? I, did. I don't know. My parents uh, did nothing wrong. They just listened to the right doctors for my meds. And guess what? And guess what? It worked. Okay. And then ever since I got here, I, it's got, I got worse. It's causing me more pain. And I really don't want to go to Orlando for my rehab either. All I want is to go home, be with my family, friends. I never have this problem ever again. Please help me. Love, Maya. Uh, and then she puts a P.S. I had better therapy at home. Now, based on, you read this, right? I did. Okay. Did you ever have any interaction with any of the attorneys uh, advising ACH? Yes. Uh, who'd you have interaction with? Um, Mr. Hunter, but I also had interactions with another man. I don't remember his name. Shapiro. Did, were you party to any conversations? You don't tell me the contents. Uh, party to any conversations where any of the attorneys were involved? Yes. And was uh, risk management involved in those? I think so, yes. Let me show you 21 and ask if you can identify that. So you drafted this letter that's of March, uh, November 29th, 2016? I typed this letter up from Dr. Amin. Okay. Uh, did you participate with Dr. Mer um, Amin in putting together these recommendations? Actually, um, this would have come from the medical team. Um, uh, 
And who was this sent to? I think that we sent this to the case manager. Case manager for whom? For Maya, for the Department of Children and Family Services. It could have gone to Charlotte Laporte. Okay. So this is the letter to the state? Yes. Okay. And in this, uh, there's recommendations including uh, visits with fathers suspended at this time unless supervised by DCF. That was the hospital's recommendations, right? Yes. Please, uh, phone contact with mother limited to one time weekly supervised and mother instructed she can't record phone calls and mother is given same instructions as father do not discuss court case, do not dis talk with Maya about her pain and what pain medication she is or isn't getting, do not talk with Maya about food here at the hospital, do not discuss the supervised visits when uh, they are or aren't taking place. That's in there, right? Yes. Okay. Aren't those exactly the things that DCF turned around and instructed the uh, parents about? I think that prior to this, there had already been an email. I think that came on around the 17th of um, uh, November. Um, Charlotte Laporte had already given um, that information. Then why write this? Why include these? If it, if the, it had already been ordered, why would you do all these recommendations? Uh, you have to, Dr. Amin. You would have to talk with Dr. Amin about that. And you didn't discuss this with Dr. Amin while you were doing it? Dr. Amin gave me um, this document to type up. Did you, What input did you have in this? I don't think I have a lot of input in this at all. Um, Dr. Amin gave me a letter that she wanted sent to the court um, or to the case manager. And again, this is trying to uh, position pieces of this um, to help Maya get to Nemours. You also recommend Maya's phone be removed. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Members of the jury, that concludes the playing of the deposition. Are there any issues we need to address before the jury is excused? I'd like to recall Jack Kowalski for about four questions. Come on up. Here's the jury. You ready for the weekend? No. Oh, looks like there's a question. Oh, yeah. You do need to publish. This is a Had I known there was a question, I wouldn't have said what I just said. <laughs>
Okay, uh, members of the jury, uh, one of your number asked uh, a series of questions, and some of them I'm just going to give a broad response to, and then others um, I'll give you more specific. I want to remind you that, you know, this is, like I like we said at the beginning of this case, this is going to take a couple of months. And so you can't get every single piece of information at the same time. It's just going to take some time to get all the information out. So you're not going to be able to get everything right this moment. Um, I will tell you any exhibits that are admitted into evidence will be available to the jury uh, during your deliberations. Now, with respect to um, some of the specific documents, I'm just going to refer you to my, my generalized statements. There also was a request for a copy, a written copy of the deposition, and unfortunately under our rules, we're not allowed to send back a written copy of the deposition. Um, I think the other one was a request about uh, Mr. Kowalski testifying. I will tell you, not today, but it's my understanding that Mr. Kowalski will testify again before the plaintiffs have rested uh, the plaintiff's case in chief. Uh, and again, I just want to remind you, this is a process that takes time, and, and so please remember that you're still going to be getting uh, more information as we progress during this case. And with that, that's all I'm going to be able to respond to with all those questions, but I appreciate them. Um, I did say, are you ready for the weekend? And the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, the lawyers and I are going to be working this afternoon outside of your presence. And this was planned uh, kind of recently, but uh, instead of having you come back and forth, it's just easier if I let you go. Um, we're going to be back at the normal time on Monday, so I want to be able to bring you through the door at 9 a.m. To, to begin. Right now, we're probably going to be doing probably five days next week, okay? Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation. Receive no information. Please, 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 if someone uh, approaches you about this case, you tell them to stop, walk away, and report it to the court deputies. And again, do not watch any uh, or review any media accounts of this trial. Have a wonderful weekend. Okay, please be seated. Uh, do you want more than an hour, or is an hour enough to get everything? Okay. So if we're back here at 1.30? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I think that would be fine, Your Honor. Then I will see everybody back here at... Oh, oh one last thing. Did you have the... Uh, Time breakdowns for me, or will you tell me when? We'll, we'll tell you when we return, Your Honor. Yes. Okay, I'll see everybody at one thirty. We're we're in recess. All rise.
can see if I can turn the lights back on. Welcome back from lunch, everybody. My understanding is we've got quite a few issues to address. Among them are the issues of the child victim hearsay. And apparently I just, for the yes, there's a TV people, I just did something to your microphone, unfortunately. <laughs> Can you come do whatever you need to do? I'm sorry. We've got exhibits. I know that there are some uh, jury instructions that are wanting to be discussed. So are there other issues that we also have to address? No, no so. And did we figure out the shot clock from today? I think we did. Did we get the shot? Is that it? That's that's for Johnson. Do, oh, sorry. Do you have the breakdown you, from Ms. Eden's testimony? Um, Clay had had it. I talked to him. He said he's got the numbers and he was going to provide them to you for both sides. As soon as we have it, we'll send it to you. It's supposed, it's supposed to be in an email. Okay. So, you know, I what what's the way should we we do it? Should we deal with the exhibits first and then child victim hearsay? We'd like to deal with the child victim hearsay issue first. We have Maya here in case um, there needs to be some testimony from her on these statements. And then we'd like to let her go while we have the rest of the discussion. Madam Clerk, we're on uh, DIN 3433. Plaintiff's motion to admit child abuse hearsay statements pursuant to Florida statute section 90.802 per in 23. So let's start going through this and let me, let me ask some questions first so I can understand. Um, I need to know what the statement or statements are that are hearsay that you intend on seeking its admission. And it seems like the first one would be by Dr. Brewerton. Is that correct? Were statements made by Maya to Dr. Brewerton? Your Honor, I don't believe those are, those are what we're targeting this at. On page three of our motion, we set forth five exhibits. Uh, Mark, ratification, and I can read those to your honor if that's helpful. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't have, or I don't physically have quick access to these exhibits. Sure. So let's okay. let's look at the first one, which is 2364. Yes, your honor. I'm sorry? The screen, I don't believe the screen is on. Well, it says you've got a green light, but let me turn it off and turn it back on. I believe I need to switch it over there. If that, may I? Sure. While they're working on that, I have the time. Do you want the shot clock? What's, and is it agreed to? Um, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, for the first video, it was 37 minutes of defense and 32 minutes for the plaintiff. And then for the second video for Ms. Betty, it was 46 minutes for the plaintiff and 45 minutes for the defense. Okay, so what we'll do is plaintiffs will be 30 and the defense will be 40 and then 45 and 45 which means plaintiffs have an hour and 15 minutes. And the defense had, that's what, uh, 40 and 45. So it's an hour and 25 minutes. So that means uh, the plaintiff's cumulative total is 25 hours, 40 minutes. The defense cumulative total is nine hours, 35 minutes. Any questions on that or are you ready to go? No questions, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'm flipped back to our original way. So if you want to turn on my table, I can get us back because Mr. Cottrell must have configured it a certain way and I'm not going to spend too much time. I've already switched it over. Thank you, sir. There you go. But wasn't that a problem for the other TV folks of running it through your feed? Well, until I can get communication from him, I'm going to just do this now so we don't waste the court's time. Okay. Okay, so... You're showing me uh, two, three, six, four. Okay, how many pages is this? Your Honor, this exhibit is 21 pages. This is a My Special Care journal provided to Maya Kowalski during the time that she was sheltered at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And it is her present recollections at the time um, many of which describe the abuse and neglect that uh, she was suffering at the time. I direct the court's attention, if we could, to 2364-010. I direct the court's attention to number four, blood pressures. Number five, not getting my pain managed well. Number eight, not getting to see my family. Number 11, having visitors getting kicked out. Well, let, let me just stop you here because normally when we talk about child victim hearsay, it is, it's a statement by let's say a, a therapist that would say, you know, the child said X. This is actually the statements of the child directly. So I'm not sure the child victim hearsay analysis applies for Maya's own journal, assuming that that's what this is. It's intended for her parents. Am I, am I missing something on this? I, it, I, I mean, there might be hearsay exceptions that apply for it, but... I'm not sure this is a child victim hearsay question. Well, well if, if we're at on this one, um, it looks to me, again, to be an 8033, as much of our stuff is then existing mental, emotional, physical condition, documenting how she's feeling, what she's feeling, why she's feeling it, and these are being documented at the time. Uh, they are confirmable by the testimony of Maya Kowalski, indicating that that's an indicia of trustworthiness. Uh, they are relevant and material, obviously, to what she knew was happening to her at the time. It was according to a defense request for her to record that, Apparently, although it didn't come out quite like they wanted, 
Uh, this was her supposed to be her journal. What a great time uh, she had, although it had things I did not like while I was in the hospital. So there's, uh, I guess, both sides to it, as all uh, what evidence does. It cuts both ways. Okay. Well, who, who gave this to Miles? Let's just start there. The hospital did at the start of it. And did she, and I know if I need to get testimony, I can, but did she fill this out while she was in the hospital? Yes, sir. And at that time, when it, tell, was it, when did you fill it out during your stay? Well, well before we, I mean, if we're going to have her, I'm going to need to have her under oath and all that good stuff. I, I'm just trying to understand what framework I need to be looking at this at. That, that's the purpose of my questions, not for a factual basis. And, uh, unless my, uh, I need to be corrected on this, but this was given to her at the start of her stay, and it was not directly a chronology, but there are different pages that, as she stayed in the hospital, she filled out about the events, but mostly, from her point of view as a 10-year-old, how she was feeling about things and what her physical condition was and the emotional state she's in. So uh, if the court looks through them, I think you'll see that mo although there are some, like it says, some food she doesn't like, um, but most of them are about her physical condition, what she likes and doesn't like, and her emotional state. Okay. I'm looking back at the statute. Actually, I don't see anything in the statute that would restrict it to only statements made to others. The statute seems to be a little bit more broad than that. That was our conclusion. It, well, it, it's generally you see it with a statement made to Third like on a CPT video or some type of statement to a therapist or a parent or something like that. And uh, okay. al Although we can bring it out, I am fairly certain that this was intended by Maya to document what was going on at the time with the hope that her mom or dad would eventually see it. And I can elicit testimony to that effect. So per perhaps it does seem like now that I'm looking at the statute that it, this could qualify under child victim hearsay, might also qualify under other exceptions as well. So who's from this side of the room going to be talking about? First of all, I, I think I agree with you that, that or your initial take on 23 is that that statute is designed for statements that are made by a child, typically to a police officer or to a therapist or to a neighbor or a family member, and you're calling upon that person to put it in. The reason you're, you're doing that, the reason this was created, was because you have a small child who either may have forgotten or may have been intimidated, or there was some reason why the, the child, while available to testify, that the quality of the testimony was going to be impinged. And so you put on the hearsay because it's actually maybe more reliable than what the child will take from the stand. That's normally in a criminal case. The civil, only civil cases I've ever seen this used before, by the way, are DCF proceedings and Jimmy Rice proceedings. I don't think I've ever seen this in a true civil case. And I have never ever in any of these things seen it when someone is 17 and a half years old and more than willing to get on the stand and provide competent testimony now about these things in the past. So I don't think this fits into Chapter 23 very well. And, and then if we get into state of mind, we can go you know, through the details of this. But that's supposed to be a, a then existing a statement about a, a then existing state of mind, an emotion, or a physical sensation including an intent, a plan, a motive, or design, a mental feeling, pain, or bodily health. And it's got to be something that is relevant to an issue in the case or to be something that explains subsequent conduct, not by any other person other than by Ms. Kowalski. And, and I look at these things, and they really don't seem to fit into that particularly well at all. These are just very generalized stations. She didn't like blood pressure. Okay, she didn't like blood pressure. Is well, let me just 
Let me look at one more thing and then come back. So. I mean, I agree with you, Mr. Alton Burton, that, you, you know, you normally see it, like I, I said, in some type of someone else testifying as to what the child said. Now, I have dealt with child victim hearsay in civil cases before, and I think my last order on in that was like 14 single-space pages dealing with it. Uh, and I also have dealt with it... Uh, you know, on the family law bench several times, right. and of course, right. when I was on the felony bench, way too many times. But um, I've never seen it used for the declarance, like a, a journal. And the statute says um, circumstances by which the statement is reported indicates a lack of trustworthiness. So I guess the question is, does that mean it has to be to someone else or is a statement made that by the declarant, the child declarant into a journal? And I would, and just looking at that, I would seem to think that the statute's broad enough to allow it to also include statements in a journal. So for, for my purposes, I think we can view this under a section 23 analysis if we need to but and the only thing i'd point out is that once you go through section 23 then you got to go back to the rest of the hearsay to make sure it's admissible under another hearsay rule that just allows it to be considered but it doesn't need established that it's not hearsay for another reason so if and mr anderson's pointing out that he thinks that state of mind is is how it fits and so well, and and clearly at this point it's it's Maya Kowalski's state of mind that we're talking Correct. about. Correct. Would fit under. It was her, Maya Kowalski's then existing state of mind and whether it's relevant to some issue in this case. So uh, as it relates to this particular document, before we walk down the Section 23 child victim hearsay. I will look at three state of mind I mean, why, why is this just not uh, admissible under the state of mind hearsay exception? Particularly since Kathy Beattie just but the issue of how she was on, doing at the on, hospital. On an unknown is, date while she's in the hospital. Well, we, says, have narrowed, yeah. we have narrowed the date. Okay. It was given to her apparently on video, our paralegal tells us, during the 48-hour recording is when she was delivered this journal. Okay. Things I did not like while I was in the hospital, not seeing family. Okay. That's a, a statement of fact, that she did not like seeing the family. Does that, did that explain her existing state of mind on the day that she, that she wrote this? Yes. Does it show her emotion or a physical sensation on that day? Is it a statement of an intent, a plan, a motive, a design, mental feeling or pain or bodily health? She's just saying that she didn't, she didn't enjoy the fact that she didn't get to see her family in the hospital. That, if, if that fits that description, practically any opinion about likes and dislikes becomes admissible as a state of mind exception. And that's clearly not what, well, this, what this statute is designed to allow into to evidence. If you're being neglected at the time as a 10-year-old, yes. I, I was just going to make that, that point. I mean, we're talking about a 10-year-old child who uh, is asked what she didn't like. And isn't this the means by which she is expressing those? I mean... Yes, yeah, I, I mean, that should, that I haven't seen like the other that. pages, but is there anything in the other pages that are 
problematic from any side's perspective? I, I haven't gone through every single one of these pages. We, we can cycle through them. Some of them are pretty innocuous, and perhaps the hospital wants to use them. So I'm a, She I doesn't mean, like some foods. And I mean, she also likes some things. So yeah. We're willing painful. to put the whole thing in. I well, just, you know, she can get on the stand and explain all of these things. It's not like she's eight years old and forgot it all. I mean, clearly she could use it to refresh her recollection yeah. without any problems. Correct. Um, can we just cycle through the pages and see, let me see what's in there. Would you like to start at page Just one? start at the beginning. So the point was to express her thoughts and feelings. Okay. The next page, please. Okay. Next, please. Okay. Stepsister. Oh, that's right. Half sister. Next page. Next. <clears throat> and the next. We saw that one. The next page. Next one. Next page. Next page. Next page. And the next page. Okay. So I'm assuming the defense is objecting to the entry of this document. Yes, this hearsay, although if it's gonna if the page they are showing is coming, I'm assuming they're gonna admit the whole journal. Yeah. We're happy to admit the whole journal. But yes, as to the as to the hearsay, yes, sir. It would need to come in with a limiting charge that's being limited for purposes of not the truth of the contents, but to the, the child's state of mind at the time it was prepared. No. That is made clean, clear in the standard jury instruction. And the more Special instructions would give this jury the more chance of inconsistency and confusion. The 
The following well, document is being introduced to prove the state of mind of, of Maya, Maya Kowalski at the time of her stay in the hospital in October, whatever these dates are. It is not being introduced to prove the truth of the factual statements or the accuracy of the opinions contained in, in the document. Well, then we're going to have to do for the time out. Sure. It would seem to me that you can use child victim hearsay substantively without limitation if it comes in. So in my mind, it, it certainly falls under sub three for the next existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. And I think it also could qualify, although technically we'd have to have the hearing that was necessary to admit it. But if it comes in under sub 23, I don't see why I would have to give any type of limiting instruction. I mean, does Professor it, Padovano correct, say otherwise? If, you, if it goes through both hoops and it gets to 23, that's substantive evidence that, that she doesn't yeah. like food. So, it's substantive evidence of the statements of fact in it. That's what it is. So, if we we would probably need to do the hearing as to to that one, because that sounds like they want to use it for substantive evidence. Keep, keep in mind, it needs to be a, a statement of the child victim describing an act of child abuse or neglect. So you have to find that these things are child abuse or neglect because they're not criminal offenses. I think giving her bad food is not child abuse or neglect. It's uh, hospital food. Uh, well, it's not limited to just that. I know. I'm just... And it has to be read in context. So it sounds like we'll have to have a hearing on on that one for whether it would qualify or not. Okay, what's 2365, exhibit 2365, what's that? This is a statement uh, taken down. These are statements of Maya Kowalski taken down by her father, Jack Kowalski, at the time in which she's informing him of different instances of abuse and neglect. I'm sorry, say that one more time. All right, this is a, this is a writing of Mr. Kowalski. So he is recording what <clears throat> Maya Kowalski has relayed to him during one of his limited visits regarding the abuse and neglect by the hospital, and in particular, Kathy Beattie, in the hours and days leading up to his visit. Okay, so this is more of the classic child victim hearsay type statements. Is there any other basis, a uh, hearsay exception that the plaintiffs allege this falls under? Well, here is, it is again, a, a, and a many of ours are, a, a three, uh, 8033. It would also be 8034. Some of these would fall underneath statements made for medical treatment or diagnosis, keeping in mind that she's a 10-year-old child, and she's relaying the, for example, that she's not getting any medication, so she's trying to seek medical treatment. To her parent or guardian to relate. So this is the way she can relate at 10. To relate the medical information through her guardian to the doctor. This, this is a document explaining by her father that she's, she has brought up. She, she brings up these issues without me extracting this from her. He's not purporting that these are actual statements made by her. And then the very first one is hearsay upon hearsay. Kathy informed Maya that her mother, Beata, is getting mental admission. treatment. Yeah, qualifies as admission. Well, clearly... The child victim hearsay would be what Mr. Kowalski testified that Maya Kowalski said. Correct. But this does look like it. That doesn't would put need the document in as, in as compared to his testimony. Yes. Yeah. Can you redact his phone number real quick? He might get a number of text messages. Okay. 
what is what's the next one? The next one is uh, akin to the first, which would be writings by Maya Kowalski while in the hospital describing events of abuse or neglect. Well, excuse me. 2365 had several pages, Your Honor. So there's four relevant pages, 2365. So we should probably show you the rest of that one. Okay. Let me see the rest. And it might be, okay. I think to be accurate, it's not that this document 2365 would come in. It would be Jack Kowalski's statements as to what Maya Kowalski said. He could use this to refresh the, his thoughts, but it's Jack Kowalski's statements as to what Maya said. That would qualify under Section 23. Not, not the document. Not itself. the document. Okay, if the, if the court is saying that if she had made the statements to a therapist or detective, that the written report of that therapist or the progress notes of that therapist would not come in? What, what normally happens is the therapist comes up and testifies, the child victim said X, Y, Z. Understood. So that, that would only apply to page one of that exhibit because that's, those are Jack's uh, present recollections. However, two, three, and four are, again, we're back to Maya's writings. I think this is the one we talked about the other day, referring to this was done at the request of an attorney. It, um, it does say attorney at the top, but there's no evidence that we're aware of that the attorney requested this. This is well. I think I'm going to need testimony as to the balance of these pages. I'm not saying it is or isn't child victim hearsay. I'm just saying I'm going to need testimony on that. Okay, what's the next one? Two three six six and two three six six one looks to be the same document. Yeah, it looks to be redundant. So, so that's the same as 2365? It's 2366 is one of the pages that is part of 2365, so I think we could ignore 2366 and 2367 because they are both part of 2365. Which I believe leaves 2380. 2380, and what, okay, what is 23, can you put up 2380, please? So 2380 is that. Jack Kowal, effectively Jack Kowalski's notes, both handwritten and then his process was to, when he returned home, to type up some of these notes. And it's, again, back to statements made to him and he's recording what Maya has relayed regarding the abuse. Well, report. show me, because the first one looks like a discussion with somebody from DCF. So show me where he's talking about statements that Maya made. Um, for example, in the second paragraph, October 27, 2016, uh, she requested communion. So that'd Mr. Reyes, can you highlight whatever um, Mr. Whitney's talking about. The last sentence says she requested communion. That'd be a statement of Maya Kowalski. Yeah, well, that one I think is going to have more difficulty falling under child victim hearsay because um, Mr. Alton Burns right. There still has to be, for child victim hearsay, it still has to be grounded in some type of wrong that, okay. that is more criminal in nature. Understood. Let's turn to 2380, page 8. And this is the, the last part there, Friday, January 6, 2017. It describes the improper photography session by Catherine Beatty as relayed from Maya to Jack. 
happens. Well, again, um, this one would, if it met the reliability test, um, the content of the conversation between Maya or Maya's statements to dad potentially could fall under uh, child victim hearsay, and especially since this one actually involves a battery, an alleged battery, I, I think this one is could be. So we would need testimony under child victim hearsay. Mr. Altenberg, any contrary thoughts? And my only confusion, too, is that it's dated Friday, day, January 6th, but the last part is upon her return to All Children's Hospital, Catherine instructed her to remove her clothing and take photos again, which he, she could not have told him that on January 6th. I don't she know absolutely that. could have. She went to court. The, the, and these are back. things you can bring out on cross-examination. I, you know, I still have to find trustworthiness and all, right. that, all those other things. It's just, I, I think this one is something that we could have here. So it seems like we're going to need a hearing on number one, number two, and number five. I'm sorry, when you say number one, you're talking about 23. On page three of the motion. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the motion. For me. I'm so, yeah, it looks like trial exhibit 2364, 2365, and then 2380. Now, as it relates to those last two, it's not to put in the actual exhibit. It would be to allow Jack Kowalski to testify as to what Maya said. Understood. Now, um, and, and thinking about number one more, it, it, it does, I'm, I'm, I'm more confident now, just kind of thinking about it a little bit more, that there can be some sort of journal entry that would qualify as a child victim here, say, so long as you can show the other components of the statute. So, do we want to go ahead and have uh, your witnesses? Is, is Jack Kowalski here? I'm just oh, him. you were blocking him. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and have the child victim hearsay hearing and call whatever witnesses you want or need. I do. Your Honor, just to save time on the, on the, the journal, so long as the whole thing goes in, at the same time, we'll, we'll just agree to let the whole thing We don't want segments. Well, I think that's what Mr. Whitney said is the whole, they were fine putting the whole thing in. So at this point, are we, Mr. Whitney, I think this is what Mr. Altenburn, I think, is saying is they're okay with the entirety of 2364 coming in, which is number one on your list. Great. Okay, so the court will receive 2364. That's a completed issue, and now we don't need to worry about that. Jack Kowalski. I approach, uh, may I approach with 2365 as 001, Your Honor? Sure. Can we just, can we publish it? Is this put it out on the screen? Oh. Can you want me to turn it? I could. Get yes, and, and actually put it back down on the ground. Sure. But let's not make it on the cord. Okay. Does it go on? Well, oh, yeah, right there. there you go. Awesome. Well, you still have another cord under it. Okay. I just switched it, so you tell me if it's fixed. I will let you know. I'm breaking technology left and right, aren't I? You're doing great. You can put it back way well. I told you I'm not a TV director. Uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, you're, you may proceed, and Mr. Whitney wanted the... Exhibit 2365, what page, what number one was it, Mr. Whitney, that you wanted that? One, yeah. Page number 2365, one. May I please call her? Yes. Please state your name for the record. Jack Kowalski. Where do you live? I live in Venice, Florida. Are you the father of Maya Kowalski? Yes, I am. During the time of her stay 
at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital between October 7th, 2016 and January, I think, 13th or 14th of 2017. Did you vi visit your daughter frequently? Yes, I did. And during those discussions, did your daughter relate to you certain unsettling or troublesome issues regarding the way she was being taken care of? Yes, she did. And did you then, at or near the time, record these in a note for future reference and memory and to point out the different abuse and threatened abuse against your daughter? Yes, I did. I documented every time I went for a visit. And is this trial exhibit 2365-001, was this completed at or near the time of a visit? Yes. Do you recall approximately when? I usually jotted it down on a piece of paper and then I would type it when I got home. So this is the type referral of it? That's correct. And in this, did uh, your daughter state, among other things, that she was scared to talk to the judge in court because she was worried about... Just, Mr. Anderson, yeah. uh, I'm going to want him to testify as to what she said. I don't want leading as to what she said. I think right. I, I cannot have leading on this one. I understand. What did she tell you at the time that she recorded this? Well, uh, any time there was, she felt there was a problem, she would uh, tell me or write it down on a piece of paper. And was she coerced in any way or was this voluntary? No, that was all uh, voluntary. And this is offered? Was this offered? I, what was the word I was looking for? Sorry. Uh, this, was this volunteered? She initiated it and gave it to me. She wanted me to know. And can you relate what she related to you as best you recorded it uh, using this to tell us? Yes. In uh, terms of, and, and I know there's a lot there, but in terms of abuse, neglect. How she would tell me or, I'm Just sorry. What she would tell you. Uh, she then, would tell me, you know, if there was a problem uh, how she's being treated, things like that. Uh, and then also she would write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me also. What were the types of abuse that she told you about on the visit that resulted in this recording? Okay, Doug, I could read a couple here just to give you an idea. Sure. Um, well, well, I need you to tell me what she told you. Tell us verbally what she told you that prompted you to go she, home. She was stating that she was having issues within the hospital that she didn't uh, agree with, that she felt that they're not doing appropriate things. And can you describe more the inappropriate things that she was doing that caused you concern that your daughter was being abused or neglected? Uh, yes, there was incidents where the social worker was um, hugging her, kissing her, um, making faces while mom was on the phone with uh, Maya, uh, the supervised phone calls. She would uh, make expressions, things like that. Uh, the social worker, she told Maya that... Uh, um, mom's in in the hospital getting mental treatment. Um, there was uh, a doctor, I believe it was Elliot, uh, stated that mom was putting or put Maya in comas every week at home. Uh, just and it was just on and on. I mean, just what if anything did Maya tell you about uh, her need for medication and what doctors informed her concerning that need for medication? Can't have leading at this point. What, what if anything, did Maya relate about her need for medication? Well, there was an incident that I could remember. The, the the doctor said it was all in Maya's head. She that she didn't need medication. Um, it's hard to remember all these. And what if anything, did Maya tell you about her need? In, in, she in was in pain. About her need oh, for medication. She was in pain. She needed medication. <laughs> Move to admit. Brief cross examination. 
Yes, and then I'll probably have questions. So go ahead. Well, if, the, if your honor has questions first, you're welcome to. I didn't mean to cut the honor off. No, no, I'll, I'll wait till after you're done because if you cover what I'm going to ask, then it's better for you to do it. Good afternoon. Um, that you had testified a moment ago about having a visit. What date was that visit, sir? Uh, I would have to look at the document. I I don't know the exact date now. Okay. Um, the description you had of Maya telling you that someone was hugging or kissing her, do you remember um, what date that was? You know, I have a journal that I wrote in and that was my all my notes were turned into my attorney and I believe you have a copy as well and that does have the dates of all those incidents the um, discussion of people making faces at Maya do you know at what point in the hospitalization that was uh, it's within my notes I do not know the date top of my head um, the discussion of the doctor uh, Disputing whether Maya has pain. Do you know what doctor that was? Uh, no, I do not on that. And what's marked here for the court as PLT 034197, would it be true that you do not have an approximation as to when you generated those notes? Uh, not at this time, I do not, no. But uh, like I said, you could find all the dates within that uh, journal that I made up. You will find all the dates. I appreciate your time, sir. Thank mm -hmm. you. Did you bring that journal with you, by I do have mine, yes. May we approach it's it? It's in my May bag. Refresh his recollection. If it refreshes his recollection, that's fine. Now, before you show it to him, you've got to show the defense. This has been previously produced on numerous occasions and used. Let's at least show it to the defense. Which no, these are he's not his. His. Some are his, some are not his. I'm going to have him turn to those that are either typed or in his handwriting. Respectfully, I saw and seen a note that you played. There's a book of several hundred pages. Most of those are not his writing. He has testified previously that he took. I just I have to interject because I was leading on this issue. What we're talking about at this moment is refreshing the recollection. And that's all we're talking about. And pretty much he can look at anything if it's going to help him refresh his recollection. Now, certainly you can look at whatever you're going to, whatever's being shown to him. And then you'll be able to ask him questions about it. But Perhaps if that's his journal or, or something he has compiled, perhaps it's best for him to figure out where in there we're talking about. Right. I'm very well aware of the broad broadness of refreshing witness recollection. What was handed to me looks like about a 400-page notebook, of which I'm skimming up. None of it is his writing. Well, here's, here's his writing, so that's inaccurate. Well, you, and we, that's why we said we were going to have him identify it. All we're trying to do is right now figure out the date. Mr. Kowalski says it's in his journal. So let's show him his journal and let Mr. Kowalski figure out what we're talking about as far as the dates. And then we can show everybody the specific page or pages. Let's see him before he the precious recollection. And you're representing the court that that's his handwriting? I am about to, if I can ask the, the witness. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes, but let him figure out. All, all we're doing is giving it to him. You don't need to ask any questions. Let him figure it out. Thank you. That's, that's my hand, right? The, the issue is you said that you needed your, your journal to yes, sir. remind yourself of the dates. So... Let's figure that out first. It's going to take a while, just so you know. So, sorry. I have 
a suggestion since the other two will likely require the same thing. May we have the witness uh, go through them and, and we can then move on to two or three other matters in the interest of time or you want me to wait? I want to address this issue first. Yes, sir. Given the statements made within time there, out, time out, time out. No questions. Let him figure out the issue of the date. Okay. Um, I didn't really look at this list. Do you want me to compare it to the, or just come up with some of them? I mean. You, you said that you needed to look at this journal to tell, to remind you of the dates that Maya told you the statements that we, sure. uh, that you just told okay, us I, about. Okay, I got some handwritten notes from her. I'll go to that, I'm sorry. Reyes can tell you the issue that's going on. A lot of pages. Port IT to the rescue. Okay, I found her notes. There's no dates on them, so I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back and keep looking and see when those were from.
I don't know exactly what's on here, but uh, I mean, I, okay, here on uh, Here, Friday, December 2nd, 2016, uh, PLT 035171. While Friday, December what? I believe it was December 2nd, Your Honor. Let me check. Yes, 2016. Whatever page you have that refreshes your recollection, why don't you just show Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Anderson that... This is one of them. Uh, I'm sure there's more. Come on down, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you, sir. You want me to keep looking for more? Or? I think for now, no. Let's okay. just keep going, Mr. Anderson. Have you had your m memory refreshed as to a day? Strike it. Did Maya keep reminding you through the course of your. How often would Maya remind you once an incident happened? How often? That one. Uh, she would state several times on certain you know, uh, occurrences or episodes. Uh, in reference to her phone and things like that. And so, uh, have you determined a date when the majority, if not all, of these and the submitted exhibit were related to you? I don't, uh, I'm sure it was various dates, but I do not recall the date on this, uh, this piece of paper here. What if anything happened on Friday the 2nd in 2016? There was incidents on that. And did you record that at the time? Um, no, not on those. How do you know that there were any of these taken down, these notes taken down as of uh, Friday the 2nd of 2016, the date you had previously given us? This was in my journal. You know, I just documented. I had a problem from the first visit. We drove up there and we were denied, and that was an hour to travel up there. We were denied, and I, I didn't want to cause problems, so I just kind of like bit my tongue and went home. And I figured by documenting, that's how I started documenting everything. All right, so in terms of what's written on the exhibit and your handwritten notes, can you identify for the court whether those notes were transcribed, not doesn't mean to be all, but those notes were transcribed on Friday the 2nd, 2016. Yes, Not that, you know. yes, that is correct. Whatever date it was documented, that's the date it happened, yes. And it was your routine practice to yeah, transcribe? to the leading. Sustained. What was your practice regarding these notes to make them clearer and more legible? Uh, I... There's times I wrote it on a little piece of paper. Uh, as you could probably see on the first page, that's when it first started. They were just tiny little, could I hold it up or no? If you want to. Okay, just tiny little pieces of paper. So it, and by just scribbling on there, it's hard to read and probably later on I wouldn't be able to read it. So I, I would type it out and then date it. And did this, uh, were you, did this become your practice as time went on with these notes? All the time, yes. And was it, uh, did it become a routine for you? Each and every visit. Questions, Your Honor? Mr. Shapiro probably has questions. If, if I understand your testimony, sir, the document that we've been provided seems like a compendium of different things that you've retyped from various aspects of your notes over time, true? True. Okay, and just to be clear, the exact date that of the exhibit 2365001, when that was prepared in fairness, you don't know the date that that was prepared, true? That uh, most likely is true, yes. Okay. That's all, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. 
Now, let, let me ask you a series of questions. So, what I wrote down as far as the statements that you are relaying to us that Maya told you, and this is in regards to 2365 and 2365 only, was one, that a social worker uh, hugged and kissed Maya and made faces when Maya was on the phone. The second statement would be that the social worker told Maya that Maya's mom is in the hospital getting mental treatment. The third statement that Maya told you is that Dr. Elliot told Maya that her mom was putting Maya in a uh, coma each week. And then the fourth one, and, and my notes are a little unclear, so correct me if I'm wrong, is that I think, I think you said Dr. Elliot said something to Maya that all of these items are in Maya's head. I believe it was Dr. Elliot. I could be wrong on that. I could go through my notes and find it. Then. Well, but yes, I, I made these notes after her okay. tell. And the December 2nd date of 2016, is that the date when Maya told you these four statements or were these four statements told to you at other times? Those would be the day that I was notified. Well, you're saying passive voice. When did Maya tell you? On that date of visit. And tell me about that date of visit. What was going on? Who was present? Uh, paint me a picture, if you will. Um, Maya liked going out of the room as much as possible because she was in there all day, confined to that. A lot of times we would go down to the lobby. She would play piano, go to the rec center when she was uh, physically able or you know had the strength. Uh, sometimes just going in the hallway or just going to get some food down in the cafeteria, she would bring things up. And was there any supervision of your visits on this December 2nd date? I honestly couldn't tell you uh, from the top of my head. Do you have any recollection as to, besides you and Maya, if anyone else when I say was there, was within earshot of your discussions with Maya? No. No, there wasn't, or no, you don't remember? No, there wasn't. I believe there wasn't. And Maya was 10 at this time? I believe or so. just about ready to turn 11? Uh, December 10th is her birthday, so... So she was almost 11. Yes, sir. And, Your Honor, this, all these notes were produced to uh, Deborah Salisbury uh, when that all took place. That's fine. I'm, right now I'm just trying to okay. get at what you remember. Okay. Is there anything else, and I'm going to turn it over to the lawyers for additional information from this witness about this issue and then we're going to move on to the next one which is uh, 2380. Uh, I think it would help I knew what the uh, issue, which issue the court would like me to pursue. Well, right now we're talking about the statements that Maya allegedly made to, to Jack Kowalski that are encapsulated in your exhibit 2365. What, if anything, did Maya tell you about Kathy Beattie? Uh, number one, she did not like her. What else? Tell us everything you can remember that Maya told you on this date about how Kathy Beattie treated her. Well, like I said, there's times she made smirks um, in front of Maya during the phone conversation. She stated that she placed her on her lap. Um, I never gave consent, by the way, on that. Um, um, she stated that she used to come in, slap her leg, to see if she was in pain. Um, she said that she wanted to adopt her, uh, that her mother was in a mental home, uh, so she could be like her mother while she's in the hospital. Um, uh, there was a time that Maya was on her school computer. She said 
you're probably searching uh, sex web websites. She's a 10-year-old girl. Uh, they don't think they would know how to go on there. Um, I know Maya was upset about the dress, you know, missing, and that ended up being Kathy's office. Um, what, if anything, did Maya tell you about? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, then we had the pictures. Um, Maya told me that if she didn't get the pictures, she was unable to go to court, according to Kathy Beatty. Um, what else did Maya tell you that Beatty she said about going to court? She, she was wanted? scared. Um, you know, if she challenged Kathy, she was scared that she would not be able to go to court. What, if anything, did Maya tell you about the hospital and what she did not like about it in this, con in this conversation, as you recall? Well, she, number one, she didn't get her treatment. She was distant from her family, and it was difficult to communicate with her family, including going through her lawyer. You know, there was, it sounded like there was, you know, she was scared. Um, it was just, and she wasn't getting the proper treatment, so. Anything did Maya tell you about attempts to stand her up out of the wheelchair? What did Maya say to Kathy? No, or this something? is in general. Well, number one, she couldn't stand up. There was a time, uh, one of those third I'm part. I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson. I need the statements that you are trying to admit. Under right. the child victim hearsay that Maya made to Jack Kowalski. That's what I need to focus on. I understand. What, if, if anything, would the nurse do when the phone rang insofar as observation of Maya? Number one, the phone was move far away from her bed, um, it would ring. And, uh, Mr. Anderson, maybe you we're not communicating. This is statements that Maya made to Mr. Kowalski. I need right. to know the specific statements that Maya said to Mr. Kowalski and the circumstances surrounding those statements. What did Maya tell you? And what was the context regarding the way the nurses responded to the phone ring? Sustained on the leading. What, if anything, happened on this date insofar as Maya relating to you an incident with... The phone? What did Maya say about the phone? It's, it's still I apologize. It's still leading. That's it. I, I agree. What? Yes, that was a leading. What else did Maya tell you that day? There was a time uh, she reported the phone did not work. Um, I did take that to the attention to uh, one of the nurses, and it, like after a day, I believe it was it was fixed. But a lot of times, the phone was far away from the bed. I think that's all that covers it, Your Honor. Since you're up, and so we are not doing it, is there anything else that you want to address with respect to Trial Exhibit 2380, which is number five on the motion?
final series of questions. Uh, where were you when these statements were made by your daughter to you? Within the hospital, uh, like I said, it could have been in a room, it could have been down a rec center or a cafeteria, things like that. Uh, and Your Honor, were you referencing, should I uh, then ask about the other exhibits as well? Or? Yes, let's just finish it out so that we can try to bring some uh, to this. Uh, may I approach, Your Honor? You or, or actually, we can put a. This is trial exhibit 2380-008. Now, what date were these notes made? Uh, here, um, I see Friday, January 6th, 2017. Look above it, and from what Maya told you, is it true for that part of the memo as well? No, that would probably be another date up above. Can you tell us approximately? Can you um, tell us what date? Could I look here real quick? Absolutely. It's probably okay. Friday, January. Don't, don't worry about the okay. time on that one. Okay. On the one on Friday, January 6, 2017, where were you when you, did you take, did Maya tell you anything about abuse in that visit? First question is, did she? She, she did report it to me. And so let me ask you then, were her statements voluntary? It was voluntary on her side, yes. How soon after did you transcribe these into 2380-008? I usually did it right away. Within 24 hours? or Yes. Well. And what did Maya tell you on that day regarding any abuse towards her? Um, I'm trying to find out how I, um, this might have been, I could be wrong, but maybe my brother is the one, the, that transporter, he reported it. I, I could be wrong, but I forgot how this information. Did, did Maya tell you this directly? Uh, not on that day, I was unable to talk to her. Withdraw. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was the day of the court, correct? May I uh, approach as to exhibit the last one, 2380-013. That's it, 2380-013. Actually, you can see it there. Yes. Okay. Yes, these are what I was talking about earlier. When, to the best of your knowledge, did Maya tell you about this? And if it's multiple dates, fine. What's the base number on this? 2380 013. Bates. Bates number is plaintiff's. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I don't know the date, but uh, it is, I know it is in this booklet, the dates. Go ahead. If you can okay. find the date, we need the date. Okay. The best you can do, judging from what's being said.
as you're checking there, Mr. Kowalski. Yes. I noticed there are some repeats here. What if any of these were again told to you on the Friday, second, 2016 date? The Friday what? I'm sorry. The Friday the second, 2016 date that you just testified to as to many of these. Twenty sixteen, say you stated. What's on the screen? Oh. I'm not seeing the the date on there. I understand. Okay. We're trying to establish it. Yeah. So, were any of these because you've already testified to many of them on Friday the second, twenty sixteen? Did Maya tell you one or more of these? What did Maya tell you? A lot of these were earlier than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have the uh, scared to talk with the judge? Uh, the okay. What else? I believe the uh, computer incident was earlier than that. And it's not so much when they occurred, it's when Maya told you about them. Did she relate these? Oh, it was before that, okay. before that Friday. Can you find us the date before the yes. Friday, December 2nd? She made little handwritten notes, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm sorry. There's a lot of pages. Is there any way you can tell us just when the visit before this occurred? Before, I'm sorry. Before you took down. Hold on a second, Mr. This, well, before this one. Mr. Anderson, hold on a second. I, I, I understand the importance of this issue, but respectfully, it appears we're at the point where he's trying to refresh. Where the statements came from that appear to be coming from Maya's notes that he took them took from Maya's notes and then recorded in a summary later on data. I don't know how this that, might be exercised. That seems to be an argument. Okay. I apologize. Circumstances and trustworthiness and all that good stuff. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Kowalski. So yes. Let's sir. just stick with Friday, December second, twenty sixteen. Okay. If you look at trial exhibit two three eight zero dash zero one three. What, if anything, did Maya tell you that was transcribed? What did she tell you in the way of abuse that was transcribed into a document? This one. Um, Maya stated that Catherine had brought her to the chapel, placed Maya on her lap, and I said, I know I'm not your mom, but I will. I mentioned this earlier. I, I mentioned this earlier without reading it. Yeah. Just tell us what you remember she said. Oh, I, I remember Maya very upset that Kathy Beattie put her on her lap. Um, I remember her saying that her mom's in a mental home getting treatment or in a hospital getting mental treatment. Kathy Beattie placed her on her lap, kissed her, uh, stroking her hair and uh, said that she could be her mom and then that she wanted to adopt her. And did Maya state these directly to you or did you just simply take a note? No, she, st she, she told me about it. And the problem with that is if I lose my temper in there, I'm going to lose my privileges. So and I had to keep my cool and it was very difficult to do so. And again, would you would Ma, strike it. Would Maya repeat to you incidents that had happened earlier in this 
Friday, December 2nd, 2016. Date, visit. Yes. Anything else you can remember her stating that might fall within 2380-013? And then just tell us what she said. I mentioned about the computer. All right. Yeah, just, just, yeah, just take it in. All right. Yeah, I, right on top of my head. I, All right. I, sorry. Substantially the same as what you've already told the judge she told you. Yes. Your witness. And again, was this voluntary? Yes, it was. And was it your routine? to transcribe these at or near the time? Yes. Mr. Shapiro, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Your Honor, I would just like to point out in the legal analysis. Can, can, can I ask a couple questions first? Just, Absolutely. I want to finish the testimony and then we can talk about it. So, I guess the additional statements that I, my, I wrote down in my notes that you contend Maya told you, was it Maya told you that, was it Catherine Beatty told her that her mom was getting mental treatment? That is correct, Your Honor. And it was Catherine Beatty, Maya said it was Catherine Beatty uh, that told Maya that she, being Kathy Beatty, wanted to adopt her, meaning Maya? That is correct. And Maya told you that? Yes, sir. And did Maya also tell you that it was Catherine Beatty that questioned her and made the statement about this, um, using the computer and, and are you on like a sex website or something? Yes, like Your Honor. Yes, that's true. And you also said that Maya said, and I just want to make sure that Maya told this to you as opposed to someone else. Like, she, did she Maya told, tell you that Maya was scared of challenging Kathy Beatty? Yes. She, when when um, did she tell you that? Uh, I don't know the date, sir, but she was very scared of her. She did not like her. And how about the statements about not being able to come to court if she didn't um, comply with Miss Beatty's statements? Was she, that to, to you? Uh, she did say that to me in time. I, I don't know now, when. When you say in time, was that? Well, it wasn't on that date. It doesn't matter okay. if it was on that date, but tell me. To the best of your memory, stand, sitting here right now, when she told you that, and tell me the circumstances of those discussions. Yeah, I honestly uh, could not tell you the date or approximate date. Try a but, month, uh, Jack. Oh, sorry. She did. Uh, she brought that up many times. And has Maya told you about the photographing issues? She did. Tell, tell me the first time, if there were more than one, tell me the, the first time Maya told you. I know it was when she was still in the hospital. Uh, that would have been after that date. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but we uh, were informed of it. Um, I, I Don't say we were informed. Tell me what Maya told you. Maya told me that she... Was uh, she was held down by an individual, and Kathy Beatty said, "You have to. We have to take these pictures before you go with your uncle, Uncle Scotty." 
Uh, that's the brother that transported her from uh, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital to the courthouse in Sarasota. Um, Maya stated that she did not want her to do it, and she basically said, "You have, if you want to go to court, you have to let us do this. Uh, Maya said it, it was very disturbing. And the time, the first time that Maya told you this, who else was present? I honestly don't know. Usually it was myself visiting or with Kyle, but it, I don't believe Kyle heard that. And was this before or after your wife um, died? That would have been before. We... Uh, uh, I'm sorry. It might not have been before. If, if this was on the 6th. Uh, you know what? It could have been. It could have been. Defense, any further questions? N no, um, I would just point out to the, the answer is no. Okay. Um, any further questions for this witness? Just, just one. Jack, that last question from the court was perhaps a bit vague to you. Um, the photographing incident, was that before or after the Yada passed away? Well, that's why I was trying to think that she... The court date was on the 6th. Um, I'm trying to think if I visited her on the 7th. That's what I'm trying to figure out, if I visited Maya on the 7th. Well, I could look real That's quick okay. if you don't mind. But uh, it may have been after. I honestly don't know offhand right now. Um, was the photo... So you don't know as you sit here whether or not the, the Maya's direct report to you... I believe it was after. After... We say after after Beata's. Passed. I believe so, that, because I I would have to look, but that it but, sounds about right. But I heard you earlier say. But, Object to the leading, Your Honor. Uh, just go ahead and answer. What was ask the question? But it was reported to you while Maya was still in the hospital. Oh, that, yes, 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 so it was. Is it your testimony then that that would have been reported to you sometime between January seventh and the thirteenth? Yes. Anything further? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, Mr. Kowalski, you can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you have any other witnesses that you wanted to call with respect to the child victim hearsay aspect? We have Mike Kowalski, Your Honor. Yeah, and, and you can have a seat. Now, to be clear, what we're talking about right now is child victim hearsay. It's not... I mean, Maya's most likely going to be able to testify to all of this before the jury. It's just whether we get the the testimony of someone else as to what Maya told that person. No, Your Honor, the only person would be Kyle, and he was very young at the time. So are, are you going to want to call Maya Kowalski now? Or are okay. you... I think we're okay based on what her knowledge would be at that time outside of what she would testify to. Okay. Arguments now. And so, I don't know. Do you want plaintiffs? Do you want to go first? Sure. Since you're the proponent here? Yeah. We have numerous indicia of trustworthiness. Go ahead. Your Honor, uh, with respect to Jack Kowalski's testimony and credibility, um, he has provided several affidavits, declarations in this case, deposition testimony, Never has his credibility been questioned. Under questioning here on these particular documents, um, he was able to refresh his recollection based on his contemporaneous notes. Uh, I want to point out that with respect to 2380008, which related specifically to the incident of the photography, um, he, for, he, was, he was honest and credible in that testimony because... He testified that on the first instance, this was told first to his brother, 
He was honest about that. <clears throat> then, when asked a few questions by the court, he testified specifically that he was told in the hospital within a week time span. If you look at 238008, there are details that he provided in his testimony that are not within the paragraph of Friday, January 6, 2017. Specifically, Mr. Kowalski testified that Mike Kowalski was held down by an individual while Kathy Beatty photographed her. That detail of a nurse holding her down separate and apart from Catherine Beatty's efforts to photograph her is not included in what was used to refresh his recollection. So that's an additional indicia that he was uh, remembering details when prodded that were related to him directly by Mount Kowalski. So we would ask that the, the documents uh, be admitted or used to refresh recollection under the child abuse hearsay exception. Let's have it admitted first. Your Honor, for, for, for clarity, we're only discussing whether or not it's going to be used to refresh recollection. Is that where we are at this point? No, no, we're, we're, we're talking about the statements that Maya Kowalski told to Jack Kowalski right. under the child victim hearsay generally or statute. That's generally what we're, we're, we're talking about for, at this for, moment. For their introduction or for their use to, to refresh his recollection. That's what I'm trying to figure for, out. For substantive evidence. For substantive evidence. Okay. And so, first of all, you need to understand that this is a two-step analysis you're in right now because this is not a case where there is a cause of action or a claim for child abuse. And so you have to find that a statement was a statement describing an act of child abuse and that that statement is then relevant to an issue in either the battery or maybe the false, the false imprisonment, possibly the medical malpractice or intentional infliction of emotional distress. And while using the photographs is probably their easiest example, is that that does relate to one of their alleged counts of, of intentional restraint and battery. And so those at least cover part of that issue. But many of these things that they're talking about, that Kathy Beatty um, told her, that first of all, is that she was afraid of Kathy Beatty and didn't like her. That's just not a statement of child abuse. That the, um, she wanted to take her computer away, apparently because she was worried about use on improper websites. Again, I don't believe that's an act of child abuse. Uh, the, there are several other statements that they've gone through here that if you look at them and say, is this an act of child abuse? It may be something the child doesn't like. It may be something that's discourteous, but it rising to the level of something that's admissible because it is a statement of child abuse. Many of the things that you've just heard there did not fit into that category. So if you're going to enter an order, in addition to going through the, the, the requirements of the statute under subsection 23 to make it admissible, you have to find that it, if it is an act of child abuse and that it would be relevant to an issue in this case. And I believe that there's a very limited scope of these that might possibly be used in that fashion. Okay. Well, just I, I think I understand where, where you're going, um, Mr. Altenburn. Did, did this side want to say something else? Very briefly, Your Honor, just to, to add on to my colleague's um, argument on the law, in terms of the factual declaration given by Mr. Kowalski, he was quite honest with this court that he does not know when these notes were prepared. He was asked that multiple times. He does not know where many, when many of the statements were made to him in terms of dates, in terms of where he was. He is not able to identify in some of the statements what nurse uh, made a statement or what doctor made a statement. So it goes to you know, the reliableness and the veracity in order to be able to uh, analyze whether the statement could come in as a hearsay exception as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I think Mr. Kowalski testified credibly that the statements with the exception of the photography 
were given to him, made to him by Michael Kowalski uh, on December 2nd or perhaps within the 12 hours, 24 hours preceding that because he had a process and routine of taking her statements and recording them contemporaneously. The fact that Maya related several incidents to Jack Kowalski that may have occur occurred on various dates on a singular date does not make them uh, fall outside the statute. With respect to the legal argument about findings of child abuse or neglect, I would point out that 803.23 not only includes child abuse, but also includes child neglect or sexual abuse or an awful, unlawful sex offense honor in the presence of the child. Uh, child neglect under the statute is a caregiver's failure. Are you or, talking about 827.03? I am, Your Honor. That was going to be my next question to, to both is since these were not, these terms were not defined in 90.803 paren 23 paren 8, do we look to, in this case, 827.03 for the definition or is the definition in 90.803 print 23, print A, something else? I, from the defense side. Well, well I, I, that was just a, I'm going to want to hear, but Mr. Whitney yeah, is. As, as an undefined, undefined in the statute, when I say the statute, 803.23, we would look to 827.03. There's both a definition of child abuse. I, I'm going to focus for a moment on neglect of a child, which is a caregiver's failure or admission to provide a child with the care, supervision, and services ne necessary to maintain the child's physical and mental health, including but not limited to food, which the defense is focused on, nutrition, clothing, shelter, supervision, medicine. There was a specific statement that Mr. Kowalski was told by Maya regarding the provision of medicine, and, and it goes on. It's also a caregiver's failure to make a reasonable effort to protect the child from abuse, neglect, or exploitation by another person. And so in this instance, she was sheltered at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And Catherine Beattie was the perpetrator. But as we heard this morning, there was a disciplinary record. She had anger management issues. She was not removed. She was not taken off of Maya's case. And so this was allowed by the hospital. So the, the statements that may fall outside of abuse certainly fall within the neglect in the statute 82703. And for that reason, fall underneath. 80323. Anything further? The, the, the legislative intent could not possibly have envisioned the statute be construed so broadly that it's going to encompass a caregiver providing care to any medical malpractice action should be construed this way. Any medical malpractice action involving a minor it's merely because the plaintiff alleges a failure to provide medical care that would not, the legislature could not possibly have envisioned this child neglect and abuse hearsay exception to encompass any time there's a medical care or an alleged failure to give medical care in a hospital. I, I don't believe the legislator intended this that broadly. Thank you. Court and, and Madam Court Reporter, you might want to mark this as the beginning of a ruling. I don't know if anyone's going to want it transcribed, but let's just mark it here. Uh, before the court is the child victim hearsay motion filed by the plaintiff at DIN 2433. And in this particular motion, we are talking about various statements that Maya Kowalski made to Jack Kowalski in particular. Uh, the child victim hearsay statute obviously is 90.803 paren 23. 
And that statute in A1 and A2 established specific requirements to permit hearsay statements of a declarant child victim who is 16 years or younger to be admitted into evidence in a civil proceeding. Um, the requirements of both of these subsections must be present uh, because they are connected by the term and. Even if the uh, both requirements are met, the child victim hearsay is not admissible unless the source of information or the method of circumstances by which the statement is reported indicates a lack of trustworthiness. And I'll go ahead and go through this uh, together. And I'm going to assume for the sake of argument that Maya Kowalski will be, try or will be testifying at trial. That's been told to me that that is going to happen. So uh, under... 23 paren A to A, the child has to testify. And so I'm going to an, do my analysis, assuming that Maya will be testifying at trial. Um, section 90.803.23 A1 provides in relevant part that the court may consider the mental and physical age and maturity of the child, the nature and duration of the abuse or offense, the relationship of the child to the offender, the reliability of the assertion, and the reliability of the child victim, and any other factor uh, deemed appropriate. And the Seminole case, and that's not S-E-M-I-N-O-L-E, -E, it's the other spelling of Seminole, is State versus Townsend, 635 Southern 2nd, 942, uh, print, or Pinpoint site 957 to 58. It's a 1994 case from the Florida Supreme Court. And it is widely viewed um, as kind of setting the procedure, um, the multiple step procedure that we have to follow. Here, uh, the court conducted a uh, uh, a hearing outside the presence of the jury and heard the testimony of Mr. Jack Kowalski. Now, I, I will pause and say, you know, certainly we've already been through, I'm going to say half the trial at this point, approximately half of the trial. So um, generally these hearings happen prior to the start of trial, but we are at where we're at. Um, I tend to agree that the statute 23 per A, I've got to find some sort of qualifying, and I'm going to just use as a shorthand, child abuse or, or neglect, but the statute is much lengthier than that. Now, I don't think it necessarily is as narrowly tailored that it must be a criminal uh, action but I do think there, it has to be tied uh, most likely to Section 827.03 uh, and otherwise referenced in the plea. When I say reference, as, I mean falls to a count that is in our operative pleading. Here there are a number of statements that were made some of them were made on Friday, December 2nd by Maya to uh, Jack Kowalski. Others are made at other times during Maya Kowalski's time at the, at the um, Johns Hopkins. Let, let's deal with the easy one first, which are the statements that Maya made to Jack Kowalski. And even though Jack Kowalski did not have the precise date, whether it was um, January 7th, 2017, or um, sometime between January 7th and January 13th. It, these were made while Maya was still at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, but at a time after um, her mom had died. So that, that leaves us with you know, a five or six day window. Um, these statements, uh, about that Maya relayed to Jack Kowalski about um, 
being photographed and that Maya did not want to be photographed, that if Maya didn't go along, uh, she would not be able to go to court or go with uncle, I think it was Scotty I wrote down, to go to court. And that Maya was uh, scared if she challenged Miss Beattie. And if I didn't say it, that uh, Maya told uh, told uh, Miss Beattie not to photograph her. All of those statements um, clearly are within the pleadings. Um, they certainly can be seen as an act of child abuse. And the circumstances behind those conversations between Jack Kowalski and Maya Kowalski uh, are sufficiently trustworthy for the admission, uh, the time, the content, the circumstances of those statements um, certainly are sufficient safeguards of the reliability. We also have the actual photographs of um, Johns Hopkins um, taken of Maya Kowalski, so we know as a matter of fact that Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital did in fact photograph uh, Maya Kowalski and although not discussed during today's uh, discussion on this, we had earlier in the trial in front of the jury, uh, Miss uh, Kathy Beatty tell us that uh, risk management at Johns uh, Hopkins All Children's Hospital directed these photographs to be taken. So uh, the court finds those statements uh, have uh, sufficient indicia of reliability and will permit Jack Kowalski to um, testify as to Maya Kowalski's uh, hearsay statements. I, should, I probably need to say that at the time Maya Kowalski made those statements, Maya had just turned 11 years old. Uh, the court will also uh, note, although this is from the totality of the circumstances of the trial to date, and I don't think anyone has contradicted this or is going to attempt to contradict this, but Maya Kowalski, given uh, her long-term medical um, involvement, is more mature than uh, a girl of her normal biological age. So her, her level of maturity is, is higher. Um, the next set of Statements are attributed to a Friday, December 2nd, 2016 conversation between Maya and her dad uh, when uh, dad was visiting with Maya at the hospital. And uh, dad testified that uh, these statements were made outside the presence of anyone else, um, which is consistent with... The, the content of the types of concerns that Maya were relating. Uh, those included uh, Jack Kowalski testifying that Maya Kowalski said that the social worker, i.e. Kathy Beatty, was hugging and kissing uh, her being Maya and making faces uh, when uh, Maya's mom was on the phone. The next one is that the Social worker uh, Miss Beatty told Maya that the mom is in a uh, hospital getting medical treatment. The next statement is Dr. Elliot told Maya that her mom was putting Maya in a uh, coma each week. The next statement is, and this was less clear from Mr. Kowalski, but his best recollection is that Maya said that Dr. Elliot said something about all of this was in Maya's head. There was also a statement about um, the use of the computer and Maya possibly um, using it without any sort of evidence to search on some sort of sex website. Now, 
the statements about um, using the, the, the computer to, to find a sex website or anything like that, even if it's true, is not a statement of abuse or neglect. So that statement is not going to qualify uh, for something that Jack Kowalski can testify to. The statement uh, attributed to Dr. Elliott uh, about all this in Maya's head because um, Jack Kowalski was not clear on his recollection of that comment, I do not find that there's enough reliability with that statement. So that statement cannot be testified to. The statement that Dr. Elliott told Maya that her mom was putting Maya in a coma uh, each week. I am on the fence on that one. I, I'm, in my mind, I, I can see that that might be a child neglect issue, maybe. But I'm going to think about that one a little bit more. But Mr. Anderson, right now, my, my leaning is not to admit that statement. But I'm going to think about that one more. Uh, the other statements, uh, the statements that uh, the social worker was hugging and kissing Maya, you know, with the face, making the facements when, when Maya's mom was on the phone, and that Maya's mom is in the hospital getting medical treatment. Um, those statements that Maya Kowalski made to Jack Kowalski do qualify as either or could qualify as abuse or neglect, the court would find that there are uh, sufficient indications of reliability um, as to those statements to qualify for uh, the child victim hearsay. So um, I will allow those statements that I specifically advise. Now, to be clear, that does not mean that those documents from which Mr. Kowalski used to refresh his recollection that those documents are admissible, but Mr. Kowalski's testimony as to what Maya Kowalski told him as to those statements that I specifically said uh, can be used um, under, or in your case in chief, under um, 90.803. Eight hundred three paren twenty three. Any questions or clarifications I, I just as to my ruling, Mr. Altenberg? A specific finding then that the testimony is that Miss Beatty was making faces about things when Beata was talking on, I guess, an iPad to her her mother. And your finding is that that Miss Beatty's action of of smirking or making some faces while listening to her mother in the room is an act of child abuse. Uh, or, or neglect, you or know, neglect. that, that and, and because of the outrage count in this case, I mean, that's, to, to an 11-year-old girl, when the mom is having very limited, um, very limited contact, and it's supervised, that the supervisor is either making fun or, or making faces, that, that when, when we go back to 827.03, um, you know, talking about mental injury and talking about the mental health of uh, a person and providing uh, supervision under neglect of child, I think it is sufficient uh, to fall under it. I mean, obviously, it's not a battery. I mean, clearly, I'm not saying it's a battery. But I do think that the language in 823, um, sorry, yeah, that the language in 823, as well as 90.803, paren 23, paren A, is broad enough to include that conduct. Any other clarifications that the court needs to make? And the only thing the plaintiff would ask, Your Honor, is that, uh, and, and we understand as to the Dr. Elliott uh, said uh, everything was in Maya's head. As to the computer, the sex website, introduction of the uh, idea, the concept of porn sites to a 10-year-old, uh, we only ask this, that the court, in light of his uh, rulings on the other matters, at least 
While you're considering the, Dr. Elliott said, putting Maya in a coma, that you at least uh, consider reconsidering on the, uh, the porn site introduction, because in our view, that is certainly not towards the mental health of a 10-year-old who has not reached puberty and has no idea really about such things. And there's no indications here that although Maya is uh, very smart and mature, that in any way, shape, or form, first she's, she's reached puberty or approaching puberty at that point, nor uh, is there any indication that she was sexually aware. So putting those things together, we, we ask the court to consider to reconsider the computer website. I, I'm not. And, you know, as I said, Maya has a much greater maturity than uh, at, at that time on Friday, December 2nd. Technically, she was 10 because her birthday was like a week later. Yeah. Um, you know, she's talking to her dad about sex websites. Maya knew what the concept was. Um, and so I'm not going to reconsider it. My notes, um, I, I missed one in my notes and I apologize. The statement uh, made to um, Jack Kowalski by Maya Kowalski that um, Kathy Beatty wanted to adopt Maya, I do find is a statement that would qualify under the statute that there's sufficient indica indication of reliability and will be allowed uh, for Jack Kowalski to testify to. I forgot, and I apologize for not saying that one, so I will say it, but I, 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 I'm unsure on the Dr. Elliot. I'm going to spend more time, but I don't think it's going to come in, but I'm going to reserve on that one and that one only. So anything else before we move on to our next issue? One question, clarification, Eric. The, the uh, I'll adopt you statement was made in the context of... Uh, which statement? Uh, uh, Kathy Beatty's statement that I will adopt you or something to that effect. Right, which I just said is coming in. I understand. So you want to keep talking about it? Well, I only want to talk about it in the context of the visit to the chapel because I didn't hear a finding specifically as to whether... I know hugging and kissing was said. Her dad didn't say anything about a chapel. I understood. All right. Understood. Okay. I, I know there was discussion about a chapel this morning in Kathy Beatty's testimony, but Jack Kowalski didn't say anything about chapel. Okay. Anything else on this issue? If not, why don't we take a five-minute break? We're going to end my ruling on that, and we'll move on to exhibits when we come back in. Five minutes.
So we're now to exhibits, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, let's start. So at the top, um, the first exhibit is 2123-610. Let's get it up. So what am I looking at? You're looking at uh, below is what we're interested in, Your Honor. Okay, so you're looking at the Kathy Beatty email and not the Lindsay Masika? I expect there's a hearsay objection on, on that portion, but with uh, Kathy Beatty, we, uh, this is a party admission. This is a statement of Ms. Beatty and relevant to the lawsuit here. So, what are the issues? Um, the simple issue to discuss is Ms. Beattie has been dropped, so she's no longer a party, where this would be admissible as a party opponent. The broader issue, again, uh, I know we're sounding a little bit like a broken record, but this is starting to relitigate what happened at the dependency court. And the problem with admitting this email is the only way to start refuting the hearsay in this is to talk about well, what happened next. Well, after November 29th, this information went to different lawyers, and then they went to a dependency court. And then four, four lawyers for the Kowalskis made their point about what visitation should be. Lawyers for DCF, including Mr. Silverstein, made recommendations about what visitation should be, and all of that culminated in people other than Johns Hopkins, All Children's Hospital, who was not a party to the dependency, with the court crafting orders. And you know our general fear about getting into this testimony, which is probably somewhat out of the barn, unfortunately, but this is gonna crack the barn wide open, is it's out of context. And the only, the only way to talk about these is to talk about the next 100 actions that resulted after this email, all the arguments that were made to the dependency court, who made those arguments, what orders resulted. I'm sure this we're going to have a discussion about what can the jury see in terms of some parts of the redacted orders, but this is getting really deep into how the sausage is made and is going to create issues for this court that I believe you know, could result in a mistrial if we're starting to talk about what happened with dependency. That's... Our, that, that is our objection. Do you need a response, Your Honor? Yes. Yes, please. Right. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, with respect to party admission, this is made at the time by the party. Well, made. it's clearly a party admission. I'm, I'm not. Uh, it's, it's whether the All right. the so, other other side of Mr. Shapiro's sure. argument is what I'm focusing on. Thank you. Well. The, the defense has requested an instruction, uh, and I think the court's going to give one, on the scope of the court orders. And we have been consistent that what was happening here is the hospital was feeding misinformation to DCF in an effort to get court orders to tighten the vice grip on the Kowalskis. And so this is a perfect example. The lead social worker in the case is characterizing the, conver the phone conversation that she listens in on without authority and characterizing that phone call as being damaging to the child and then suggesting to DCF that for the reason of 
Miata allegedly acting improperly during that phone call, that DCF then should then push for additional restrictions on Beata Kowalski's limited already visitation with her daughter. And that's exactly what happens. So we need to be able to point out, since the court orders are coming in, the jury's been very curious about these court orders. What was the genesis of these court orders? Was it really just the hospital implementing orders and DCF instructions? Or as we've pointed out, was it the hospital taking advantage of the situation and leveraging their information from listening in on phone calls to push DCF in that direction? And it's not addressed to any attorney. This is strictly communication between DCF. And the court has previously ruled that uh, these DCF memos do not have the, the force of law. So it seems like they want all the good parts about the orders, and they don't want to get involved at all in how they manufacture some of them. And, and let me say one other thing. If the court hears the actual phone call that this is referencing, which we want to put into evidence. I think I've actually already listened to that one. All right then the court can compare for uh, himself exactly the difference between what was represented and what was on that call. Ms. Crowell's was standing up earlier. <laughs> yes, I know, but I'm deferring. Hey, please, the court. Um, I, think, I think Mr. Whitney just kind of gave away the game. The game that plaintiffs are playing here is to relitigate in detail the dependency action. Theory that Mr. Whitney just elucidated is that there were statements being made to DCF or the, or the uh, dependency court that were incorrect for whatever reason they believe, and that that forms the sole basis for the court's ruling, and that if that if those things weren't done, then there would not have been this ruling. They are relitigating exactly what the theory is in the DCF and the dependency action. We've taken the position from day one in this case that there is an immunity that derives from any act or omission that is permitted or required by Chapter 39, and there is an immunity for any act or omission that is connected with the judicial proceeding that was the dependency action. If there was a problem in the dependency action, the remedy was for one of the four lawyers arguably five, counting the, the, uh, the gal lawyer, one of the five lawyers representing this family, to take it up with Judge Hayworth at that time and to deal with it at that time. What's going on right now is that we are going into detail on orders, detail on the, the, the execution of those orders or the interpretation of those orders, detail on what was being told to DCF and everything connected with the DCF proceeding as well as the dependency action. This is going to the heart of relitigating that very case that we've been, that you've been saying that we, all, we, we, we thought we understood was being avoided. And yet here we are. And it's going, and, and this, this will open floodgates that have already been opened by the rulings on what was permitted from, from Ms. Beatty's deposition. There, are, there is more than confusion being created regarding what DCF is, is uh, responsible for versus what the hospital is responsible for. We can't defend what we did without going deeply into all of the orders and all of the, the machinations of DCF. The fact of the matter is, is that, that the court in the, in the dependency proceeding heard from multiple lawyers and multiple witnesses, not just all children's, and made a decision that, in the final analysis, was at variance with what was recommended by the hospital. So, Judge, I, I, I just want to make clear that in, in continuing to permit exploration of what was told to DCF, what was told to the dependency court, what was recommended to the dependency court, what the orders consisted of, what happened in the dependency court, in continuing to do that, we are invading an immunity that should be respected and, and we should never have crossed to begin with. Let, let me ask this. As of November 29th, what was the status of the court order with respect to communication and telephone calls? Can someone give me that order? As of November 29th, 
seven. Farther down. The, the, it's the order, I believe, dated November 10th. Mm. I don't think it had been changed November since 10th. then. Okay. And it says... Can, can someone hand me a copy of it or... Do we have an exhibit number if you find it? Or if, is, give me the dependency case number and give me a DIN number. I can pull it that way as well. Mm -hmm. Order on shelter review. I'm not sure I can give you a DIN number. That I have given you a, a proposed standard instruction that has the, the ordered and the judge part of all of those. What, 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 is the, what is the dependency number? Does someone have that case number? Yes. Uh, yes, the dependency number is case number 2016-DP-601. NC. And you said, Mr. Altenburn, that this was the most recent was December, or sorry, it was November 10th? 10th. The, the relevant paragraph, Your Honor, I believe is uh, paragraph B at the top of page three. Okay, well, that order looks like it was. There's enough that date. That's yeah, I'm trying to find it. I have a copy if Your Honor would like to see it in hard copy. Do we have an extra copy? Yeah. Or I can put it on the Elmo. Okay, so the dependency court signed it on the 10th, but it was docketed on the 14th. Okay, let me read it. And you said it's on the yes, third that's page? Correct. That's correct, yeah. You said it's on the third page? Page yeah. six page. Oh, well, we have a different number of the 10th order. Ours says contact between Mrs. Kowalski and Maya on the page, third page. Yeah. Is that in the body is that or right? is that, is that yes. in the order? The order to object part is what I'm I'm just, I think Mr. Shapiro agrees with me. Yeah, I see okay. it. Let me ask a dumb question. When the dependency court said telephone communication between the mother and Maya is authorized, but only when supervised by the guardian ad litem or the case manager at times convenient to them in the facility, why, why is Kathy Beattie monitoring the call? That's not a dumb question. And the 
my recollection of the, of the DCF hearing, if we can go back on that, at some point in time, because the guardian lied him and the, and the case manager couldn't find time to do these, it was okay for her to listen rather than one of the other two, it is my recollection. We, we had a different recollection. Okay. And she testified to it this morning. She decided that the best way to communicate with the mother between Maya and Beata was for Kathy Beatty to use her personal cell phone and walk into Maya Kowalski's room and set the cell phone on speakerphone on the bed or near Maya and remain in the room during those conversations. That was her decision. Yeah. And during those calls, there was the authorized supervisor from, what is it, does it say in the order DCF or the guardian ad litem? Judge and, and, and Okay, but Ms. Beatty also testified that DCF asked Ms. Beatty to basically perform their function. Yes, that's correct, Judge, especially, and she would come in on the weekends to do that as well because they were not available and wouldn't get the calls connected. Show us that particular email or memo. Respectfully, Judge, in addition to that, if there was a problem with it, the remedy was to go back to the court dependency court. Right. Just as if, the, if there's a problem with something that goes on before your honor in this court, our remedy is to come to you in this proceeding, not to file a collateral action seeking damages. Yeah. Your well, honor. explain yeah. then how we time, are supposed time, to know about this. Time out. Time out. Time out. I'm reading this email from Kathy Beatty to all the people that are effectively the DCF folks. And it is a recommendation to DCF as to how the order should be changed. This doesn't, and frankly, that, that's how it should be done. It's like, if they don't like something, this is, you know, go, go to the folks who are gonna go to the court and th this is what the hospital is going to recommend. I see that this is part of the dependency process. And so, you know, my, my inclination is this is not something that would be admissible in this proceeding. The, the problem is that the, we, in the dependency action, Nobody knew about this. This was not copied to anyone. It wasn't copied to the other lawyers. This was not a proceeding where you had a uh, the court's approval, sanction, or anything else because it was unilaterally to, and not only that, but I think that my Florida Families is a contractor of DCF. Nonetheless, the problem is no one knew anything about this, and it was not. this was not submitted to the court. No one knew that Ms. Beatty was actively, was the, and was the only person at Johns Hopkins who was sending this in. This is from a social worker. This is not from a manager or anyone else at Johns Hopkins. This is from a social worker who purportedly, according to them, has no you know, managerial responsibility or anything close to it. So why are we having a social worker write to a third-party contractor not copy anyone from uh, the lawyers for the Kowalskis at that time, trying to manipulate it, which then results in the next order, which I think is the 1227, which includes no uh, disparaging comments shall be made by any visitor. The problem here is that this was not part of the regular system. This was not part of what the court envisioned. This was a social worker without authority writing to a third party contractor influencing the system. And this is not something that would have ever been shown to the court and it would not have been shown to the, in, the, in the proceedings. It would only go to this contractor who presumably would then influence the DCF attorney uh, Silverstein, who we plan to call, and then from there, Silverstein would decide what to do. So the actual decision, yes, down the road. But the point and the relevance of it is the hospital is allowing Beatty 
to influence the court proceedings unbeknownst, and, and, and keep one other thing in mind we want to emphasize in this. The hospital was not a party. The hospital was not supposed to be dictating or influencing court action other than if there was a direct violation of uh, the court order or a specific rule that the hospital handed down. And our case is this. The patient's rights set forth the rights that the Kowalskis relied on and had the right to rely on through this. Yet the hospital, and not even the hospital, I think, basically Miss Beatty was coming up with bizarre rules, strange in, uh, inferences, uh, and conduct that was totally out of line and was trying to influence the, the proceedings as though the hospital was a party. And if you look closely at some of those transcripts, Judge, I think what you're going to find is that the hospital, far from being just a participant, which under Chapter 39, they're not supposed to be influencing the proceedings. They are not supposed to be uh, a advocating one way or the other. They're simply supposed to be observers. And yet, there was a lot of advocacy and a lot of trying to get this done. And so okay. our point is, there's got to be a cutoff. At some point, the court will have to rule, but there needs to be a cutoff but let's below that. Let's talk about cutoffs for a second. Yes, sir. I've been given a seven or eight page list. We're still on number one. We're 30 minutes into this. <laughs> yeah. The I, I hear what you're saying. Let me tell you my thoughts right this second. This email goes to the question of whether the dependency court should or should not change the contact. That is an issue within the dependency court. I don't see why the request to change the rules is something that we need to address in this case. Now, having said that, in my mind, and Mr. Altenberg, you might want to raise your antennas on this because mm -hmm. I think it's going to impact you the most. I can see a, an instruction by me saying, you know, as of whatever date, uh, November 10th or 14th or whatever date this was, you know, the contact by Mrs. Kowalski was allowed to be supervised by the guardian ad litem or the case manager at a time convenient to them in the facilities. I can then see an interrogatory question that says, did DCF delegate its, its role under this order to Miss Beatty or the hospital? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then there would have to be an instruction that, you know, you got to, you got to disregard the concerns about the contact starting on November 10th to whenever that court order ended. If the answer of that is no, then the hospital had no authority to monitor that um, call and then could be part of the so we're, we're going to have to put on testimony, put in all the transcripts of these hearings and read no. the hearings where this is discussed? The, no, no. The issue, I think the, the issue is whether DCF authorized Kathy Beatty to operate under this court order in DCF stead, from a matter of fact. And if the jury says yes, then... What Maya, what what Miss Beatty was doing was under the authority of the court order. If the jury says no, then I don't see a court order that would have allowed Miss Beatty to listen in on the call. So I guess but, I call Mr. Zimmer, I mean, the, the, the various, the lawyer, Mr. Silverstein, and and the, the people from DCF to explain this whole process. To then, no, just whether as of this date that they had. Um, authorized because you know I can see the court instructing the jury to the expect extent on as of November tenth. Uh, I, I keep on saying November fourteenth because that's the day it was docked, right. and, and you know what I'm talking about right. there. Yes, yes. But as of that date, you know the tele the court the dependency court stated that the communication between the mother and Maya was to be supervised by the guardian ad litem or the case manager at a time was convenient to them and the facility. 
There's nothing here that says that the facility can listen in. Now, if Miss Beatty was delegated the authority of DCF, if you will, uh, to operate under DCF's position or the case manager's position under this court order, if that's an issue of fact and the jury says yes, then it would seem to me that all of this discussion about um, the, you know, listening in on conversations, we have to tell the jury to disregard. And, and this is relevant to which there's a contentional infliction? I'm not sure what it's relevant. Well, I, well, not, not li, li, to me, that's kind of part of an outrage, listening in on someone's telephone conversations without authority. Well, Miss, Miss, uh, well, first of all, Miss Kowals Mrs. Kowalski knew it was going on because, because this was the conversation where three or four times there was an interruption to say, no, you really, you got to redirect, you can't go there. And so she knows that, that the woman is on the phone with her. It's not well, it's not whether she knows, is whether Miss Beatty had any authority to be on that telephone call. Judge, respectfully, if, if that's the case, and Ms. Kowalski is aware that someone is, is monitoring the telephone conversation outside the parameters of the court's visitation order, then the remedy at that time is her lawyer takes the matter back to the court, as indeed they did several days later in a day-long hearing before Judge Hayworth on the terms of the visitation. Mr. Hunter, on this November 10th or November 14th order, can you tell me, show me any paragraph that authorize the hospital to listen in on the telephone call. Can, no, you, can you point to me? I, I can't. All I'm saying to you, Judge, is if, if the complaint is, it, let's assume for the sake of discussion that Ms. Beatty's testimony is to the effect, as it was this morning, that the Guardian and MyFlorida.com, that is DCF, by the way, I know. that they were, they were unable, unwilling, or not staffed to provide that. And so she did, as she said she did, and, and, and supplied herself to do it. Now, if you assume for the sake of discussion that's, that's correct and that she stepped outside the parameters of what she was supposed to do, then the, then the remedy for that, her, her acting outside the court's visitation order, is to go back to the dependency court. And what I'm suggesting to Your Honor is that's exactly what happened because if you look in the dependency action about 10 days later, I wonder about what, December 5th? Six. There was a day long hearing with everybody, with all parties, mom, dad, the child, the gal, everybody represented by counsel, where they went over exactly what the visitation terms are. What I'm suggesting to your honor is that you can't get into this, and, and, and you're, you're correct to, to, to some extent on this, but what I'm suggesting to you is that the entire issue of this is part and parcel of the dependency court's jurisdiction in that proceeding, and if you start going into it, we're relitigating it. I fundamentally disagree. I see the question differently. As I said, when I look at this email, I see this as a request ultimately to the dependency court to alter the court order on visitation. And to me, that is an appropriate action within the dependency court proceeding to change the court order. But as of November 10th, the dependency court had issued an order that, in my mind, when I'm looking at it, does not authorize the hospital to listen in on the conversation. Now, you're... I'm either being put in the position where I have to make a factual finding, which I don't think I'm allowed to do since we have a jury here. So to me, it's a question of fact as to whether or not DCF had delegated its authority under the November 10th order to allow um, Miss Beatty to supervise those conversations instead of the case manager. If the jury finds the answer to that is yes, then we'll have to have an instruction to the effect of then members of the jury, you cannot consider anything having to do with the, the supervising the telephone calls as any type of 
conduct that would have a finding of outrage or damages. But if the answer to that is no, then I think it's fair game. And so I think the evidence for that is whether or not DCF authorized Ms. Beattie. That sounds like a pretty limited scope of testimony as opposed to what happened later on in front of Judge Harris. Because that I don't want to get into, and I don't think you need to get into that. Sure. I think you just need to get into, uh, as of December 10th, or sorry, on November 10th, this is what the court order said, and it clearly doesn't give the hospital the, the right that you think it does, and it's a question of fact as to whether there was a delegation. Judge, what I'm suggesting to you is that is not the only issue like this that the court's going to be confronted with. Well, this is issue number one on this sheet that we're now 40 minutes into, and I don't think I'm changing my mind on this right this second. I would urge your honor to consider it. That's all. Judge, can I? F f folks, if we are ever going to get to number three on this list, not to mention number 400 on this list, we have got to do this faster. I understand, Judge. But is the court reserving ruling on this? Because I think the court needs to hear from DCF or somebody on that issue before it allows this in. Because if all the testimony is she had the authority, then this email should not come in. I already said that to me, this email should not come in. Okay, sorry. I, I said that 20 minutes ago. Yes, you did, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. But I, I wanted to be clear because I've seen this issue now as to where I thought this whole thing is going to go, and I was alerting Mr. Altenburn to the possible jury instruction that I'm envisioning is going to have to be given. Uh, okay. I understood, Your Honor. I'm trying to alert you to where I think it's going to go, and it, I, this is this is this is the first step in a long path. But well, may, maybe we can agree to disagree at this point. Currently, the email is not have, coming into evidence. Where are the ones oh, oh, that time have out. It. Only one at a time. It's Mr. Altenburn's turn. It, the email currently is not coming into evidence. Is that right? Correct. Okay. But I'm telling you that the issue of authority, because I know I've already talked to you about wanting to do a, an instruction that talks about the visitation and, and the dates and the times, and I can see that being a specific issue that the jury is going to have to make a factual finding on. What's next? Two two seven zero, Your Honor. Okay, well, there was like three or four yeah, others. Yeah, we're skipping a couple given time constraints. Okay, so two two seven zero. And this is from Kathy Beatty to Doctor Amin. Yes, Your Honor. There's a second page. Let me see the number two, please. Who is this to? To Dr. Well, it's it's only addressed to Dipti Amin. No, but but this letter, which is 2270-002. It doesn't say. Judge, they know that ultimately this turns into a letter from Dr. Amin in the dependency court action, isn't it? This is an internal email from Kathy Beatty to Dr. Amin. <laughs> he's he's avoiding the question. Okay. Can can Mr. Reyes, can you make uh, 002 a little bit larger for me, please? Mr. Um, Whitney, this goes to the same issue that we were just talking about, that this letter, because it sounds like this was ultimately delivered to the dependency court to advocate for a change of visitation in the dependency court. To me, that is off limits and not what this trial is about. The fact that some someone made a suggestion to make visitation more rigorous or less rigorous um, is not an issue in this case. It's ultimately when the dependency court ruled what was what was followed or not followed. Understood. I think there's a way to deal with this letter through specific redactions 
taking out mention of recommendations to DCF and then ultimately the court. For example, what you see here, don't stay there. The, the, the top paragraph that's displayed right now, for example, this has to do with Catherine Beatty's statements about how Maya is doing in the hospital, which is absolutely relevant to the case and goes to her credibility, Maya's credibility, and what was going on. I, I, I will tell you, yes, if, if everything about recommendations to uh, the dependency court, uh, recommendations to DCF and supervision and all of that is excised and all you have is the observation and statements about Maya, I would consider that. We will put those redactions to the rest of them. Yeah, but we'll have to see the redaction, Judge, and then we'll have our Yeah, I, I mean, but if, if, it is, if it's an agent of Johns Hopkins Alterman's Hospital making an observation about how Maya Kowalski was physically doing an observation, that's probably going to be relevant and, and admissible. But nothing about making a recommendation to the dependency court for changing a visitation. Not, that's not coming in in any, any uh, exhibit that you got. In the interest of time, we'd like to move, advance a couple of pages. I think it's the third page, although my page is not numbered. And get to the audio clips, which begin at 2608A. Alpha. And, and before we start playing these audio clips, are all of these uh, clips, have we cleared any sort of potential criminal problems with these clips? These are calls between Maya Kowalski and Diana Kowalski, the first. So in this case, uh, Jack Kowalski as Maya's... Um, Guardian could consent, and on the other side, Ma, uh, Beata, who hit record, is obviously consenting. So I'm just clarifying. There's no one else on the call. No, <laughs> Catherine Beatty at times will, in supervising the calls, interject herself into these calls. It was Miss Beatty. Was she aware? She was. It's announced at the beginning of the call that. By Bianca Kowalski, I'm recording this call. Uh, and sure. secondly, there has to be a reasonable expectation of privacy. And I know we just went over these letters, but she characterized the contents of these calls and reported the contents of these calls that she was on. So she has no reasonable expectation of privacy in these calls. Not only that, but they're on a speakerphone in a hospital with people walking by. There's And there's case law that says that in exact that cir circumstance where they're in a hospital, in a place where it's a speakerphone and anyone can listen in. Well, well, before we get really down this path, I've heard conflicting things as to whether Miss Beatty was going to wave or not wave? She's not waving. Not waving. Okay. So if Miss Beatty was on the call and it was announced that the call is being recorded and Miss Beatty did not object, then it would seem, without even having to hear it, that she's waved, she being Miss Beatty, has waived any expectation of privacy, assuming there, there is any. But is that actually the case? We'd have to listen to the beginning. Yeah. I, I think the first clip includes that announcement, if not right before it. Do we know? What, what, can we, what's the date of the call? Please? This, this phone call is November 15th, 2016. And the first clip that we would like to play for the court is a minute and 13 seconds. Well, let's hear if there's consent. For, do you have the consent at the start of the call that we could hear before we... I, I, as I stand here, I don't know if it's within this clip or just before it. I just don't know, Judge. I Sorry, there's too many clips. I don't recollect off the top of my head. I would feel more comfortable if you could assure us that no one's going to jail <laughs> by playing this clip. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll play it to ourselves. We'll play it privately yes, please. Can I have listen to it? <laughs>
You said this was 2605? 2608. 2608A is an alpha. Yes, Your Honor. I've got it to his. We're so perfect. I, I was just letting you know that was the delay. I had to switch it back. Oh, okay. I was doing it privately. May I publish? Yes. Okay. I'm uh, I'm recording this phone call so everybody knows. Okay. Hi, mommy. Hi, honey. How are you, sweetie pie? I'm hurting. I miss you. I miss you so much too. I miss you so much, every day, every you know single happy, day. You know how happy it makes me feel to hear your voice. Same here. I miss you so much, and I am so happy that I'm finally able to hear your voice, too. Yeah. Yeah. I hope how, I you. What did you say, sweetie? I hope I can see you soon. I, I would love to see you soon. I would love to see you soon. We just have to wait for the judge to make the decision, okay? okay. As soon as he makes the decision, then I'll be able to see you. Yeah, okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're not allowed to talk about the case, okay? Maya, honey, just we're going to talk about uh, what you've been doing, if you need any Shopkins or things like that, if you had nice visits with your daddy, but we can't discuss the case, okay, honey? Is that the conclusion of the clip? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Are, are we li are are B and C the same call? Yes, they are, Your Honor. Why don't we just? Um, and I'm assuming that at no point in the interim anyone has removed consent. Is that correct? I've listened to it. No one removed consent on this call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Altenberg. Then you can play B as in Bravo. Um, how, how about, how are you doing? How is PT and OT going for you? Uh, not good. Why um, is okay, Bianca, we can't discuss any of those type of matters, okay? Okay. Is that the conclusion of Bravo? Yes, Your Honor. Let's uh, listen to Charlie. Charlie is 55 seconds. And what do you usually need help with? My pants. What happens with the pants? I just can't lift them up. You can't pull up the pants anymore? No. <laughs> but when did that start, Maya? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a while ago. I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember when it started. Okay. PBH. What's PBH? Um, yeah, I'm trying to read my last that line of conversation now. Thank you. Okay. That finish it. The end of that one. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so that concludes uh, that telephone call that you wanted to publish. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, uh, go ahead and what, what is the argument? Or let me hear the objection. I guess is the or we need to start. Well, Your yeah, Honor, <laughs> object hearsay certainly as to all of Yada's comments. I don't know what the relevance is to what issue. Um, and 9403. I mean, it's clearly just to uh, appeal to the emotions of the jury. Um, those are the arguments. I mean, it's hearsay, it's 9403, um, and it's not relevant to the issues. And, and Mr. Altenburn, going back to that last discussion we were having for 40 minutes yes. uh, on the factual findings. There probably also needs to be a factual finding as to the as if the jury were to find that there was a delegation 
we need a date of the delegation because what is the date, of, what is the date on that thing? This, this one's eleven fifteen, which would have been the day after the order was yeah. docketed, which is why I just am in my mind thinking we probably need to find a date of debt of if the jury were to find that there had been a delegation. And thank you, Judge. That brings up another issue. If there's an issue with the manner in which Mrs. Beatty was handling this call, that's an issue for the dependency court. And they want to use this to try to say that Mrs. Beatty wasn't appropriately monitoring the calls as directed by the dependency court. But again, if Ms. Beatty had not been authorized by DCF and she Clearly, the dependency court did not authorize the hospital to monitor the call. Then, under what authority was she acting on November fifteenth? The call. Well, that's have, go ahead. the call would not have taken place at all because there wasn't somebody from DCF or a guardian on that phone call. Is my knowledge. That that's the, clearly she's assisting in placing the call, Judge. But I heard the Your Honor. So there need. I would suggest that he needs to defer on the admission of this until. That testimony is heard because you can't put that cat back in the barn. But here, here, here's the, the conundrum I'm in. At some point, someone has to make the factual determination on the delegation and when. But if and there's no, there's no summary judgment that was addressed to this issue. But and so, how am I supposed to take an issue from the jury? If there's no dispute as to the fact, if there's nobody is going to testify otherwise, if DCF comes in and says. Yes, we asked her to do it. If the attorney for DCF comes in and says, yes, we asked her to do it, and there's no factual dispute, then absolutely the court can make that determination. Can, can the jury disregard the testimony of Ms. Beatty and potentially of DCF? If there's nobody that testifies in contradiction, how could they ignore, how could they ignore that, Judge? It's not going to be, if there's no contrary testimony. If DCF says we gave her the authority, we asked her to do it. If the attorney says we asked her to do it, and there's no contrary evidence, there's no factual determination for the jury to define. That's all the facts. That's all there is. That's a directed verdict. No, not at all. No. This is a summary judgment standard. You're arguing summary judgment standard in open court. Well, trial. summary judgment is now married to directed verdict. Right. Yeah. I, I it, understand, it, Judge. However, the jury does have the right to reject that testimony well, if they so deem. And if they find that Mr. Silverstein, at that point, either did not have enough information or that he did not have the authority, if the court finds he did not have the authority. And so there are a number of hoops to jump through here. So now they're going to argue, Judge, and try to prove it to this court and this jury that the DCF didn't have authority, that's a DCF hearing. No, no. I, I, I go back to the dependency court order. It says telephone communication between the mother and Maya is authorized, but only when supervised by the guardian ad litem. And obviously, it doesn't seem like that's an issue here. Or the case manager at times convenient to them in the, fac in the facility. So there's nothing in the complaint, to the best of my knowledge, it's 105 pages, saying that she was listening in on conversations in violation of the court's order. This is all quite a surprise to me, frankly. Well, the argument just came up by the defense on this. We were arguing outrageous conduct and <clears throat> limiting access to Maya. Yeah, I, so, I, not limiting access. I, I am comfortable that this issue is, is contained within the pleadings. It's, what I'm hearing Ms. Crowell say is if the defense only presents evidence of DCF authorized or the case manager authorized Kathy Beatty and there is no contrary evidence, then why put this information in? Yes, Judge, because then you're putting something in that needs a limiting instruction as opposed to they have to first, I would think, establish the basis that allows it in. So I would think before this comes in, they would have to establish that she, anyway, that's my argument, that you would allow them to put in evidence that then has the fifth limiting instruction for this jury as opposed to waiting. Anything else, Mr. Anderson? 
Yes, I had a brilliant point, and, and now it just escaped me. <laughs> However, <laughs> they call those senior bubble. <laughs> um, it strikes me that the issue is not going to be presented in the plaintiff's case. So it would have to be at the conclusion of the defense's case. And at that point, if the court decided that it was a DV, then the court would have to, in the instruction, say, as to evidence regarding this, this, and this, the court instructs you to disregard that, which happens in almost every trial. Not every trial. It's not like a slip and fall. But in every big complex trial, there are instructions about what evidence you can consider and what evidence you can't. So it can be corrected at the end. I, I tend to agree with Mr. Anderson on this. I, I hear what the defense is saying, and, and ultimately you might get a DV on this, but maybe not. I don't know. But I think the question that the jury has to answer is whether or not they were authorized. That, that the hospital through Miss Beatty was authorized. If that's if the court the, is that, the court order doesn't say anything about the hospitals. If the court is inclined to let it in, then why is all the preamble coming in up to the point where Miss Beatty interrupts the call? Because there's other exceptions for those statements. What's the? I mean, if the point of this is to show Miss Beatty interrupting the call, then it should just be the parts of Miss Beatty's interrupting, as opposed to the rest of the call. Well, when, when Maya's talking to mom about not being able to pull up the pants, that seems to be a something that really the hospital should have been told about for medical purposes. Well, what about the mom's response, Judge? That's hearsay. The no conversation questions. between the mom and the daughter, maybe, maybe Maya's comment can come in as I can't pull my pants up, but then you have Beata's comments back. What's the hearsay exception for that? It's and a conversation. What 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 is mom's comments being used for the truth of the matter asserted? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I I I I'm pretty comfortable with okay. uh, two six zero eight A B and C coming in. Now, Mr. Anderson, at the end of this trial, if there's a DV and I grant the DV. There's going to be a very strong instruction about what they're going to have to ignore. I understand. Okay. Your, Your Honor, just, just so you're, it's clear in the record to you that while the, the part about the phone calls with my with Ms. Kowals, Mrs. Kowalski being supervised in the previous one that says that the um, – Communications with Maya, Mr. Kowalski, and Kyle, which were more open, are not to discuss her pain or its causes or, and shall be positive as to her rehabilitation efforts and progress. And we'll also follow the recommendations of faculty staff as to how to interact with her. So what's going on in this phone call was what was ordered for everybody else in the, in the family. And, that, and that's discussed with some length in the DCF hearings. So... The, the, the one that's coming in with her interrupting things that, that none of the other family can do with her. I don't understand why that's coming in. I'm going with what the dependency court order says, not what was talked about in the dependency hearing, unless that is the actual court order that we've got to address. This, this, this is a paragraph in that same order. So unless she's exempt because she can have the supervised calls, the Mr. Kowalski was actually promising he could work with her to get her to obey this stuff at some point. I, I guess I'm not following because paragraph A says contact between Maya, Mr. Kowalski, and Kyle Kowalski. That's correct. And it doesn't say anything about Beata Kowalski there. You're right. It does, the, one, the other one doesn't say I incorporate this by reference. So she could just talk about any old thing she wanted to. So is your position? Well, perhaps when you... And Mr. Elliott present to be the uh, jury instruction about the dependency court orders. We can have that discussion. As but as Mr. Zimmerman explained yesterday, these things were complicated, and she had to interpret these things and just read them because they, these are not plain and unambiguous orders. So I, I hear what you're saying. Okay. And I'm
trying to make it all make sense for everybody. So 2608 Alpha Bravo and Charlie can come in. What's next? 2627 A. This is a audio recording made at the time of ketamine infusions at Dr. Kirkpatrick's office. And did everyone give consent? Dr. Kirkpatrick has consented. Is there anyone else besides Maya, Mom, and Dr. Kirkpatrick? I need to listen to the 15th. I don't believe so, but let me just verify one more time. What's, what's, what's the date? October 8th, 2015. Then let's play 2627 A as an alpha. things about the testing at that point and the pain Maya was in. Excuse me, the discomfort she was in at the time. I don't think this clip okay. is, is the next one then. good for for that issue at all. So I'm going to deny. Wait, what was the number of that again, please? 2627A as an alpha. So what's the next clip, Mr. Whitney? 2631 alpha. And this is a different date. This is now uh, October 12th, 2015. We have uh, it's like six clips chosen from this uh, recording. And again, we don't. do we have a consent issue or is all consent issues and resolved? All participants in this would be Dr. Kirkpatrick, Maya, Beata, and Jack may make an appearance in one or two of them. This is from Kirkpatrick's office? Yes. Let's play 2631A as an alpha. Here we go. My, okay, so um, anyway, so you can see that, you know, her short-term memory is pretty botched, and that's good. That's a good thing. We want that. That's what we want to do. So we can say she got an adequate dose. So the max we could ever do on her is probably 135. I mean, that's for her size and everything. That's pretty good, you know, type thing. So, uh, and but we wanted to have that as a record. So we're going to put down here, no... This is, this is just moving around because she's in this weird thing. She's probably in, God knows where you're at. I mean, you could be on planet, well, I can't say planet Pluto anymore because it's not a planet anymore. They call it, what are, what, it's a satellite out there. But anyway, you're far out. Yeah. So you're thrashing around and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the thing is, you probably don't remember much of that at all, right? Okay. And that's normal. That's perfectly normal. Um, and... Uh, but uh, the thing about it is, you, you know, it's one of these things where you're just trying to trying to balance things out, not mm -hmm. giving enough, but not don't going don't going crazy and going overboard, okay? Because um, we were concerned she got a hyperactive airway, you know. If she gets stressed too much, we could activate that 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 end of things, which we don't want to do. So I think we managed to balance this thing out in a fairly good fairly good manner. We didn't have to give her, and there were times when I didn't even give her any bursad. Okay, remember? Yeah, on the time. third day, yeah. Yeah. she didn't get any verset till the very end. Yeah, right, 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 right. And she seemed to handle that pretty good. 
Yeah, the like, last day, I'm sorry, not last the third day. day. The yeah. last third day. Right, right, yeah. couple. Right. The f- right. first two days were hell, right. Right. but the third day right. was better. The fourth and sometimes day what you do, you just try something like that and just see how she does. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. If she does fine, then the less verse that we give, the more ketamine can do its job. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. So, no, uh, I'm going to put down, but I want you to understand why I'm putting no at Adverse hallucinations where she's yelling and screaming trying to run out the door. Right. Yeah, the first two days she was... She wanted to get out of there. Yeah, right. She was no, seeing I was monsters. Just scared. Yes, I was you, just the, scared. she saw monsters the first two days. Those two days were really hard. But Trying then to calm. Better. Okay, my, I'm talking. So it was hard to keep her calm. But then on the third day, it got a little bit better. She had pleasant hallucinations, you know? Mm-hmm. She was Yeah, she was dreaming, talking <coughs> to God. It was pleasant. And then on the last day, she was. Laughing. Yeah. She was high. Floating high. She was having a party. Yes. <laughs> and she didn't have no nausea about me. No. no, she had one after the first treat. What are we using this for, plan? <clears throat> Statements for medical purpose. Um, then existing mental, emotional, physical condition. Of the doctor? doctor. <laughs> well, clearly it's not being used to prove whether Pluto is a planet or not. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, it's clearly a hearsay. I mean, it's the doctor going on and on and on and on and on. It's, it's, it's no exception that applies to that. I'm going to give you another opportunity, plan, uh, plaintiffs, plaintiffs, uh, plaintiffs. If you could, because uh, I'm about ready to over or, or to agree with the defense. We're not going to argue strongly on that one. Okay. Well, over, I'm going to deny the admission of A as an alpha. Now, is Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and Foxtrot all kind of the same? There are there are uh, less. There's less verbiage by Dr. Kowalski. Dr. Kirkpatrick and the others. However, um, again, we approach the end of the day. So we'd like to advance again on the list to the videos that we have listed here towards the end of the, uh, the list. And the first one is 2686. It's only three seconds. What day is this from? January 8th, 2016. Isn't this about the same time as her and her brother in the pool? Uh, that's a little later. That was in August of 2016, Your Honor. This is uh, shortly after she returned from Mexico. Don't blink or you'll miss it. Girls, really cute. Got it. Can I see it again, please. Cute girls, really cute. Got it. Cumulative judge. I think there's several photographs similar to that. We don't have a video uh, or a clip from this time frame, which is clearly relevant because they want to attack the. Treatments in Mexico, and argue that they had detrimental effect to Maya Kowalski. Sure, so this, the other video, as I just mentioned, was from August, and this is shortly after she returned. The important thing is the legs, Judge. I saw it in the show some dystonia too. It's cumulative. Yeah, I'm going to deny the cumulative. I will allow two, six, four, eight. A as an alpha. What's next? What was the number on that chart? 2648A as an alpha? I, I thought it was 2686. Six. Yeah. I apologize, uh, Madam Clerk. I was wrong. It's 2686. Thank you all for keeping me straight. Apologize about that. What's the next? next? One is uh, 2690. 
And this is April 24, 2016, and it's uh, approximately, it's just under a minute long. It depicts Maya secretly recording Viata swimming, and the only thing she says is, I love you. If you're watching this, Mommy, I want to know you to know that I love you. Send you kisses. You'll know it's from me. I'm sorry, Judge. That was who in the pool? That was Be Beata Kowalski swimming. And Maya Kowalski videotaping and then narrating and making the statements. Objection. Oh. 8031, spontaneous statement describing or explaining an event or condition made while perceiving it or immediately thereafter, or excited utterance, or then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. Doesn't meet any of those. Business record? No. <laughs> uh, that would almost be funny if it was record. 1 o'clock. <laughs> It would be hilarious at 11.15. <laughs> Judge, it does, uh, I would think it does fit then um, the then existing mental, emotional, physical condition because it definitely shows what her state of mind was as to her mother. The reason we want this in is that you've got Dr. Lewis's report in, in which he's saying that uh, through this period of time that there was an antagonistic relationship between Beata and Maya. This video, as short as it is, demonstrates Maya's state of mind as to her mother during the period that Lewis says it's supposed to be a antagonistic one. Good try, but no. One more, one more try. 801 2 says a statement is not hearsay if declarant testifies at trial. Maya is the declarant, and the testimony and the, the statement is consistent with declarant's testimony and offered to rebut charge of op, improper influence, motive, or recent fabrication. The entire allegation of Munchausen by proxy is that Beata had an improper influence on Maya Kowalski. So the relationship between the two should be admissible. Good try. No. Okay. What's right. next? Uh, then. Um, this will be two six nine or one. This is a short video, only forty six seconds of uh, Maya in scuba practice in the pool, April thirtieth, twenty sixteen, being led around by her father. Can you, I'm going to overrule that. This shows Maya's abilities in April. You know, there was the video we just let in in January. There's the videos in August. And there's been testimony about the progression of her improvement in that time. So I'm going to allow 2691 into evidence. Next one. Uh, I'd like to... Uh... So then 26, skip to, in the interest of time, 2695, it's a video of Maya with her walker at 
home on the ground and then her upper body strength. So in July 28th, well, Before we play this one, what did I do with the one where she's dancing in the bed? Didn't I let that in? They withdrew that. Oh, they withdrew it. Okay. Okay. We have another one, but we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, they withdrew it at that time. I'm not video, saying they withdrew video it. Video of Maya playing on Walker at home, July 28th, 2016. It's 269 or 5. 2695. Let's play 28 it. seconds. That's better. I love you. Now go down slowly. Go down slowly. Good job. Good job. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> Overruled on cumulative, I will admit. Um, that was 2695? Yes, Your Honor. What's next? Um, I'm not sure we'll play it, but I'd like to have it available anyway. 2693, video of uh, Maya, again, same date, essentially. Um, 728.16, it's her dancing in a wheelchair to a Megan Trainer song, a big thing. With, and that ties in to some other testimony about what happened to her with nurses and Megan Trainer. The children dance a lot differently than they did when I was that age. <laughs> like I said, I'm not sure we're going to have to admit. Uh, I'll allow that one. I, I I will tell you, Mr. Anderson, that we're getting pretty close to yeah. my limit on the number of these videos. I think that's about it. On that. and, and, and this is under the... I did not admit in the other dancing video. Yes. Because you didn't, you withdrew it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. We only have one dancing video. Um, okay. I think it was the same song, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's her favorite song. So she plays it up. Okay, what's the next? Considering we're, we're seven minutes away from five o'clock. Well, let's do a couple <laughs> of lines then. Do I ever get to do my motions? <laughs> See, this, Mr. Altenberg, you, you, you need to, like, I'm just a plan. I'm sorry. come sit up front or something. I want to go get a yeah, they do need a few more lawyers over there. I've noticed that. They're running short of them. Oh, you should oh, talk. Uh, uh, 2580, Your Honor. Folks, 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 let's try to keep it. Uh, I'm sorry, the number? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I appreciate the number. 2580. The date? Is it a video? It's a photograph of Maya in 2020. 2580. Oh, and then we have a number of photographs we'd like to move in. How many, how many are in this series? Well, th no, th this is a singular photograph, 2580. And Your Honor, this depicts her at the time of her relapse in 2020. Hospitalization. Are you going to have other photos of 
relapse or is this the only one? This is the only one I'm aware of at the moment. I, I think we have very limited evidence of, of, of photographic evidence of that. So. What, what, what does this photo tell us? Tell, uh, Other than she's sitting in a hospital bed. If you notice her, her hand and her arm, it, it shows the weight loss. I think also the hand is starting to... If we need... Actually, Maya's testimony will be instructive on this because she's going to talk a little bit about how when the CRPS came back, the symptoms that she was having. So, um, uh, And I'm also... To, I was, didn't realize this. There's four photographs in here. If we could scroll through them quickly and show the court... This shows the feeding tube that she was, and again, her collarbone, you can see how much weight she lost. Can you go to three? Another one with the feeding tube, and there you go. The, to be very briefly heard on this, Your Honor, the, the only concern we have, again, the affidavit written by Ms. Kowalski regarding this was that the stress of litigation, and specifically depositions, was what caused this, the need for the feeding tube, et cetera, so we're concerned about the prejudice of them making arguments that this was all caused by counsel. Well, I don't think it's correct that the only stress she had was the litigation. I recall there being issues with school and think there was something else. So, I mean, I, I, I think we're going to eventually, as soon as Mr. Altenberg can come to the front of the room, <laughs> we're, we're going to get an instruction about the litigation stress. Yes, Your Honor. Thank um, you. But... I think um, with respect to this one, can I see the, the series of four photos again? I would suggest one. I would suggest one of them, Judge. Can I see one? We'd like to have the first two. We need to show the collarbone, and it would be good to show her in the wheelchair. Or bed, sorry. So what's number three? It's like three is a close-up of four. Okay. I, I see one, two, and then either three or four as showing different things. So I'll give you one and two, and then I don't care between three and four, but three and four seem to be the same thing. We just need those two. Right. We'll, take, we'll take one. Take okay, two. we'll take one more. <laughs> we'll take three. Okay, so... One, two, and three can come in, but four, no. Just to make the clerk's job harder. All right. Your Honor, <laughs> the, uh, the, Sorry, last, the last exhibit number, I believe, that we want to discuss is 2571. And it's a series of photographs uh, taken by Jack Kowalski during Maya's admission in the hospital. When, when you say a series... I see at least 51. Yeah, and we're not trying to move 51 in. So, so you're only moving or seeking to move in 4, 12, 13, 14, 17, 18, 24, 28, 42, 45, and 51? Yes, Your Judge, Honor. I would point and, out and, that I think 257101 is already in. Yes, that when one I looks get, familiar. When I get to my cumulative argument, so I would point that out. Okay. The, the purpose of these photographs, well, the selection of these photographs is based on that they're taken on different dates during her hospitalization, and they show the presence of either <coughs> dystonia or lesions over the course of her hospitalization, Johns Hopkins Alchemist Hospital. Okay, what's the next one? So that's four, 12 is the next. And what's the next? And then 13. 14. Wait, wait a second. Go, go, go back to 12, please. Okay. 13. I, I, so go to 14, please. Seventeen. Isn't that already? I've, already I've seen this one before. Is this one already in? No, I don't know. A similar one. Or, yeah. don't, don't we have something like this already? Uh, well, different times, the yeah. date's important, Your Honor, to uh, juxtapose against the medical record. So that's why we've chosen these okay. dates. 18, please. Twenty-eight. 
24. Twenty-eight. I, haven't I seen? Don't we have photos of like in the Christmas dress and the the head? I think we've already seen several of those. I think I think you might be right as far as December uh, Christmas Eve two thousand sixteen is concerned. So we can withdraw on twenty-eight. What is that twenty-eight? Let's go to 42, please. Now we're on New Year's Eve. We're close to... Shows the progression of the lesions. 45. So essentially, 42 and 45 are the same day and showing the same thing? Uh, one day apart, Your Honor. Can you go back to the... Uh, 42. Your Honor, this, these, this date range here is particularly important to us because this is right around the time when the hospital began taking the position that Maya was self-inflicting these wounds. So to show their presence over a period of time and their progression is important. And 51. January 5th. I see that. Defense position. Cumulative. Okay, the court um, is going to find that each of the photos that I'm going to admit uh, show uh, a different, unique condition at a different time. So I'm going to admit in... Wait, wait a second. Did, 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 uh, 2571, 4, 12, 13, 14, 17, 18, 24, 28 was withdrawn, so that is not being admitted. 42, 45, and 51. Can I read those back to you, Judge? Uh, yeah, do you want me to just read them again? Please. Uh, all in the series of 2571, 4, 12, 13, 14, 17, 18, 24, 42, 45, 51. Is that all the exhibits that you're going to deal with today? Some limited time on Monday morning to discuss any additional exhibits in this list that we can narrow down further and maybe come back with five or six. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to do it. As, we'll, we'll we'll tighten it up, Judge. We know what you what you you need to really up. tighten it up. Yes, sir. Uh, we needed a little bit of guidance on what the court wanted, but now we know what to do. The um, what are you doing as far as witnesses on Monday? Uh, I'm going to call Jack back, uh, and then I'm just asking him the questions from the rebuttal of Beatty. So he should take, well, I hope they're not going to call as long because there's only a few questions. He should take 45 minutes. Then Maya will be on, and Maya, I think, will take the entire day with Cross. I mean, maybe not, but I expect to have an hour and a half Maybe two on direct. Are you going to do the child victim hearsay statements with Jack Kowalski on Monday? Uh, I I like to, as a pred, uh, predicate to Maya's testimony. So so Monday is Jack Kowalski followed by Maya Kowalski. That's correct, Your Honor. Now Mr. Whitney was talking about timing. I think you might have an hour and a half, two hours. I you think I need more. I really need, I need more than two. Mr. Whitney's telling me I might need three. Jack took all day. Yeah. <laughs> Judge, yeah, Judge here's our issue. We're, we're doing the best we can to get on and off. We're cognizant of our time.
but I think we need to call Jack. The jury wants to hear from him. And then as to Maya, there's a lot of evidence that goes into her. Judge, here's our issue. They've already called Mr. Kowalski once. This will be the second time. And then they're going to put him on a third time for, an, for another issue, maybe a fourth time for another issue. We believe that they should be calling him just one more time and finish his testimony as opposed to continually putting him in front of the jury. Uh, you know, it, it's their shot clock. And if they want to keep calling somebody back multiple times, um, so long as it's not like a, a doctor that is being inconvenienced or a nurse that's being inconvenienced. If it's a party, it's fine, but the shot clock's going to keep running. Okay. And very so, briefly, my understanding is you, just for notice to the other side, you plan on calling him for the purposes of talking about the issues uh, that you wanted to and potentially child victim hearsay? You're not getting into damages. I'm just trying to prepare for the No, meeting. no, no. I, I hadn't planned to do that. I had planned to uh, call three of them back for a short session on damages uh, before, uh, right before we put on uh, by Folco or like that, okay. but okay. after, after uh, Brewer. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, Mr. Holmberg. I was hoping maybe Monday morning I could get hearings on those two jury instructions. How, how much sure. time do you... I, mean, I, I think I can get, do both of those depending on how they respond in, in 15 minutes or less. So. If we start at 8.15 and we're going to start with Mr. Altenburn issues. Okay. And, and, and I need you all to remind me to, to do that. <laughs> So I don't just immediately go to exhibits. Which which two instructions are we discussing? So I can relay to Mr. Elliott. The, the limiting instruction and then the one that I that I sent in this morning. Okay. Wasn't aware of it. One's the Facebook limiting instruction and then the one on litigation stress. Is that? Yes, it's the litigation stress. Thank you. And and perhaps. I, I did not file that. I sent I sent a copy to. To everyone, but I can I can file a file. And did Mr. Elegant? Did he uh, oppose, or have you all worked on it? I, frankly, I've had very limited contact with him on this this week. So, so, so perhaps maybe tomorrow, um, you and Mr. Elegant could spend I'll a see moment I can send these two visiting. And see if I can coordinate. Yes. And Judge, if we could have the tightened up exhibit list, so we're not spending time looking at things that they're not going to try to put in. Can you get them the tightened by, let's see, today's Thursday afternoon, right? So by lunchtime on Saturday, does that? That'd be we, fine, Judge. We can do that. So, so noon Eastern Daylight Time <laughs> on Saturday, the, the uh, exhibit list that's tightened. Understood. I, I hate to ask anything else because I really think we need to, to call it. Yes. So I'll, I'll see everybody back. on Monday at 8.15, 8.15. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Have a good week.
know? No, I don't know yet. Oh, we'll okay. See. Well, I see you're out here. You got a report, man. I figured you'd know. Yeah. I think she is, though. Yeah. I, I mean, think I heard she was. I think, yeah, everyone thinks she is. You so. think it's going to be crazy? It'll be crazy if she's just, here. You see them apartments right there, the black top right there? Yeah. I just moved in there. Uh, uh, tomorrow will be three weeks. Okay, heck and yeah. I, so I'm, I'm just learning the madness now. Yeah, it's going to be crazy, I think, if she I does think show. I think that's crazier than just the game itself, huh? Oh, I know. Because I came out here two Sundays ago when they were actually here. They played yeah. the Chargers. And it, it was okay, you know what I mean? I'm right. from Chicago. I'm used to, like, mayhem, mayhem. Being crazy. But, but I think it's going to be a lot more crazy. I think so, too. If yeah, she's we'll here... See. If she's here, so. For sure. Ticket prices have gone up, so That's we'll nuts. have to see, I guess. All right. Hey, are you with the news or no? Yeah, yeah. I'm with um, all the local Fox stations. Oh, with the Fox stations? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Hey, all right. Hey, well, have a good one, okay? Me too. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. All right. Oh, can you, is my uh, camera making a shadow on me? I really can't tell. Yeah, let me let me move it. Hello. What about this? Can you see it now? Is this better? Hello. Hello. Oh, great. Great. Um, let me think. Is that right? The hell? What's this look like? Pretty okay? All right. Yeah, that's so annoying, but whatever. Okay, sounds good. Oh, okay. All right, I'll, let me turn my light off then. What's this look like? Pretty okay? All right.
and is it who is it? Randy and Amy or Randy and Kelsey? Awesome. <laughs> hey, Randy and Amy. Uh, yeah, definitely didn't expect that from them, but it sure has had an impact on NFL and especially uh, tickets. Uh, just after she made her first NFL appearance a couple of weeks ago, tickets for this game, the Vikings versus Kansas City Chief game, saw a 20% increase in tickets. SeatGeek tells me uh, that at one point tickets were as high as eight, nearly $800 per ticket and one uh, local ticket company ticket king here tells me that they are calling this the swift game And Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry told TMZ that when Taylor Swift was here in June for her Eras tour, she had two nights at U.S. Bank Stadium that were sold out and helped boost tourism with packed hotel rooms and restaurants downtown. He says that if she does come back to the city, well, Minneapolis is ready for it. And Minneapolis, Mills Hayes, Fox 9. Thanks, guys.